Tatooine, Chapter 1 The Banthas plotted in single file, leaving only a narrow trail of scuffed footprints across the dunes. Twin suns hammered down on the procession. Waves of heat rippled like cloaking shields, blurring the distance and making an oven of the dune sea. Indigenous creatures took shelter in whatever shadow they could find, until the firestorm of afternoon trickled away into the cooler dusk. The Banthas moved with no noise other than the muffled crunching of their footsteps in the sand. Swathed in strips of cloth, the Tuscan raiders astride the shaggy beasts looked from side to side, keeping watch. Wrapped entirely in bandages, yet still uneasy about the disguise, Han Solo looked out through narrow metal tubes designed to shield the eyes from blowing grit. His mouth was covered with a corroded metal filter for the sand. The filter contained a small internal moisturizer to make Tatooine's fiery air more breathable. The other sand people had tiny ventilators studded around their desert coverings. Only their strongest survived to adulthood, and they prided themselves on it. Han rode on his bantha, hoping to remain inconspicuous in the middle of the procession. The hairy beast swayed as it walked, and Han tried not to clutch its scalloped, curving horns more often than the other Tuscan raiders did. The bantha's sharp back ridges were covered with matted fur, and the disconcertingly thin saddle made the ride excruciatingly uncomfortable. Han swallowed, taking another sip of his precious water and biting back a complaint. This had, after all, been his own crazy suggestion. He just hadn't expected Luke Skywalker would be so eager to agree. And now Han was stuck. The mission was vital to the New Republic, and he had to follow through. With a muttered command, the lead raider urged his bantha to greater speed. The procession trudged through fine sand, winding along the crest of a shifting dune that stood like a towering sentinel in the arid ocean. Han did not grasp the dune's great size until they had ascended for the better part of an hour without reaching the top. The suns grew even hotter, if that were possible. The banthas coughed and snorted, but the sand people were focused on a mission. Han swallowed, trying to ease his parched throat. Finally, he could remain silent no longer and whispered into the short-range transmitter implanted in his breath mask. Luke, what's going on? he said. I've got a bad feeling about whatever they're up to. It took Luke Skywalker a moment to respond. Han watched the thin rider, two banthas ahead of him, sit up straighter. Luke seemed far more comfortable in his disguise than Han felt. Of course, Luke had grown up on Tatooine, but the young man's voice now sounded bone-weary as it came over the voice pickup in Han's ear. Nothing to do with us, Han, he said. A few of the sand people have vague suspicions, but they haven't centered on us yet. I'm using the Force to distract anyone who pays too much attention. No, this is something different entirely. A great tragedy. You'll see. Luke heaved a long breath through his breath mask. Can't talk now. Have to concentrate. Wait until they're preoccupied, and I'll explain more. Up ahead, Luke slumped forward in his Tuscan disguise. Han knew his friend was expending an incredible amount of energy to lull the sand people into ignoring their two unwanted guests. Luke was able to use his abilities to muddle the minds of weak individuals, but never before had Han seen his friend manipulate so many minds at once. The trick was to keep the sand people from noticing them. Then it was easy for Luke to divert a few stray thoughts. If someone sounded an alarm and all the sand people focused on the intruders, though, not even a Jedi Master would be able to keep up the charade. Then there would be a fight. Tucked under his tattered robes, Han carried his trusty blaster pistol. He didn't know if he and Luke could take on the entire band of raiders, but they would make a good accounting of themselves if circumstances ever came to that. The lead rider reached the peak of the sand mountain. The bantha's wide feet trampled the wind-sharpened edge atop the dune. The air was still, as if stunned. The sands glittered like a billion miniature novas. Han adjusted the corroded filters over his eyes. The other banthas plodded up, surrounding their leader, who raised his cloth-wrapped arm, brandishing a wicked-looking gaffy stick. Behind the Tuscan leader, his single passenger sat slumped and sullen, though it was difficult to understand the body language of these masked and alien people. Han sensed somehow that this withdrawn passenger was the center of the ceremony. 
Was some kind of honor being bestowed, Han wondered, or was this man being exiled from the tribe? The passenger slid off the lead bantha, letting himself drop from the shaggy beast. He clung to the woolly fur as if in desperation, but no sounds came from his bandaged face, not even the guttural grunts and snorts the Tuscans used as language. Head down, his eye tubes pointed toward the churned sand where Bantha footprints had trampled the pristine dune. The passenger stood dejected in front of the lead rider. The leader waited beside his mount, holding the upraised gaffy stick. The other sand people climbed down from their Banthas. They thrashed their weapons in the air. Han and Luke copied the gestures, trying to blend in. In his disguise, Luke moved slowly and wearily. This mission was taking a heavy toll on the Jedi Knight, and Han hoped they would reach their destination soon. The forlorn passenger hesitated at the edge of the dune, gazing across the sweeping ocean of loose sands that spread to the horizon. The sand people stood at attention and raised their gaffy sticks high. While they concentrated on the intensity of the moment, Luke's voice buzzed in Han's ear. All right, they're distracted, he said. I can explain. The lone Tuscan raider lost his bantha three days ago. A crate dragon killed it, and unfortunately our friend there got away. What do you mean, unfortunately? Han mumbled, hoping his voice wouldn't carry over the restless sounds of the sand people. The Tuscan raiders have a very close relationship with their banthas, Luke said. It is a mental bonding, a symbiosis, almost like a marriage. They become part of each other, bantha, and Tuscan. When one member of the pair is killed, the other is incomplete, like an amputee. Unconsciously, Luke flexed his cyborg hand. He has no place in Tuscan society, though he is more an object of pity than of hatred. Many believe he should have died beside his Bantha, no matter what the circumstances. So are they just going to kill him? Han asked. Yes and no, Luke said. They believe the spirit of the dead Bantha must decide. If the spirit wishes for him to bond with another mount, our friend will find a free wild Bantha in the desert, join with it, and return in triumph to the tribe, where he will be fully accepted, even highly revered. However, if the Bantha's spirit wants his rider to join him in death, then the outcast will wander hopelessly in the desert until he dies. Han barely shook his head. Doesn't sound like his chances are too hot. Luke said, Probably not, but that is their way. The sand people waited for the exile to make the first move. Finally, with a single anguished cry that might have been triumph or challenge, he plunged down the steep and shifting slope of the dune. The sand people tilted their heads toward the burning sky and let out a loud, ululating cry that made Han shudder. The Tuscan raiders thrashed their gaffy sticks to wish their companion well. The Banthas raised up their squarish, shaggy heads and bellowed in unison, a rumbling, growling cry that shook the dune sea. The lone raider waded down the steep slope. Dusty golden sand flew up around him as his feet and legs sank in. His robes flapped behind him as he plodded on. He tripped and tumbled, flailing his arms, and finally jabbed his gaffy stick deep into the uncertain surface, one arm thrust out to gain balance, leaving a swath of disturbed sand behind him. The exiled raider heaved himself to his feet again. Sand trickled from his flowing cloaks, but still he marched ahead, not looking back. A few of the Banthas bellowed again. The sound was swallowed up in the empty vastness. The outcast's drab garments soon made him fade into the landscape. The lead raider turned and, with a single energetic leap, mounted his Bantha. The other sand people climbed into their saddles. The Banthas snorted and stomped on the loose sand. Han got back to his seat. Luke was the last to balance himself again, and by that time the lead raider had already turned the hairy beast to the side and began to plunge down the shallower slope at the back of the dune. The other sand people followed, marching closely in line to mask their tracks. Han risked a glance behind him. He could just make out the single exiled raider dwindling in the distance, moving with slow determination as ripples of heat blurred his tiny figure. Soon he was swallowed completely by the unforgiving jaws of the doomed sea. The heat of the day seemed to last forever, and Han rode in a fugue state, barely aware of his surroundings, self-hypnotized by a litany of rocking footfalls. 
Ahead, Luke continued to sit upright on the Bantha saddle, though he wavered from time to time. Han wondered what sort of energy the Jedi Knight was tapping into. The group camped in a thick maze of rocky badlands punctuated by pockmarked stone needles rising out of the wind-blown sand. Darkness fell quickly with the double sunset, and the temperature plummeted. For a while the rocks continued to throb with stored heat, but they quickly cooled. Grunting and chuffing to each other in their baffling language, the sand people pitched camp. Each knew his or her own duties. Han could not tell whether the individual Tuscans were male or female. Luke had said that only assigned mates were able to see each other with faces unwrapped. Two of the younger people encircled a flat area with smaller rocks and piled bricks of what Han realized must be dried bantha dung, the only fuel source available out in the barrens. Han and Luke moved about, trying to appear busy. The banthas, not corralled or tied in any way, were simply led to a side canyon where they could rest for the night. Other raiders broke out packages of stringy, dried meat. Han and Luke took their share and squatted on boulders. Carefully, Han lifted his metal breath mask and jammed a piece of the meat into his mouth. He chewed and wasted several drinks of water as he tried to make the jerky palatable enough to swallow. What is this stuff? he muttered into the voice pickup. Luke answered without looking at him. Dried and salted dewback flank, I believe. Tastes like leather, Han muttered. It's more nutritious than leather, I think, Luke said. He turned his metal eye tubes toward Han, who could detect no expression on the wrapped up face. Han became disoriented if he swiveled his head too fast while looking through the small holes in the eye tubes. As the sand people finished their meal, they gathered around the blaze as a tall raider hunched near the brighter part of the fire. From the careful way he moved, the slow placement of limbs, not to mention the silent reverence the other Tuscans granted him, Han got the impression that this was a very old person. The storyteller, Luke's voice said in his ear. Other raiders brought out long poles and unfurled bright clan banners marked with jagged slashes, some sort of violent written language. These must be totems, symbols not seen by the outside world at all. A young, wiry raider sat next to the storyteller. Others came back from their bantha saddles with trophies, visual aids for the story. They held out scraps of rough cloth, a bloodied banner. Han saw battered and cracked stormtrooper helmets like the skulls of fallen enemies. A luminous milky gem the size of his fist, which Han recognized with a start as a crate dragon pearl, one of the rarest treasures ever to come from Tatooine. The old man raised up his bandage-wrapped hands and began to speak. The other raiders sat enraptured as stories spilled out in low grunts and barely recognizable sounds that might have been words. Luke translated for Han. He's telling of their exploits, how they took an entire stormtrooper regiment many years ago, how they slew a crate dragon and took the pearls out of its gullet, how they defeated another Tuscan clan, slaughtered all their adults, and adopted their children into the clan, thereby increasing their numbers. The storyteller finished his tale and squatted lower, gesturing to the young apprentice who glanced around. Two Tuscan raiders stood on either side of the boy, holding their gaffy sticks with the axe heads pointed down at the apprentice. The storyteller raised a trembling hand and turned it sideways like a knife blade. The apprentice hesitated for a moment and began to speak slowly. Now what? Han said. Luke answered, That boy is being trained as the clan's next storyteller. The Tuscans believe very much in inflexible tradition. Once a story is set down as an oral path, it must remain forever unaltered. This boy has learned the story. He is now telling about a raid on a moisture farmer who attempted to bring peace between humans and Jawas and sand people. But why the weapons? Han said. Looks like they're ready to snuff the poor kid. They will, if he makes so much as one mistake. If the boy alters a single word, the storyteller will chop down with his hand, and the raiders will kill the apprentice immediately. They believe that speaking the stories in any manner other than the way they were originally told is great blasphemy. Han said, 
Not much room for mistakes, is there? Luke shook his head. The other Tuscans were concentrating completely on the boy's speech. The desert is a hard place, Han. It allows no room for mistakes. The sand people are a product of that environment. They have harsh ways, but such harshness has been forced upon them. The boy finished, and the old storyteller raised his other hand in a congratulatory gesture. The young apprentice slumped with trembling relief, and the other sand people muttered their appreciation. After a while, the fire was banked and began to burn low. The Tuscan raiders settled down for the night. I'm going to get some rest, Han said. You haven't slept in two days, Luke. Can't you wait until they all go to sleep, then catch a nap yourself? Luke shook his head. I don't dare. If I stop monitoring their thoughts, if I release my hold on their minds, they might suddenly realize we're not supposed to be with them. If somebody sounds an alarm, we're lost. Besides, a Jedi can go a long time without rest. Whatever you say, buddy, Han said. We should reach Jabba's palace by tomorrow, Luke said, with weary hope. I can't wait, Han said. I mean, we had so much fun the last time we were there. Chapter 2 The sand people roused themselves in the frigid darkness before the first of Tatooine's twin suns crept over the horizon. Han shivered, finding no warmth in his bandage wrappings. Luke moved more sluggishly than ever. Han was worried about his friend. In addition to exhaustion, Luke was suffering from deep frustration at his inability to help Callista, the Jedi woman he loved, regain her lost powers. And now, after days without sleep on the razor's edge of peril, hiding among ferocious desert nomads, Luke's stamina was wearing dangerously thin. The Tuscan raiders saddled their banthas, and the shaggy beasts stomped impatiently, as if anxious to be off before the day's heat caught up with them. Soundlessly, with gaffy sticks and scavenged blaster rifles ready, the sand people rode out into the desert as the sky filled with purple, brightening to a lavender shot with molten gold. When the first sun rose, Han felt the temperature skyrocket after only a few moments. The air smelled flat and metallic through his mouthpiece, but Han endured in silence. He thought of Leia and their three children back on Coruscant, and fantasized about the peaceful life of a small yet successful trader. But Han grimaced behind the bandages. Such a quiet life would be a greater torture than any vicious punishment the sand people could devise. By mid-morning, the Tuscan raiders topped a rocky rise and looked across distended shadows and painted desert to the ruins of Jabba the Hutt's palace. The citadel stood silent and monolithic in the crags. Han shivered at his first glance. I told you I'd get us here, Luke said through the voice pickup. We're not inside yet, kid, Han answered. When I split off, follow me, Luke said. I'll distract the sand people so they won't even notice us separating from them. Once we get out of sight, I can release my control, and I'll be glad for the rest. Far across the rolling ocean of sand, the collected winds made a minor sand whirl, such as often whipped up in the wastelands, but Luke used it to his advantage. The lead raider grunted something and pointed with his gaffy stick, wheeling his bantha about to watch the sand whirl. The other sand people turned, inordinately fascinated by the dust whirl. They chattered among themselves, grunting and hooting through their breath masks. Luke used the diversion to nudge his bantha to the right, splitting off from the line of Tuscan raiders. Han yanked on the rough curved horn of his mount. He couldn't believe it was going to work, but he and Luke rode side by side, trotting down the sandy slope. Their footprints churning up dust, the Banthas crossed the great empty bowl into the rocky canyon that led to Jabba's palace. Han looked back anxiously, but none of the Tuscan raiders turned in their direction. The sand people continued to point their sticks and shout toward the sand whirl as if it were an approaching army. Luke urged his bantha between the narrow rust rock walls where the canyon shadows fell about them. Heat broken boulders rose on either side, and the baked sulfurous sand and mud was like duracrete underfoot as the mounts trotted toward the lower entrance of Jabba's palace. Once they were out of sight, Luke let out a heavy sigh and slumped against his saddle. We made it, he said. They shouldn't remember us at all. Yeah, Han said. 
and we got all the way from Anchorhead without anybody noticing us. No spies, no witnesses, no records. Now we can check out these rumors and get back home. A harsh wind whistled down the canyon, moaning through the minarets of Jabba's palace. The high observation towers had open black windows, like gaps in a grinning skull. Han looked up and saw blaster scoring on the fused bricks. A few scuttling lizards ran from a pocket of shade to some other cool, dark crack. Han could not see enough through the round eye tubes of the Tuscan face wrapping. In disgust, he peeled the bandages off and removed the metal eye coverings, tossing them to the ground. He drew a deep breath of the dusty air and coughed. Boy, I'm glad to get rid of that. Luke's face looked monstrous, swathed in his Tuscan disguise, but he carefully unwrapped himself, stuffing the rags inside his tattered desert robes. Han shook his head as he looked at the ruins. Jabba had not been the first inhabitant of the huge palace. It had been built centuries before the Hut crime lord was born, or hatched, or however it was that baby huts came to life. Long ago, exiled monks of the Bomar order had found an isolated spot on the backwater world Tatooine and built their towering monastery, remaining mysterious and aloof from the planet's other inhabitants. Some time later, the bandit Alcara had broken into the monastery and used parts of it as his hideout as he preyed upon moisture farmers. The Bomar monks didn't seem to care about Alcara's presence, though, utterly ignoring him. Since that time, a succession of undesirables had located their headquarters in portions of the Bomar monastery, the latest of whom had been Jabba the Hutt. After Jabba's death at the great pit of Karkoon, a civil war had broken out among Jabba's minions as each scrambled to steal the hut crime lord's possessions, ransacking the palace. With Jabba's crime empire in ruins, the silent and mysterious monks had taken the opportunity to reclaim what had been theirs, destroying those among Jabba's followers who did not flee fast enough. The palace had since remained a haunted edifice, to be avoided by all but the most daring. Recently, though, some of what Leia called his scruffy old friends had passed along disturbing rumors that other huts were poking around in the abandoned palace, looking for something, something important enough for them to risk coming back. Luke slid down from his bantha and patted its woolly side. The bantha snorted in confusion and stamped its feet. Hans Bantha snuffled. The corroded door loomed in front of them, a durasteel barrier pitted with blaster scars, some bright and new, others decades old and worn away. Luke and Han approached together. Over the years, the control circuits had crossed or decayed, and the heavy barrier had raised and stuck half a meter from the ground. Drifts of sand had collected in the gap. A cool, musty-smelling breeze leaked out of the shadowy inner corridors. We could crawl under, I suppose, Han said, without much enthusiasm, running his fingers over the heavy durasteel door. Luke went up to the lichen-covered external panel. It might slip and squash us both like it did Jabba's rancor. I think I'll try these controls first. As soon as Luke touched one of the buttons, a panel creaked open in the center of the door, and a bobbing artificial eye extended, swaying on a rusted metal stalk. Jabba's surveillance system. The machine's words were garbled and slurred, as if its programming had deteriorated. The scolding tone and its vocal synthesizer was more than Han, weary as he was, could tolerate. He reached into the folds of his desert robe, pulled out his blaster pistol, and blew the thing into smoking shards and sparking wires. Oh, shut up, he said, then turned to Luke with a roguish grin. Didn't like the way it was looking at us. Luke set to work on the door controls, and finally, with a coughing sound, the door lurched up another meter and jammed at its tracks. Think that's good enough, he said. Before Han could reply, the whine of a blaster bolt spanged against the metal door, creating another bright silvery scar. What? he cried, whirling. Their two banthas snorted in greeting. Another blaster bolt shot down the canyon and burned a hole through Han's draped desert robe, barely missing his chest. Han held up the drab cloth in shock, looking at the smoldering hole. The entire group of sand people thundered down the canyon, whipping their banthas to a frenzy and waving gaffy sticks. They fired recklessly with their blasters. Han and Luke's two banthas reared. Looks like you stopped distracting them too soon, kid, 
Han said, diving toward the partially open door. Must have seen our tracks. I guess this door is open enough, Luke said, and scrambled into the shadows beside Han. Now if only I can figure out how to close it. More blaster bolts struck the door, making the musty corridors echo and thrum. The sand people jabbered with rage, and their banthas made loud sounds as they churned around the door. Luke found the inner door controls and grabbed at a bunch of the twisted and corroded wires. A single hopeless spark flickered out, then the entire control panel went dead. Better do something quick, Luke, Han said, crouching down with his blaster pistol. One of the sand people fired into the interior shadows. The energy bolt ricocheted on the flagstone floor, bouncing into the darkness behind Han and Luke. Han fired his own blaster at the bandaged feet he could see. One of the Tuscan raiders yowled and leaped backward. Luke gave up on the control panel and stood with his hands hanging at his sides. His fists clenched, then relaxed as he concentrated on the force. The tracks groaned as he moved the mechanisms holding the heavy door in place. Suddenly, with a thunderous clang, it crashed down, belching up clouds of old dust and engulfing the hall in darkness. Well, that was fun, Han said. Don't suppose you remembered to bring along a portable glow lamp. Luke reached into the folds of his robe. A Jedi always comes prepared, he said, and removed his lightsaber, pushing the activation button. With a snap hiss, the vibrant green blade spilled out, a rod of incandescent light that made Han shield his eyes. Not the most impressive use I've ever made of my lightsaber, Luke commented, but it'll do. The two crept deeper into the winding catacombs of the palace toward Jabba's throne room. They didn't quite know what they were looking for, but both were confident they'd spot something amiss. It didn't look that much better when Jabba lived here, Luke said. Maybe all the housekeeping droids broke down, Han said. Inside the abandoned main throne room where the bloated hut had pronounced judgment on his helpless victims, Luke's lightsaber illuminated the walls with a glare that made the shadows jump and ripple. Scavengers, small and large, made loud noises in the otherwise tomb-like room. Pebbles trickled from a loose block in the wall. Those weird Bomar monks are still here in this place, Han said but they don't look too anxious to reclaim the rooms Jabba used. I'm not sure anyone pretends to understand the Bomar order, Luke answered. From what I've heard, when they reach their greatest state of enlightenment, each monk undergoes some kind of surgery that removes his brain and places it in a life support jar. It keeps them from being distracted by physical diversions, leaving them to ponder the great mysteries. Han snorted and looked into Luke's pale blue eyes. Good thing Jedi don't go for nonsense like that. Luke smiled at his friend. I seem to remember you called the Force a hokey religion when I first met you. Han looked away, embarrassed. Well, I've gotten smarter since then. Sudden mechanical sounds were as loud as distant explosions in the echoing room. The two whirled, Luke with his lightsaber ready, Han pointing his blaster pistol. The whirring servo motors and articulated legs came closer, many feet clicking like ice picks on the flagstone floors. Han felt his skin crawl with remembered revulsion as he thought of the crystalline energy spiders that lived in the black spice mines of Kessel. But the thing that emerged was neither entirely droid nor entirely alive. A set of sharp mechanical legs moving, staggering as if with poor muscular control an automated steel insect that stumbled into the throne room and slung under the legs where the bloated body of a spider would have been hung a spherical jar filled with clear fluid that bubbled and gurgled pulsing life support into the convoluted and spongy form of a human brain uh-oh han said it's one of the monks who knows what they're after he pointed the blaster directly at the brain jar no came a flat processed voice, a synthesized word through a tiny speaker mounted on the set of mechanical legs. Luke held up his other hand. Wait, Han, I'm sensing only confusion. There's no threat. Are you friends of Jabba's? The spider legs asked. I've got better taste in my friends, Han said. Who are you? 
The spider legs skittered from side to side as if the brain had stopped concentrating and lost control. I am Mazor. I was once a rival of Jabba's. We had a confrontation, and I lost. The synthesized voice paused as if processing. Jabba ordered the monks to perform their surgery on me and place my brain in this jar. More thinking, more flat and mechanical words. I use these legs when I wish to move about. It took me a year to stop screaming in silence and become adjusted to my new circumstances. Jabba kept me around his palace as a joke, so he could laugh at how pathetic I had become. The spider legs skittered, though the voice grew louder, tinged with defiance. But now Jabba is dead, the palace is empty, and I am the last one laughing. Han and Luke looked at each other. Han gradually lowered his blaster. Well, any enemy of Jabba's is a friend of mine, he said. In fact, we were there at the great pit of Karkoon when Jabba was killed. I am greatly in your debt. Mazor said. Blinking lights flashed around the brain jar's life support systems. Then perhaps you can help us, Luke said. His voice was calm, filled with Jedi power. We're seeking information. We've heard rumors. If you have been here in the palace, you might have seen what we need to know. Yes, Mazor said. Many strangers have come here recently. Much activity. Very mysterious. Can you tell us who they were, what they were looking for? Han said, amazed at how easy the answer had come. We need to know what the huts are up to. Huts, the mechanical voice said. I despise huts. Many huts have intruded here, searching. And what were they looking for? Han persisted. Information. Jabba's information. Jabba had much knowledge stored here in secret data banks. He had his spies everywhere, collecting data to use or to sell. Not only was Jabba a crime kingpin, he also knew much about the Rebel Alliance, though the Empire refused to pay him enough to make it worthwhile. Jabba also had many Imperial secrets. The spider legs bobbed up and down. Imperial secrets. That is what the huts were looking for. Imperial secrets, Luke said. But the Empire has fallen. We haven't heard anything from them in years. What could the huts possibly want with Imperial information? Imperial information, Mazor repeated. Imperial Information Center, the great database on Coruscant. Jabba knew secret passwords. He could access the Emperor's most heavily protected information. Han was startled. You mean the huts can break into our computers? Impossible. We've locked down all those files. Jabba had ways of accessing them, Mazor replied. Tell me, Luke said, did the huts find what they were looking for when they came here? Yes, the spider leg said. They intend to create their own bargaining force, an invincible weapon. The Hut Crime Syndicate will be more powerful than the Rebels or what's left of the Empire. Mazor flinched. I hate the Huts. Han groaned. Oh no, not another super weapon. Do you know any details of their plans? Luke asked, bending closer to the brain in the jar. Any specifics? No, Mazor said. They have the key they sought and now they will move on to their next step. Han nodded grimly, looking to Luke. We have to get back to Coruscant and report to Leia. The New Republic needs to be on their guard. Luke switched off his lightsaber, plunging the room into thick, oily shadows, but he reached forward to rub his fingers on the edges of Mazor's brain jar. Fizzing bubbles continued to curl through the nutrient fluids, but the brain hung motionless. Is there anything we can do for you? Luke asked. I might be able to help you find peace in your existence. A harsh hiccuping sound came from the voice synthesizer. No, Jedi, 
the Bomar monks have already given as much solace as they could. What you must do for me is stop the hut's plan. Humiliate them. The spider legs rocked back and forth. I will remain here alone and continue to laugh at Jabba. That is my reward. Chapter 3 since their banthas had run off, leaving them stranded at Jabba's palace, Han suggested to Luke that they investigate the vehicle hangars in the lower levels. Together, the two of them might be able to reassemble a functioning speeder so they could make good time away from the ruins. Luke agreed, his mind preoccupied with his real reason for wanting to come to Tatooine. Under the flickering light of old glow panels, Han tinkered with the mechanical subsystems of damaged vehicles. The scrapped engines and hull parts were all that remained after the frantic mass exodus of Jabba's minions. Because of rumors and superstitious fear, Jawas and other scavengers had not dared to come steal away what was left, so dismantled skiffs and flyers remained in the maintenance bay, salvaged for parts. Han and Luke worked together, swapping out components, making modifications from what they had on hand. At last they operated a clanking mechanical side door, letting the wash of yellow sunlight scour the filthy hangar bay. They climbed aboard two battered swoops that reminded Luke of the speeder bikes he and his sister Leia had ridden so recklessly through the forests on Endor. Luke sat on the dented metal seat, trying to be comfortable on the scraps of the petrified leather covering. It's been a long time since I did something like this, Luke said. Feels good. Just like old times, kid. Han powered up the humming repulsor lifts. Let's head back to most icely spaceport so we can get out of here. Wait, Han, Luke said with a pensive expression. There's something I have to do first. We'll need to make a side trip, circle around to the Jundland wastes. Han looked at him, pursing his lips, then he nodded. Yeah, I thought you had something else on your mind from the way you were acting. Anything to do with Callista? Luke nodded, but gave no details. I guess I should know by now that when I'm with the Jedi, nothing's simple and straightforward, Han said. As events continued around him, Luke forced himself to keep moving, proceeding to the next step, hoping that he would find some clue at his next destination. The news of the hut's secret plan alarmed him, but his heart ached at being separated from Callista. He longed to be with her. He longed to help her. Following threads of the Force, he and Callista had connected with each other's personalities from the very first. They had linked like two pieces of a precise puzzle. Callista was right for Luke, and he was right for her. Being Jedi, they knew it in a way that few other lovers could understand. Though Callista had been born decades before Luke, her spirit had been frozen within the computer of the automated dreadnought Eye of Palpatine. Luke had fallen in love with Callista's luminous form, until she came back to life in the body of one of his brilliant students, who had sacrificed herself to destroy the dreadnought. Now Callista was physically whole again, flesh and blood, beautiful. They could be together. But in a devastating irony, Callista had lost all her Jedi abilities in the transformation. She was alive again, but not the same, not completely there. They could no longer link with each other, mind and spirit. They'd had only those heady days to remember, trapped together aboard the Eye of Palpatine. But it was enough to galvanize the deep love between them and make them keep trying to find an answer. Luke would never give up until he found a way to bring Callista back whole. He stood anxious and alone, feeling like a prodigal son outside the ramshackle, collapsed hut that had once been the home of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Han waited by his repaired swoop, drinking the last of their water. Luke had foregone his share, building up his mental energy through concentration. They would be at the most icely spaceport soon, no matter what happened at the ruins of Obi-Wan's dwelling. Luke swallowed and stepped forward, his footsteps crunching in the silence. He had not been here in many years. The door had fallen off its hinges, part of the clay front wall had fallen in. Boulders and crumbled adobe jammed the entrance. A pair of small, screeching desert rodents snapped at him and fled for cover. Luke ignored them. Gingerly, he ducked low and stepped into the home of his first mentor. 
Light slanted in from cracks in the walls. Dust motes drifted like gold dust through the sunbeams. The place smelled of mustiness, empty shadows, and ghosts. Unlike Jabba's palace, however, scavengers had had no qualms about cleaning Ben Kenobi's abode of everything of the slightest value. The stove and heater units had been removed, leaving only vacant notches in the clay walls. Ben's sleeping pallet had been stripped down to its splintered frame. Shreds of cloth, long since turned into nests for rodents and insects, lay wadded in the corners. Luke stood in the middle of the room, breathing deeply, turning around, trying to sense the presence he desperately needed to see. This was the place where Obi-Wan Kenobi had told Luke of the Force. Here the old man had first given Luke his lightsaber and hinted at the truth about his father, from a certain point of view, dispelling the diversionary story that Uncle Owen had told, at the same time planting seeds of his own deceptions. Luke pulled out his lightsaber and gripped the handle, but did not switch it on. After he had lost his father's weapon on Cloud City, Luke had built a new lightsaber that belonged to him and no one else, not an artifact from the past. He had forged his own path in the absence of his teachers. It seemed that Obi-Wan and Yoda had begun to prepare him, but had left Luke with so many questions, so much knowledge unlearned. And the insane Jorus Sabalf could tell him only perversions of what a true Jedi needed to know. The Emperor had shown Luke the dark side ways, but Luke needed to understand so much more. He needed to know how to save Callista. Ben, he said, and closed his eyes, calling out with his mind as well as his voice. He tried to penetrate the invisible walls of the Force and reach to the luminous being of Obi-Wan Kenobi, who had visited him numerous times, before saying he could never speak with Luke again. Ben, I need you, Luke said. Circumstances had changed. He could think of no other way past the obstacles he faced. Obi-Wan had to answer. It wouldn't take long, but it could give him the key he needed with all his heart. Luke paused and listened and sensed. But he felt nothing. If he could not summon Obi-Wan's spirit here in the empty dwelling where the old man had lived in exile for so many years, Luke didn't believe he could find his former teacher ever again. He echoed the words Leia had used more than a decade earlier, beseeching him. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke whispered. You're my only hope. Luke waited again, trembling faintly. He had tried everything he knew. Callista had undergone other training in her own years as a Jedi. She knew things Luke had never imagined, but even she knew of no way to tear away the smothering blanket around her, the blindness that prevented her from using the Force. Ben, please! Luke cried. His body shivered with the intensity of his desperation and dwindling hope. The empty hut sat around him, holding only memories. Nothing. Silence. Emptiness. Obi-Wan was not there. The old Jedi teacher would not come. Luke knelt down in the dirt on the floor, scrabbling in the dust for some sign, some other message, as realization sank in. He would get no help from Obi-Wan after all. Luke swallowed his despair, vowing never to give up. He lifted his chin and clamped his lips together in a grim, determined line. Perhaps that was the message. Obi-Wan's silence, proving to him that Luke was a Jedi Knight himself. He could not rely on Ben Kenobi or Yoda or others to help him. He controlled his own destiny. He was no longer just a student. Luke would have to solve his own problems. His resolve hardened within him. No, he had not tried everything. He would search the galaxy with Callista. He would find the answer one way or another. Luke stood up and clipped the lightsaber to his belt again. He had no need to draw it. He looked around with one last twinge of hope that he might see a glowing outline, the old man nodding to him, reaffirming that Luke's answer was the correct one. But he sensed nothing. When he stepped back out, the blazing sunlight washed over him like a cleansing flood. He took a deep breath and went to meet Han. Han Solo stood in the shade beside his floating swoop and wiped sweat from his forehead. Well, kid, he asked, find what you were looking for? No, Luke said, and yes. Han shook his head. 
Leave it to a Jedi never to give you a straight answer. In this case, there is no straight answer, Han. I'm done with Tatooine, Luke said. We can go back to Mos Eisley now. We have to warn the New Republic what the Huts are up to. Hoth Asteroid Belt Chapter 4 A storm of rock swept across space, colliding and smashing with enough force to crush boulders or spaceships to powder. The Hoth Asteroid Belt was a nightmarish hazard to navigation. A few fragments collided with the Orco Skymine ship's forward deflector shields, then vanished into bright plumes of vaporized dust. On the foredeck, Durga the Hut rested on his levitating platform like a slab of raw flesh, watching through the command viewports. Durga saw only one thing as he watched the colliding asteroids. Resources. Vast, untapped resources containing every sort of metal and mineral that could be of use to the Hut's new secret project. Increased deflector shields, Durga said, puffing his cheeks and stretching the smeared birthmark across the left side of his head. His minions scrambled to do his bidding. Weequays, Gamorians, human slaves, and others clustered about the expeditionary ship's controls, bickering about how best to implement the order. Durga was not impressed with the intelligence or the free-thinking abilities of his contracted employees, but he had not hired them for those qualities. Beside the slug-like hut, Imperial General Sulamar turned from a status screen and snapped to attention. Always obsessively attentive to protocol, the general kept his uniform trim and pressed, with edges that could have cut Mandalorian iron. The left breast of his uniform was plastered with a treasure chest of medals from previous campaigns he had won, about which he never ceased blabbering. He smiled grimly, a sallow-faced, flinty-eyed man who looked somehow small inside his uniform, as if he were actually no more than a frightened boy trapped in a grown-up disguise. Mineral Exploiter Alpha has already begun its hunting and processing routine, General Sulamar said. Mineral Exploiter Beta has just been unleashed. He clicked his black heels together. I trust the profits for Orco Skymine will be up this quarter? They better be, Durga said. Move us forward so I can observe the mining activities. He gestured with one small slimy hand. Orco Skymine was merely a sham corporation that the Hut Crime Empire had put together to disguise their expenses, a false commercial venture that would exploit the untapped Hoth asteroid belt. They had wanted a remote location and limitless resources for their secret project. The incredibly complex and expensive mineral exploiter was the first step in what would be the Hut's eventual domination of the galaxy. We're tracking Beta, sir, one of the human technicians said moving forward to get within view. Make sure you steer clear of those asteroids, Navigator, General Sulamar snapped, making his voice deeper and gruffer, as he always did when issuing orders. Durga gave a guttural growl. I am in command of this ship, General. I will give the orders here. Sulamar bowed in embarrassment and took a step backward. My apologies, Lord Durga. Durga narrowed his huge coppery eyes, then turned to the Navigator. You heard the general, he said. Do as he says. As the Orco Skymine expeditionary ship threaded its way through the colliding rocks, Durga eased forward. He blinked his thick-lidded eyes, trying to spot the metallic blip against the star field. As they approached, the mammoth ore processing unit began to stand out, gleaming and sparkling, a flurry of motion. A magnificent machine, Durga thought, as he saw the hulk, a giant cargo container with a front end of moving mechanical mouth parts and turbo laser turrets to blast asteroids to rubble. It stuffed the rubble into a giant processing maw, chewed it up, spit out the useless slag, and kept its precious ingots of worthwhile metals. The newly designed automated mineral exploiters had a simple mission. Sophisticated sensors directed the behemoths to hunt down the highest and purest concentrations of metals out in the asteroid belt and to dismantle the rocks and exploit the treasure. They seem to be functioning perfectly, Sulamar said, again snapping to attention after he studied the diagnostic screen. You have every confidence in their abilities? Durga let loose a deep belly laugh. Naturally. My pet scientist, Bevel Lemelisk, designed them. 
Perhaps you've heard of his other work? The hut leaned forward so that his huge head was close to General Sulamar's sallow face. When he was bonded to the Emperor, Lemelisk was in charge of constructing both the first and the second Death Stars. Sulamar's eyebrows shot up, showing how impressed he was. Bevel Lemelisk designed these mineral exploiters, and he will also be hard at work overseeing the construction of our new weapon. Sounds like you couldn't have found a better man. Sulamar agreed, then faced forward, watching the mineral exploiter Beta continue its work. The machine finished devouring a medium-sized asteroid and dumped the molten waste slag, which hardened into small flying shards in its wake. The machine's sensors swept the asteroid belt for a new target. Beta is picking up a very high concentration of metal, one of the Deveronian diagnosticians said. It's amazingly pure. The mineral exploiter altered course and increased speed toward its new target. Durga watched with growing glee. Must be even more resources out here than we anticipated, another tech said. Mineral exploiter Alpha has found a rich source as well. The target seems to be moving on an odd course for one of these asteroids, but it registers as pure metal, like nothing we've ever seen out here. Durga chortled with satisfaction. If these mineral exploiters continue to find such wealth, we might not need the other two we have under construction. The pilot of the hut expeditionary vessel increased shields as they followed mineral exploiter Beta through the asteroid belt. Alpha is also headed this way, the human technician said. General Sulamar frowned. Do you think they could have picked up the same target? Uh-oh, the Deveronian station chief said. Durga sat up straight on his repulsor sled. He puffed his rubbery cheeks again. I don't like the tone of that, mister. I don't like what I'm seeing, the horned Deveronian responded. He raised his clawed hands in panic. Alpha and Beta haven't picked up the same target. They've detected each other. Well, shut them down, Durga said. An unforeseen programming glitch. We can't afford to lose those two pieces of equipment. The Deveronian hammered instructions into his control panels. The other technicians worked frantically to no avail. The Gamorian guards stood dumbfounded, blinking at each other in confusion. The Deveronian pounded his fists on the panel. I can't, sir. I don't have the override code. Durga bellowed. Well, who does? Only Bevel Lemelisk, sir. Get him up here, Durga shouted. But he asked not to be disturbed, sir, the Deveronian said. Durga gurgled in rage at the comment and punched a control button on his repulsor sled. Suddenly, the Deveronian technician's chair erupted with electrical fire, deadly voltage arcing across the victim's hands and arms, crawling up his spinal column and skittering around inside his skull. The alien's skin blackened and burned. He opened his fanged mouth to scream, but only blue lightning came out. In seconds, the Deveronian slumped down, a skeletal corpse that steamed as flakes of ash fell onto the floor of the expeditionary ship. Now, would someone else like to get Bevel Lemelisk for me? Durga boomed, before it's too late. One of the human technicians leaped off his chair and ran to the turbo lift. General Sulamar snapped his fingers, and two Gamorian guards came forward to remove the charred Deveronian body. Lightly tapping the singed skin to make sure that all of the electrical current had gone away, they whisked the crumbling body out of sight. Despite his outburst, Durga knew they could never rouse the weapons engineer fast enough to do any good. Without rage and horror, he watched as the two gargantuan machines came together, considering each other to be prime sources of metallic wealth. Unthinking, they followed identical programming. One, grapple target. Two, dismantle with laser cutters. And three, process all raw materials. The giant machines were mindlessly murderous, blasting each other's hull plates, ripping metal arms and stuffing them into processing maws, an unconscionable disaster unfolding before Durga's eyes. The mineral exploiters were very efficient. It took less than ten standard minutes for them to rip each other to non-functional shreds, drifting hulks of torn-apart components and half-slagged molten ingots. The metal debris drifted apart, taking its own place in the asteroid field. 
Durga felt fury boiling inside him, and he hammered his fists on the control panels. He looked around at his technicians, seeking someone worthless to blame, but all of them had leaped out of their booby-trapped seats and stood at attention beside their panels, safely away from their chairs. Chapter 5 Bevel Lemelisk scowled as he trudged along the corridors of the Orko Skymine ship, huffing with the effort and with his own annoyance at Durga's constant demands. He stepped into the turbo lift for the bridge deck, muttering to himself, things he would never dare say in front of the bloated hut crime lord. Durga always wanted the impossible and wanted it now. The turbo lift lurched, yanking Lemelisk upward. He stumbled against the wall, grabbed the railing, and frowned at the controls as if they had intentionally made him lose his balance. Lemelisk patted his rounded paunch as his stomach growled. He had forgotten to eat midday meal again. He kept losing track of things. He brushed his cheeks, feeling the prickle of long, pale stubble, and realized he hadn't shaved in two days either. He sighed, chastising himself. He usually remembered to take care of personal hygiene before he appeared in front of Durga, but the insistent Gamorian guard hadn't given him a chance to collect his thoughts. Lemelisk ran a hand through his spiky white hair, making sure it stood up in straight shocks, just the way he preferred it, though he doubted the fat slug boss would ever notice a human's appearance. The turbo lift stopped with a sudden jolt, but this time Lemelisk braced himself. Before the doors opened, he worked up his indignation. He hated to be disturbed while he was concentrating. He had left specific orders that no one was to barge into his chambers. But the rude guard had done just that, lumbering in when Lemelisk was completing final touches on a difficult three-dimensional crystal lattice puzzle. All of Lemelisk's plans had shimmered and dissolved, plunging him back to square zero. This time, Bevel Lemelisk vowed he wouldn't be meek and groveling. He strode onto the command deck, drawing in a deep breath so that his chest temporarily looked larger than his belly. Durga, what is the meaning of this? he said, letting contempt fill his voice. The command deck personnel whirled at his words and cowered as if they had just been browbeaten. Lemelisk noticed that not a single one of them remained seated at their stations. He smelled singed meat in the air like badly cooked morning sausages. His empty stomach rumbled again. General Sulamar hunched forward as he strode toward Lemelisk. The glittering metals and badges on his chest jangled with a dizzying flash of color. Lemelisk ignored him. The Imperial General, with all his blustering talk of military exploits, such as the massacre of Mendicant, the subjugation of Sinton, and the rout of Rustabar, was all hot air. Lemelisk himself had, after all, overseen the construction of the Death Star battle station, how could mere military exploits compare to that? Seeing the weapons engineer, Durga issued a wordless roar of outrage and annoyance that sounded like a cross between a belch and a boiler explosion. Lemelisk stalled in his confident stride. He had never heard such anger in the hut's voice before. Lemelisk blinked his pale eyes, and his attention flickered to the bridge windows. He saw the spiraling orbits of rocky debris in the asteroid belt. Then he noticed the sputtering remnants of the two automated mineral exploiters that had torn each other apart. His throat felt as if it had been filled with quick-drying duracrete. Uh-oh, he said. Durga eased his repulsor sled closer to Lemelisk, who stood transfixed, trying to think up an excuse faster than the hut could do anything that Lemelisk might regret. I am most displeased with your performance, Lemelisk. Durga growled, his birthmark throbbing dark and threatening. Lemelisk shuddered violently, wincing as the clear and painful memories flooded back to him. The Emperor had said exactly those words just before he had executed Bevel Lemelisk for the first time. Shortly after the Death Star was expected to crush the rebel base on Yavin 4, Bevel Lemelisk had been summoned to meet personally with Emperor Palpatine deep within the Imperial Palace. Lemelisk had been flanked by red-armored Imperial bodyguards as they whisked him off on a high-speed shuttle across the sky lanes of the planet-wide city. The millions of illuminated windows winked like Karuska gems. Each point of light seemed to be another torch celebrating his triumph. Lemelisk rubbed his jowls, pleased that he had remembered to shave this time. 
The Red Imperial Guards were a silent lot, standing at attention like statues. Lemelisk hummed and grabbed his jutting knees as the shuttle approached the enormous pyramid of the Imperial Palace. The guards rushed him down the hall so quickly that their flowing scarlet cloaks billowed around them. When the group reached the door to the Emperor's private chambers, the guards stood at attention, their force pikes raised, their smooth plasteel helmets obscuring any expression. Lemelisk jaunted happily into the vaulted room, pleased to see the black-cowled Emperor waiting for him. Palpatine hunched in his chair, reptilian yellow eyes glowing through the oily shadows cast by his hood. The Emperor appeared to be falling into ill health. His skin was blistered and folded in upon itself like a pasty drapery over his bones, as if decay had set in well before the advent of death. But Lemelisk couldn't be troubled by unpleasant thoughts right now. He stood on the polished stone floor and made a cursory bow of obeisance. My emperor, he said, I trust you have received word by now that our Death Star has destroyed the secret rebel base. I have received word, Palpatine said, and gestured with one long clawed finger. Lemelisk glanced up at a clattering sound and saw a flexible wire cage released from the vaulted ceiling above. He ducked, but the cage fell squarely down over him, seating itself to the floor as if Palpatine were directing it with invisible powers. The cage was made of fine mesh, the grid barely large enough to stick his smallest finger through. Excuse me, Emperor, Lemelisk said. Is there something further you wish to discuss with me? Another project, perhaps? Anything else I can do for you? Lemelisk swallowed again. Yes, my servant. Palpatine said, You may die for me. Ah, uh, Lemelisk could think of nothing else to say. I was hoping for something else, actually, he said stupidly. Palpatine glowered at him. I have just received word that your Death Star was destroyed at Yavin. A puny band of rebels with outdated fighters found a weakness in your design a thermal exhaust port that allowed a single X-wing pilot to strike a fatal blow. One pilot obliterated an entire battle station. Lemelisk pursed his lips. Thermal exhaust port, eh? I knew I must have forgotten something. I'll have to fix that in the next design. Yes, you will, Palpatine said with an icy voice. But first, you will die for me. Lemelisk blinked his watery blue eyes and reached out to touch the fine, tough wires of his cage. He looked around, and nervousness raged like a whirlwind around him. Though he had shaved, his neck itched fiercely. The Emperor sat completely still, yet he must have manipulated a set of controls, because with a sharp snick at Lemelisk's feet, tiny openings appeared in the polished stone floor, orifices that led down to a black unknown. He heard clicking sounds, the scrabbling of sharp, hard feet. I am most displeased with your performance, Lemelisk, the Emperor said. Bevel Lemelisk shuffled aside as something small but iridescent poked out of the opening. A beetle of some kind. The eight-legged, hard-shelled insect shone a deep blue as it clambered into the light and paused to probe the air with waving antennae. From other openings five identical beetles emerged. They fluttered their wing cases, then took flight, buzzing around the enclosed space. Lemelisk swatted at one, but the blue beetle detected the motion and swooped toward him, sinking mandibles with serrated razor edges into the thick flesh of his palm. Ow! Lemelisk flailed his hand until the beetle lost its hold. He stomped on it, cracking its carapace. But the scent of blood attracted the other beetles to him. He watched in horrified fascination as a dozen more of the insects emerged from the floor holes, fluttering their wing cases and buzzing toward him. Those are piranha beetles, the Emperor said, lounging back in his swiveling black chair. They are native to Yavin 4, and I consider them too precious for extinction when your Death Star was expected to destroy the moon. So I rescued them. The beetles swarmed over Lemelisk now. He slapped at them, shouting, paying little attention to Palpatine's words. Stop this, he yelled. Not yet, the Emperor said. The beetles sliced through his clothing to the skin on Lemelisk's arms, his thighs, his chest, his cheeks. Blood flowed around him, drenching his shredded clothes. He could not keep up with the new injuries. Hundreds more beetles swarmed out, battering themselves against the cage mesh. 
These fine insects are not in danger of becoming extinct after all, though, Palpatine said. Since your Death Star did not work, you have failed me, Bevel Lemelisk. He said, slowing his words, his wrinkled, rubbery lips bent upward in a fiendish grin. And now I'm going to watch these beetles devour you bit by bit. They are very hungry, you see, and don't get satisfied easily. But if they gorge themselves and begin to slow down, don't worry. I have plenty more. The emperor let out a glacial laugh, but Lemelisk could no longer hear. The beetles buzzed in his ears, tearing at his flesh, his hair, his clothes. He struck at himself, throwing his body against the cage mesh. In the process, some of the beetles were stunned, and their own companions fell upon them, cracking through the iridescent shells and chewing to the soft organs within. Lemelisk screamed and begged, to no avail. The agony went beyond his comprehension, beyond his imagination. His vision turned black after the piranha beetles devoured his eyes, but the pain continued for a long time afterward. Later, Lemelisk had awakened, blinking his restored eyes, and he was completely disoriented. He found himself in the same vaulted chamber, wrapped in a clean white uniform. His body felt young and strong, without the paunch and the flab from spending too much time working on projects in his mind and too little effort maintaining his health. Lamelisk bent his arms and looked at his hands, blinking in astonishment. Hearing a small buzz and clatter, he glanced over to find the wire mesh cage still filled with buzzing, clacking piranha beetles that scampered up and down the walls, snapping their mandibles. Spattered patterns of fresh blood made arcs along the walls of the cage. Inside, he saw a carcass that had been stripped down to gnawed bones and shreds of clothing, the clothing he himself had worn only moments ago. You'll grow accustomed to your clone in a moment, the emperor said, rubbing his knobby fingers over a strange, ancient-looking artifact. I trust that all of your memories have been transferred properly. It is an uncertain skill at best, and the Jedi I stole the technique from was reluctant to give me thorough instruction. But it seems to work. Lemelisk nodded weakly, wanting to faint but knowing he didn't dare. Now don't fail me again, Lemelisk, the Emperor said. I'd hate to have to think of an even worse execution for next time. Now as he faced Durga the Hutt and Imperial General Sulamar, Lemelisk sought some reservoir of strength within himself. The mineral exploiters had destroyed each other in a horribly embarrassing debacle. We can recover from this, he said quickly. Yes, I believe I can alter our plans so that our schedule will remain unaffected in the long run. Durga lurched backward, blinking his large copper-red eyes. What? You have the two other automated mineral exploiters nearly completed. This is a tragic loss, Lemelisk said, gesturing toward the window. But we have to expect a few setbacks. This was poor planning, I admit, but I can program the other machines so that such a failure will not occur again. General Sulamar squared his shoulders and glared at Lemelisk. You are absolutely correct, he said. This will not happen again. Lemelisk dismissed him with a wave of his hand, trying to display more self-assurance than he felt. Consider those two to be test prototypes, Alpha and Beta, expendable. We know the error now. But Lemelisk mentally kicked himself for letting such a stupid lack of foresight nearly cost him his life. He began to tremble and clamped down on his muscles, forcing himself to stand firm. He had no wish to be executed again. That had happened enough times already, though he was convinced Durga the Hutt could never be a match for Palpatine's cruelty. I promise to rectify the problem, Lord Durga, Lemelisk said with a bow. But while I'm doing that, you must focus on our main goal. Even before we worry about construction resources, the primary item on our agenda must be to get those plans from the Imperial Information Center. Durga growled, a low gurgling sound. General Sulamar said, It is not your place to dictate. Durga smacked the stuffed shirt Imperial across the chest with one fat-fingered hand. I have already scheduled an expedition to Karaskant, Lamelisk, he said. I will have your precious plans shortly. Coruscant, Chapter 6 
In the plush chambers of the New Republic's chief of state, Leia Organa Solo hurried to make herself presentable. Beside her, Han Solo fiddled with his shirt fasteners and cursed the tiny glittering insignia he tried to apply to his diplomatic finery. I hate this, Leia, he said. I love you enough to do this, but I don't enjoy getting dressed up even to meet people I like. He finally buttoned the insignia, then brushed down his shirt front. And I don't exactly count those overgrown mud worms among the people I like. Leia placed her hand on his shoulder. Do you think I like it any more than you do? Vividly she recalled her imprisonment by the vile Jabba the Hutt when he had forced her to wear a humiliating costume and sit chained in front of him so he could caress her with his enormous rubbery tongue. The Hutts had a death warrant out on both of us not long ago, but this Durga is making some new kind of overture. It's a diplomatic necessity that we receive the fat slug and hear what he has to say. Diplomatic necessity, Han scoffed. I wouldn't trust one of those blobs of slime farther than I could roll him. Keep a blaster hidden in your robes. Leia checked herself in the surround mirror. She looked cool and perfect in her best raiments, impressive and regal. I will, Han. Don't worry. 3PO entered, quiet hums emanating from his servo motors. Excuse me, Mistress Leia, he said. I believe I am prepared for this important meeting of state. I have polished all of my body plates and oiled my gears and brushed up on my programming for protocol and etiquette. Great, Han said. You can take my place, okay? Sir, 3PO exclaimed. I hardly believe that would be wise. Why, he's joking, 3PO, Leia said, glaring at Han. Sure, 3PO, just joking, Han agreed a little too quickly. The children wish to say good night to you, 3PO said. Mistress Winter is already here and has made preparations to tell them bedtime stories. The droid held his golden arms out as if in a mechanical shrug. Somehow the children don't enjoy it when I tell them stories. I'm simply at a loss to explain it. Leia paid little attention to the litany of the droid's complaints. Children are just difficult sometimes, she said. The twins, Jason and Jaina, were three years old now and beginning to get into everything imaginable. Baby Anakin, now nearly two, remained quiet and withdrawn, sleeping a lot, barely attempting to talk. The dark-haired boy with the large ice-blue eyes lived in his own world most of the time, while the twins insisted on making themselves the center of attention. I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Han said, brushing his brown hair and letting out a long breath. Still can't believe I'm making myself look pretty for a hut. I doubt Lord Durga would notice, sir, 3PO added helpfully. The huts have a different standard of beauty, you know. In fact, I have learned. Not now, 3PO, Han said, and offered his arm to Leia as he escorted her toward the door. Some other time, perhaps, 3PO said, and hurried after them. Out in the common room, Winter sat on a padded seat with the three children on the floor as she spoke to them, telling a detailed story she had memorized word for word. Leia's personal servant had helped her through many difficult times, guarding the children during the most vulnerable early years in their Force-sensitive lives. Winter had a flawless memory and never needed to refresh her thoughts, able to recall word for word anything she had heard or read in her life. Despite her calm, emotionless demeanor, Winter carried the deepest and most unshakable loyalty for Leia herself and for the New Republic. Winter seemed to enjoy her role of watching the three children, while Leia and Han kept enormously busy with matters of state. Her new position allowed her to continue advising Leia as an appropriate confidant, yet remain behind the scenes. Jason and Jaina leaped to their feet, scuttling over to greet Leia and Han. Hey, Han cried, and grabbed the twins in a bear hug. Jason's brown hair was tousled, as it always was, while Jaina's hung straight and neat. Anakin remained quiet and politely seated, patiently waiting for Winter to continue the story. He got up when it was his turn for a hug. Winter will watch you, Leia said to the children. Mommy and Daddy have an important meeting with a hut. The children snickered. Han looked at her with raised eyebrows and a see-I-told-you-so expression on his face. Come on, Goldenrod, he said to 3PO. 
we sure wouldn't want to be late for our diplomatic necessity. They left their quarters and a pair of permanently stationed guards escorted them down the hall. 3PO rattled on as they marched. Perhaps some background would be of use in your upcoming negotiations, Mistress Leia. I have recently downloaded... We don't know if there are going to be any negotiations, 3PO, Leia said. The Huts are the biggest gang of criminals in the galaxy. They took me prisoner, and then they tried to kill us all. I don't think we should expect too much kindness. Yes, yes, but it would be most useful to have a basic understanding of Hut philosophy, as I interpret it according to the admittedly sparse, information I've been able to find, 3PO said. The Huts originally came from a system called Varro, whose star suffered some sort of disaster, and so they were forced to move to another planetary system. They took over an entire planet through devious business dealings until they managed to evict the former inhabitants and claim the world for themselves. They renamed it Nal Hutta, which in their own language means glorious jewel. The moon of Nal Hutta was named Nar Shada, but in common parlance it is known as the smuggler's moon. We've been there, 3PO, Han said, bored. Oh yes, I forgot. In any case, the Huts have an extremely involved clan system, and no one outside is permitted to know the family name of any Hut. Thus, Jabba's own clan name was known only to his relatives. Very interesting, Han mumbled, as they turned the corner and headed toward the rear of the presidential receiving room. I sure can't understand why the kids would rather have Winter tell them a bedtime story. Why, thank you, sir, 3PO said, missing Han's irony entirely. Actually, very little is known about how the Hut clans interact, although certain accidents and disasters have led some to speculate on inter-clan warfare in which stronger Hut families wipe out weaker ones. The guard at a large door leading into the receiving room stood aside. Leia passed through shoulder to shoulder with Han. Thanks, 3PO. That'll be all, she said. Ah, but I have so much more to tell you, the droid continued. Take a hint, Goldenrod. Han said more loudly. I take your meaning, sir, 3PO said, then whirred quietly after them into the receiving room. Leia leaned over and whispered to Han as they passed into the echoing room. Han, the Hut Crime Empire is very powerful, and we'll need to show them diplomatic courtesy. We've got to at least pretend to be civil. Han rolled his eyes, then pulled his elbow against his side, pressing her hand to his ribs in a warm gesture. Pretend? Han said. Pretending happens to be one of my strong suits. You just watch. Another set of escorts followed them on either side of inlaid flagstones that formed a promenade to a pair of impressive-looking chairs. Leia didn't like the frivolous display. It seemed too regal, too imperial but appearances were very important in public spectacles and matters of state. While the senators and the military leaders formed the backbone of her power, Leia herself was the chief of state and president of the Senate. She was the visible face on all decisions made for the government, and so she was forced to play her part with grace and charisma. Leia had had her difficulties with some members of the council, particularly those who wished her to remain at home for her entire term of office, and never venture out to the scattered but reluctant planets who expressed interest in joining the New Republic. That just wasn't her style. Leia seated herself in the Chief of State's chair and tried to collect her thoughts. Han shifted beside her, crossing and uncrossing his arms over his dress shirt, then gripping the scrolled work of the armrests. He looked bored already. Electronic fanfare sounded from outside the chamber. The doors at the other end of the room groaned open, dragged by sluggish worker droids that were no more than boxy torsos upon which were fastened heavy arms and legs for performing difficult labor. As the doors opened and Durga's entourage passed into the reception chamber, Leia saw that the hut crime lord also knew the value of spectacle. The bloated worm-like creature reclined on a broad pallet that drifted above the floor on a cushion of repulsor lifts. But Durga moved forward through the plotting efforts of a team of Gamorian slaves lashed to the floating platform by red velvet bonds. 
The pig-like guards kept their squinting eyes to the polished flagstones. Drips of moisture splattered the floor as the Gamorians either perspired heavily or simply drooled. Stooped, lizard servants trooped into the audience chamber in front of the Gamorian guards. Their triangular heads bobbed low to the ground as they placed electronic music synthesizers to their lips and hissed into the voice pickups. The computer then processed and transmitted the noises as beautiful brassy reception music. Durga the Hutt heaved himself up as if to emphasize his importance. If anything, Durga seemed even fatter than Java. His sloping head was like a sagging mound of slime, stained by some sort of birthmark like dark green ink thrown in his face. His huge round eyes were like spoiled fruit. His childlike hands seemed out of place on his swollen body. What made Leia's breath catch in her throat, though, were the dozens and dozens of hairy creatures swarming over Durga and his retainers like large simian lice. The creatures were each about the size of Leia's forearm, with grayish-brown fur and large, curious eyes. Each one had four supple arms that extended in dexterous fingers. The two legs appeared flexible enough to be used as a third set of arms and hands, should the need arise. The creatures constantly shifted position like vermin, blinking their eyes and staring in all directions, as if voracious for information. Threepio stepped forward and spoke his pre-programmed message. The New Republic gives greeting to Mighty Durga, he said, but then his own personality won out. And, if I might be permitted to ask, what are those furry creatures with you? Does a protocol droid speak for you? Durga said in his deep belly voice. I would appreciate an answer to his question, Leia said. I am Chief of State Leia Organa Solo. My immediate apologies for the unsettling dealings you have had with huts in the past, Durga said. My people have been known to carry grudges for a long time, because we are such long-lived creatures. Yeah, well, Jabba didn't live so long, Han muttered. Leia gestured for him to be quiet. Times change, Durga continued, clasping his small hands in front of him. Many of my clan members are disturbed that I should speak to you, but it means a great deal to me. I am willing to let past matters fade to shadows for the profit and improvement of our situations. I would appreciate it if you would do the same, at least for the sake of these conversations. Leia nodded cool and aloof. I agree for the moment, she said, but you still haven't answered my droid's question. I too am interested in your furry companions. We haven't seen their like before. Ah, please excuse me, Durga said. These are the Toril, semi-intelligent creatures, busy workers, and good pets. They passed all quarantine scans when we arrived on Karuskant. They are insatiably curious and would like to explore. They intend no harm. Leia then used a tactic Luke had taught her, urging that even if she did not intend to become a full Jedi Knight, she should at least learn to use her Force sensitivity in diplomatic matters. This was a skill Leia couldn't afford to ignore, and as she sat calm-faced, her mind worked furiously, attempting to sense the real purpose behind Durga's mission. She detected distant reactions from the Gamorian guards, who knew virtually nothing about their own situation. The Toril were a fuzzy, confusing mass of faint impressions. But Durga the Hutt remained a blank wall to her. Somehow his mind was strong enough to resist her probing, or perhaps the Hutts were genetically shielded, because she remembered that Luke also could not read or manipulate Jabba the Hutt. If my pets make you uncomfortable, Durga said in a conciliatory tone, I would be happy to remove them from my person. He clapped his small hands together, and the Toril scattered, departing from his platform and leaping onto the shoulders of the Gamorian guards. Leia guessed there must be at least a hundred of the frenetic little creatures. They scampered across the flagstoned floor, examining alcoves, planetary banners, and displays. One ran up and studied Threepio, and the golden droid tried to shoo it away. Durga, I must insist that you control... Leia began. Pay them no mind, Durga spoke in a loud, commanding tone. They'll cause no damage. Now, 
to the point of my visit. Beside her, Han flicked his glance nervously around as the Toril wandered about the room, poking into corners creeping behind their chairs. Leia was forced to regain her composure so she could outthink the hut crime lord. She thought she knew what Durga was trying to do. He wanted to rattle them, distract her into giving something away, but she wouldn't let him manipulate her. She stonily pretended that the distracting creatures were not there. That would fluster him. Yes, Durga, she said, I am most interested in your mission to Coruscant. What brings a hut crime lord to an audience with the legitimate government of the New Republic? Durga spread his arms wide. Madam President, your words wound me. Let us not begin these talks with definitions of crime lords and legitimate governments. We are all trying to do what is best for ourselves. The Hut Kajidic, the clan system of business that my brothers and I have established, encompasses a great many worlds, a significant fraction, I dare say, of your own new republic. The Huts do not want war, commercial or actual, and I don't believe your fledgling government can afford a drawn-out struggle either. Unlike the Empire, we Huts have an invisible web of influence and relationships in places you cannot imagine. Far more than a simple military garrison you can strike. He blinked his heavy-lidded eyes. However, I do not come here to make threats, but an overture of peace. Although you called our operations a criminal empire, I am here to offer an end to all that unpleasantness. Our simplest solution is legitimacy. I propose that the Huts form an alliance with the New Republic, become commercial partners. If you legalize our activities, then we are no longer a criminal empire, but a respected commercial venture. Is that not true? he said, with a gesture toward the ceiling, as if to indicate his high hopes. We huts could carry out our business without the need for secrecy and security, and thereby increase our profits enormously. We would pay appropriate taxes and tariffs, and the new republic would grow stronger as well. You could then marshal your defenses toward fighting your true enemies, rather than simple business competitors such as ourselves. Is that the only reason, Leia said, trying to keep the skepticism from her voice. The Toril continued their relentless poking and prodding and investigating, but Leia fixed her gaze on Durga the Hutt. We Huts have our pride, Durga continued. It is our greatest wish to become respectable, true businessmen, rather than powerful outlaws. I see, Leia said. Using her mask of diplomatic training, she smiled. But in her mind, she vowed that all the stars in the galaxy would burn to cold ash before she ever entered into an alliance with the Huts. Just then one of the New Republic Honor Guards, who had tried valiantly to remain quiet during the negotiations, attempted to scare away two of the Toril that had begun crawling on him like mammalian spiders. They climbed the guard's uniform, though he swiped at them to brush them off. He swung his ceremonial blaster rifle, trying to jostle them free. One of the Toril grabbed the weapon as if it were a tree branch and pulled himself on to the end. The other Toril climbed the length of the guard's forearm to the firing button of the blaster, and accidentally, though Leia had the odd impression that it might have been intentional, pushed the firing stud. The rifle fired, blasting the hapless Toril at the end of the barrel into a flaming ball of furry cinders. Durga's wide mouth dropped open like a trap door. The other Toril shrieked in sudden panic. The guard gaped down at his blaster rifle in dismay. I didn't mean it, he said. The hundred Toril in the reception chamber fled in all directions with an ear-splitting volley of panicked chitters heading out the door into the air ducts, hiding behind the chairs and in any shadowy corner. Don't let them escape, Durga howled. They are my pets, and I would be most displeased to lose any of them. The hut glared at the poor New Republic guard as if he wanted to feed him to a rancor. The honor guards instantly broke formation, rushing around to grab the multi-armed pets. The Gamorians turned in circles, chomping their tusks, clearly not understanding what had just happened. 3PO flailed his golden arms and ran after several of the creatures. Leia sent for more assistance, 
but she knew the vast echoing corridors of the enormous imperial palace offered infinite places for the Torrell to hide. Han lounged back in his chair with a wry lopsided grin. Told you we shouldn't have bothered to dress up, he said. In the confusion, three of the Torrell easily made it to their destination, winding through the air ducts, between walls and along pipes, descending deep below the former imperial palace into the shielded secret chambers far down in the bedrock, the imperial information center. The Torrell were a hive mind, a single organism with thousands and thousands of bodies sharing one collective consciousness. Each of the individual creatures was merely an extra set of eyes and ears and hands to do the bidding of the overmind that controlled all of its members. Durga had discovered the Toril in the outer rim and had paid dearly for information on how to exploit the scattered mass mind. Durga had then quietly executed the one explorer and xenobiologist who had uncovered the secret of the Toril. Now only Durga knew what the cute, furry creatures were actually capable of. He had entered into a pact with the Toril, promising the Overmind great wealth and power. But what the Overmind really wanted was to spread itself out across the reaches of the galaxy, dispersing its members to different star systems so that it could grow. Durga was only too happy to comply. Now, while dozens of the Toril remained in the diplomatic reception room, creating a diversion and acting innocently confused and frightened, these three Toril commandos slipped into the shielded computer database compiled by Emperor Palpatine himself. The room was cold and sterile, smelling of metal. The doors were guarded by heavily armed assassin droids. Mechanical slicers hunched over the information terminals, jacked in and focused entirely on their work. The Toril emerged from tiny access openings, scrunching themselves down to make their bodies small enough to pass through. On nimble feet they pattered across the cold floor plates, swinging their four arms until the three reached separate access terminals. The Toril crawled up and began work at different stations, punching through obscure menus, finding the information they needed. Although the system was heavily guarded and passworded, the Toril entered the special codes and phrases that had been obtained from Jabba's secret stash of information. Before long, the Toril had broken through. One of them inserted a small information cylinder and began downloading the precious plans. Data spilled into the compact new container. After only a few moments, their mission was complete. The Toril secreted away their data cylinder, and in unison the three furry commandos scampered back to the access openings. The Overmind knew exactly what had been accomplished and transmitted that information to Durga through one of the calm and recaptured Toril bodies up in the reception room. Durga petted the creature, rumbling with pleasure. In the reception chamber, Leia held her head in her hands, wondering how to salvage the situation, but also trying to stifle a laugh. She didn't particularly care if Durga's dignity had been offended. One of the reptilian retainers hummed into his musical synthesizer again, sending out a loud and soothing tone that made Leia's teeth throb. It seemed to serve as a summons for the Toril, though. Cooing and purring, they ran toward the music as if drawn by invisible leashes. They approached Durga's sled, dozens and dozens of them emerging from hiding places like a swarm of vermin. If that was so easy, Leia wondered aloud, why didn't Durga simply use the musical tones at the very beginning? The Gamorians began counting the Toril as they came in, but the stupid guards lost track numerous times until Threepio finally stepped in to help. He rapidly pointed to each of the remaining fuzzy creatures. Ninety-seven, Lord Durga, that is my count for the Toril. The hut grumbled. I came here with ninety-eight, and your man executed one of them so I believe our tally is intact. He glared at the nervous honor guard. Perhaps, Madam President, you would consider reassigning your trigger-happy escort, who was given to such disruptive outbursts during a delicate diplomatic negotiation. I will consider it, Durga, Leia said, but perhaps you should consider leaving your unruly pets behind if you plan to conduct delicate diplomatic negotiations. And if you simply must bring them, keep them under tighter control when they are in the vicinity of dangerous weapons. 
Durga reared up as if offended, then let out a deep belly laugh. I like you, Leia Organa Solo. I am glad to have such a strong counterpart who does not cower in fear. I wish to continue these negotiations at some time in the future. Allow me to extend an invitation for you to make a visit to Nal Hatta at your convenience. I would be happy to receive you there. Leia nodded, noncommittal. I'll consider it, Durga, she said, if my rather busy schedule will permit it. Durga bowed on his repulsor sled and bade them all farewell. The Gamorian guards turned the hut around and strained against their red velvet leashes, pulling the floating sled back out into the corridor. The worker droids groaned and shuffled as they swung the heavy doors shut. Leia slumped back in her seat and only then noticed that she was perspiring heavily. Han patted her hand. We really should spend more time with the huts. They seem like such a pleasant species, he said. Now how about we get something to eat? Yavin 4 Chapter 7 Callista sat alone in the jungles as night gathered on Yavin 4. Near the horizon, a lambent glow from the setting gas giant streaked the sky. Masasi trees rose tall, spreading their many branched silhouettes against the deepening purple. Stars poked out, lights twinkling through a cloak of blackness. She had not gone far from the great temple where Luke Skywalker had founded his Jedi Academy. The staircased pyramid had endured for thousands of years and stood now like a jagged black cutout surrounded by dusk. Callista sat with her long legs crossed in front of a campfire she had built from dry brush, concentrating, allowing no distractions. Her malt blonde hair was mussed and windblown, but her gray eyes were fixed on the flames. The warmth spread out in waves, gentle but insistent, driving back the damp coolness that settled over the lowlands. She stared into the flames and pushed, but she felt nothing, not even a flicker of her former abilities. Feathery tongues of fire licked at the logs, lending the bark a soft orange glow. Tiny sparks drifted into the air in corkscrew patterns, like incandescent starfighters crashing to oblivion. Callista grimaced and tried harder to touch the flames with her mind to nudge the embers. But nothing happened. She sensed no communion with the fire. Luke's other Jedi trainees could make the flames dance, pulling them out like flexible sheets to make faces, images, twisting them into braids. It was a simple Jedi exercise. Callista had learned how to do it many years ago, Back then she had not even needed to concentrate. But now, try as she might, the flames would not respond. Her Jedi powers had abandoned her. She stood with a lost sigh of frustration and kicked apart the logs to let the fire die. Sparks showered upward like a rekindled space battle, and the embers fought to maintain their brightness. Callista trudged back toward the great stone pyramid, wondering when Luke would come back. Behind her, the fire gasped and died into a waning glow. As Callista readied for bed, alone, she answered a summons at her door, surprised to find the Jedi woman, Tion, standing in the corridor. I found something in the records, Tion said, blinking her mother-of-pearl eyes over an anxious expression. She had a narrow face, pointed chin, high cheekbones and large eyes, framed by long silvery hair that gave her an elfin, ethereal appearance. It isn't much, but I thought you'd like to know. Her voice had a musical lilt, and it was not surprising that Tion enjoyed singing, accompanied by a stringed instrument of her own devising. Tion was not one of Luke's stronger trainees, but she had proven to be his most skilled assistant and teacher at the academy. She had always been intrigued by Jedi lore and legends, and she spent much time studying archives, compiling a great history of the thousand generations of Jedi knights who had served the Old Republic. Come in, Callista said, gesturing. What is it? Tion raised her pale eyebrows. You might like to know that at least you aren't alone, not in history at any rate. Callista perked up. Other Jedi have lost their powers before? Yes, there was another. Tion sat down on the rumpled covers of Callista's sleeping pallet, her mysterious pearlescent eyes widening. 
she enjoyed nothing more than retelling the Jedi legends she knew and loved so well. Ulic Keldroma, a great warlord who fought in the Sith War on the side of evil with Exar Kun. He betrayed Kun and led the Jedi Knights here, where they trapped Kun's spirit in the temples and laid waste to the entire moon. But by turning to the dark side, Ulic Keldroma damned himself forever, and in a final confrontation he was stripped of his Force ability. But how? Callista said. The Force is in all things. How can one Jedi Knight strip another of the ability to use it? Ulic was not deprived of anything, Tion continued, in a manner of speaking. He was blindfolded to the Force. Ulic no longer had access to it. But how could I have had such blinders placed upon me? Callista said. Was it just a consequence of my spirit entering another body? Cray's body, Tion said with a slight tightening in her throat. Callista remembered that the silver-haired Jedi woman had known Cray well, had trained with her, and now Callista's spirit inhabited the same body, while Cray herself had died in a suicide mission against the Eye of Palpatine. I can't explain it, Tion said with a shrug. I can only tell you what I've learned. Every piece of information adds more to the solution. Someday, Tion rested her long and delicate fingers on Callista's forearm. We'll find the answer. Callista nodded and stood to usher Tion out the door. The great temple had fallen silent with late evening, the other Jedi trainees either sleeping or meditating in their own chambers. Out in the corridor, the little astromech droid R2-D2 puttered along the flagstones, looking lost without Luke Skywalker. Callista vowed to keep trying, keep searching. There had to be some way. She had waited for so long inside the computer, and now that she had found her love in Luke, she would not let him go without a fight. But she could not be a part of him, true Jedi to true Jedi, until she regained her ability to use the Force. She couldn't give everything to him until then. Their time had been so brief before they had been snatched apart, left with only their loss to look into each other's eyes with an invisible barrier between them that neither could breach. Callista swallowed, but her throat remained dry. Despite her reservations, she could not wait until Luke Skywalker returned to her. When Luke did return several days later, Callista knew instantly that he had been unsuccessful. She was unable to read him in the way she had once sensed emotions with her Jedi potential, but she could tell by his demeanor and downcast expression that he had not found the answers he sought. She met Luke on the landing grid in front of the pyramid. The other Jedi students emerged one by one to welcome their master home. Callista ran to him. Luke moved quickly, delighted to see her. He caught her in his arms, holding her close, but said nothing. She kissed him, then spoke quietly into his ear. General Kenobi did not answer your summons, she asked. He looked at her strangely, blinking his cool blue eyes, and then smiled. I keep forgetting you were a Jedi so long ago that you knew Obi-Wan when he was a young military commander. He averted his gaze. No, he didn't answer. Then he spoke quickly as if to reassure her. But that doesn't mean anything. I'm going to keep trying, and so are you, he said. You can bet on that, she agreed. I'd do anything so we can be together. So would I, Luke said. If only I knew what to do. Let's go greet the others. Callista slipped her arm around his waist. He held her, and the two walked toward the temple. I'm sorry you didn't find the answer, she said, but just having you back makes me happy. That much I can give you, Luke said, but I hope we can have more, so much more. We will, Callista said. Chapter 8 A heavy, warm rain sheared through the jungle, pattering on the glossy leaves. Master Skywalker ignored it or accepted it as he led his group of students along the wet pathways through the undergrowth surrounding the great temple. Droplets of glittering water danced across their Jedi robes. Kip Duran looked up at the open patches of leaden gray sky through the tall trees. The rain caressed his face with pearly fingers that traced the contours of his chin and ran into the hollow of his throat. 
Others might have taken the gloom and storm as an ill omen, but rain brought life to the jungle moon, and Kip considered it a healthy change from the humid sunshine. Kilgal, the Calamarian Jedi Knight, walked directly behind Master Skywalker. Her watery blue robes rippled around her, already soaked, though they looked as if they were designed to be wet. Her salmon-colored skin glistened, and she blinked her large fish eyes in contentment at the rain. Kip walked beside the cloned alien Dorsk-81, whose smooth skin and rounded features made him appear streamlined, with all the sharp edges worn away. Dorsk-81 had pale olive-green skin, wide yellow eyes, and an open, innocent face. The cloned alien had been fighting to regain his self-assurance, struggling with generations of identical and talentless predecessors in his genetic line. Kip and Dorsk-81 had become close companions in the past year. They had opposite personalities, which might have made them clash, but somehow the two filled each other's empty spots. Master Skywalker led the group of trainees through the hushed underbrush, where even the birds and insects remained subdued, hidden under the shelter of thick leaves from the downpour. They came down an embankment to the wide river that sliced through the jungle, a broad ribbon of greenish water that teemed with life. The current flowed swiftly. Thousands of pockmarks dimpled the surface as rain pounded down. Across the river and through the rain, Kip could see the ruins of another Masasi temple, the tall, crumbling temple of the Blue Leaf Cluster. Nearby, the large power-generating station hummed and steamed in the afternoon shower. Master Skywalker stopped at the bank, his feet squishing in the mud. He spread his hands at his sides as if drawing up lines of force from beneath the surface. He shrugged back his hood. His pale brown hair had darkened from the falling rain and lay plastered in thick clumps against his head. Raindrops sparkled on his cheeks as he turned toward the other trainees. I am pleased to be marking a passage, he said. The river flows, as does the force, never ending, always moving. I brought you to Yavin 4 to begin your instruction. I can only set you on the path of the light side and open your minds to the possibilities of the Force. You must all complete your own training. Each of you must decide when that time has come. Since the New Republic needs Jedi Knights to spread peace and stability, we cannot stay here indefinitely in our comfortable academy. Master Skywalker looked at the drenched candidates and at his own soaked robe. Well, maybe it's not always comfortable, he said. The Jedi students chuckled. Kip felt suddenly nervous. Although he had looked forward to this graduation for a long time, he now felt as if he were putting an end to one of the most important times in his life, even if it meant he was about to start an even more crucial or exciting phase. Three trainees have decided to depart from the Jedi Praxium, the academy where we learn action and learn the Force. Kip and Dorsk-81 stepped forward to stand beside Kilgal and turned to face the other Jedi trainees. Kilgal tilted her head to the sky, letting the rain stream across her face. They have mastered each lesson I prepared for them, Luke Skywalker said. They have built their own lightsabers and completed their training. Kilgal withdrew her own lightsaber handle from her pale blue robe. Her weapon was silvery and smooth, with subtle indentations and blisters, as if organically grown, much like the large Mon Calamari star cruisers. Kip and Dorsk-81 pulled out their own lightsabers. As one, the three graduates flicked on the weapons. Steam sizzled around them as raindrops hissed against the glowing blades. You three must go and become guardians for the galaxy, protectors of the New Republic, Master Skywalker said. You must fight the dark side in all its manifestations. You are Jedi Knights now. Kilgal focused her round eyes on the humming blade in front of her. I will return to my home world, where I serve both as a Jedi Knight and an ambassador. The Mon Calamari are talented and industrious people. We can pool our resources to enhance the stability of the New Republic. Dorsk-81 blinked his yellow eyes and looked nervously to Kip, who gave a slight nod of encouragement. The cloned alien said, 
I wish to return to my home planet as well, to Calm, where our society has remained the same for centuries, showing them that I am changed, that I have become a Jedi Knight. We'll shake them up, he said. His slit mouth turned upward in a faint smile. I believe they need to be reawakened. Master Skywalker then looked at Kip, who drew himself up to seem as tall as Dorsgate one. I'll go with him for now, Kip said. His home world is toward the center of the galaxy, near the core systems. I'm really worried that the Empire has been so quiet in the last couple of years. Sure, we've seen the renegade Admiral Dalla and the Eye of Palpatine. Here Master Skywalker flinched and glanced at Callista, who, though she appeared wet and bedraggled in the rain, still glowed with affection for Luke. But I still think the warlords must be planning something, Kip said. I can't imagine any greater service to the New Republic than for me to find out what's going on. I'll slip in and snoop around the Empire. Master Skywalker nodded in approval, then addressed the other Jedi trainees. Someday you all will become guardians. Think of where you might go, where you could do the most good. He turned back to the newly graduated Jedi Knights. May the Force be with you. Kip looked at the others, saw uneasiness or hard determination. Tion nodded peacefully. Cam Salusar, the hard-edged Jedi, stood unblinking as if nothing could affect him. Kirana Tai, the warrior woman from Dathomir, looked confident in her glittering red and green reptilian armor. Beside her, the addle-brained hermit from Bespin, Streen, looked at the raindrops on his hands and flicked his gaze from side to side. Kirana Tai placed a strong hand on his shoulder, as if she could suddenly sense his doubts. The others reacted in their own ways, agreeing or looking away. Kip knew Luke's original group of trainees well. Others were new arrivals, coming to be trained as the word went out from system to system, and more potential Jedi Knights were found. Master Skywalker dropped his hands to his sides, relaxing. Kip switched off his own lightsaber, and the handle swallowed the silvery pure blade. Kilgal and Dorsk 81 also extinguished their weapons. Luke smiled at them all. I think I've had enough rain. Let's go back to the temple. Suddenly Kip felt the tension fade from the air, and it seemed as if they were a group of companions on a simple hike, rather than in a ceremony laden with galactic import. Master Skywalker stepped into the milling group of trainees, seeking out Callista. He took her hand, and they smiled at each other as they led the others along an overgrown path back to the great temple. En route to Comb, Dorsk 81 piloted the small private spacecraft the New Republic had given them. The cloned alien watched the bright spot of his homeworld grow. Approaching on standard vector, Kip said from the passenger seat and toggled the comm system. Kip Doran and Dorsk 81 on approach, request landing coordinates. Within a moment, the space traffic controller calmly gave Kip the data he needed. He looked curiously at Dorsk 81. Are they expecting us? he said. The olive-skinned alien shook his head. No, they just rarely respond to anything in an unusual way. Kip looked at the cloned alien, recalling a previous time they had traveled together. While under the influence of Exar Kun, the ancient dark lord of the Sith, he had gone with Dorsk 81 to an abandoned jungle temple, Kun's private fortress of solitude. There, the Black Spirit tried to destroy Dorsk 81 on a whim to demonstrate the power of the dark side. Kip had saved him, though Dorsk 81 hadn't even known about it. Since the defeat of Kun, when Dorsk 81 had faced his fears and his inadequacy, the cloned alien had become stronger by accepting his own limitations. Kip did not push him, but let the smooth-skinned alien follow his own path. The pale green sphere of comb grew larger, filling the viewport. From a distance, the planet seemed peaceful and misty, featureless. It had no natural satellites, not even phases of the moon to make regular change. Comb's orbit was practically circular, the tilt of its axis non-existent, creating no change of seasons. So close to the galactic center, the moonless sky was filled with bright stars. Looking forward to going home? Kip asked as Dorsk 81 altered the navigation controls 
to take them into a low-energy orbit from which they could begin a smooth descent to the spaceport. The alien nodded. I'm eager to see my duplicates again, he said. Because they all came from the same clone stock, obviously Dorskate one could not call them his parents or siblings because they were all genetically the same. Something subtle had changed with Dorsk-81, though, giving him an ability to touch the force that none of the other clone stock had exhibited so far. I am particularly looking forward to seeing Dorsk-82, he said. Grown from my genes, it is likely he has matured since I have been away. Kip blinked in surprise. He hadn't known that Dorsk-81 had a child, offspring, younger duplicate. I'm looking forward to meeting him, too. As Dorsk-81 piloted the ship in for a landing, Kip looked up at the densely clustered stars that made a broad river of light across the night of space. The core systems. He vowed to find out what the Empire had been doing after all this time. Core Systems Chapter 9 True night was impossible in the core systems. Stars clustered so closely together that even the blackest regions of space were a symphony of stellar flares and hot ionized gas clumped in regions once considered uninhabitable. In a navigational hell like this, remnants of the Empire hid among uncharted systems where they could wait and recover, and war upon each other. Admiral Dalla walked erect and alone, a proud example of Imperial training, as stormtrooper guards provided an armed escort into the fortress of Supreme Warlord Harsk. Her face appeared to be chiseled from stone, still beautiful, but now weathered so that its edges held a bitter sharpness. Faint lines were etched around her mouth from too many years of clenching her teeth, too many months trying to reunite the feuding warlords who squabbled over the Empire's remaining military might like neck battle dogs tearing a carcass. Shadows haunted Dalla's eyes, memories of failure and a snuffed fire of revenge. But the green of her irises flashed molten when she thought of how simple it would be to strike effectively against the clumsy New Republic. Even now, the rebels still hadn't managed to secure their hold on the galaxy, though the Empire had given them years in which to accomplish it. The stormtroopers formed a tight and comforting honor guard around Dalla as she strode down the fused corridors into the bedrock. Supreme Warlord Harsk had established his stronghold on a rocky planet that orbited close to a red giant star. Its surface crust remained soft and cracked, seeping lava like an oozing wound. In orbit, giant solar smelters provided energy and processed raw material to construct Harsk's personal fleet of Imperial-class star destroyers. Upon arrival here, Dalla's loyal second-in-command, Kratos, had gone aboard the flagship Shockwave to inspect the weaponry. Harsk had completed construction on twelve of the star destroyers so far, using whatever resources he could scrape together by bullying all the systems within reach. Dalla thought of the unexploited military strength in the safe shadow of Harsk's planet, where ripping rays from the Red Giant could not damage the ship's systems. Back when she had been ordered to guard Maw installation, Dalla had commanded only four Imperial Star Destroyers, and in her private little war against the rebels, she had lost three of those ships. Yes, she could console herself that she had destroyed a rebel colony, blown up a convoy to a new military base, and attacked and damaged the water world of Calamari. But overall her tactics had been woefully outdated and ill-considered. She had allowed dark anger to blind her to the shortcomings of her own schemes. She had suffered from fiendishly bad luck as well, but she had no intention of allowing luck to become a factor again. Dalla had given up everything to limp back to the Empire, surviving in the battle-scarred wreck of her last star destroyer, the Gorgon. Reaching sanctuary, she had been unimpressed with the weak and childish warlords who now held the future of the Empire in their hands. Imperial authorities had commandeered Dalla's remaining troops, scattering them among other ships and other fleets. They had scrapped the Gorgon, taking away the few usable components to rebuild other ships. Dalla, though, did not give them the chance to reassign her to a fighting group, preferring instead to act as a freelance ambassador, 
a peacemaker visiting the far-flung warlords. Each of them had concocted increasingly ridiculous titles for themselves, trying to top their nearest competitor. From Grand Admiral to High Admiral to Supreme Commander to Omnipotent Battle Leader, Admiral Dalla had retained her own simple rank, requiring no further medals or titles. Her mission of unification remained incomplete, and she and Commander Kratos traveled from system to system, banking on their reputation and speaking to ears that seemed, unfortunately, to be filled with duracrete. Around her now, the air smelled warm and steamy with a sulfurous edge that leaked through the vitrified tunnels. Dalla's mane of reddish hair flowed behind her like a comet's tail. She had tried to trim it back to control it, but she disliked the severe look it gave her. Part of her needed to remain free, confined only by the limits of what she knew she could accomplish. Harsk's stormtroopers formed up and lined the corridor like a gauntlet for her to pass. Tall, sin-rock doors rose to the ceiling, etched with complex patterns that evoked an imperial grandeur. A stormtrooper struck his fist against a circular brass plate set into the rock, and sound enhancers piped the single knock through an echo chamber so that it boomed and reverberated like the summons of a powerful deity. Dalla tried to hide her expression of distaste. Elaborate formality and overblown demonstrations of supposed power did not bode well. Supreme Warlord Harsk seemed to consider himself very important, and in Dalla's experience... That meant he probably wasn't. The Sinrock doors ground open, and Dalla marched forward without waiting to be announced. Her black boots clicked on the fused stone floor. She saluted. I give you greeting, Supreme Warlord Harsk. In a large chamber, Supreme Warlord Harsk had installed banks of observation panels. He sat on a small floating chair that bobbed as he kicked himself away from the station over to another panel. Ah, Admiral Dalla, Harsk answered. The grin stretching across his face was hideous. The entire left half of his head was sizzled, leaving only bubbly pinkish skin, a mass of thick and insensitive scar tissue. His eye had been blinded, but Harsk had replaced it with a synthetic droid optical sensor that caused his eye socket to glow yellow. Harsk had been nearly killed in an explosion during the Battle of Endor. His Star Destroyer was crippled, but he managed to escape with part of the fleet to a rendezvous point in the core systems just after he had seen the Death Star explode. Harsk could have repaired his skin with existing medical techniques, but had chosen not to, keeping the hideous scars as a badge of honor, and, no doubt, Dalla thought, a means of intimidation. He shifted in his repulsor chair, and the seat bobbed with his motion. The hair on the unscarred half of his head was short and neat and black, and he seemed to show as much meticulous care for the intact side of his visage as he showed disdain for the scarred portion. "'Your reputation precedes you,' he said. "'I am honored to have such a great war hero among us, and pleased that you have at last come to me after wasting so much time with my weaker rivals.' Harsk gestured toward the screens on his wall. Dalla noted that he had holocams mounted on the hellish planetary surface, as well as remotes in orbit and more distant spy satellites on the fringes of the system. One image showed an ongoing fissure tearing a rock shelf apart as scarlet-orange lava spilled out of an incandescent waterfall. Harsk nodded to the central screen that showed his dozen Imperial Star Destroyers in shadow where the rocky planet eclipsed the red sun. I was just speaking with your commander, Kratos, Harsk said. He seems to be most impressed with my shockwave. He punched a button, and the scene shifted to show Kratos leaning over a station on the command bridge of a new Star Destroyer. His dark eyes glittered, and his heavy eyebrows were upraised. Admiral, Kratos said, snapping to attention. It feels good to be on the bridge again. This is a fine piece of military machinery. I have forgotten how sleek and maneuverable an Imperial Star Destroyer could be, after all the damage we suffered on the Gorgon. Dalla reminded herself to chide him for showing such glee. Kratos must learn to act more professional. But he had been through enormous ordeals at her side. Kratos had been a solid second in command, a foil for her ideas. 
though perhaps if he had been stronger in his resolve, more willing to show a little backbone, Cratus might have convinced her that her tactics against the rebels were unwise. "'I'm glad you are impressed, Commander,' Harsk said. "'You may continue your inspection. Admiral Dalla and I have some things to discuss.' Cratus began to snap a trim salute, but Warlord Harsk ended the transmission without even acknowledging him. He swiveled in his floating chair to face Dalla. She looked at him intently, staring at his one dark eye and one glowing optical sensor. She saw through his scars, paid no heed to his face or his droid eye, only to the mind that drove this collection of hardware that could be put to better use. Let us not draw out our discussions, he said. I know of your mission. You have spent the last year speaking to others, trying to sow the seeds of unification. I admire that. I, too, grow tired of this endless civil war. But again, your tactics are all wrong. Such techniques might have worked under the frail democracy of the old republic, but it is not the imperial way. When he stood, she saw that the warlord was substantially shorter than she. You are a hero, Admiral Dalla. Your word carries weight. That's the only reason you have been able to travel unharmed through the hostile territories and the core systems. But it's time you ended this game. You must throw in your lot with the most powerful warlord. Myself, obviously. With you as my second in command, I will have the power to bring those pretenders to their knees and forge them into a fighting force. We'll need to kill off the traitors, of course, but I suspect that many of their loyal soldiers would welcome the change in command. We're all frustrated, you know. Dalla bristled. I understand what you're saying, Supreme Warlord, and your fleet is indeed impressive. She gestured to the screen, which depicted the shadowed group of Imperial Star Destroyers. But I'm not convinced that you could so easily overwhelm your competitors. The moment you became stronger, the others would form alliances, and the struggle would be even bloodier than before. Rather, we must all focus the fleets on a common goal. Act independently if you wish, but meet and discuss overall strategy so that we select appropriate rebel targets and inject our venom where it will cause the most damage. She raised her gloved fist, glaring with ice-green eyes at Harsk. It serves no purpose for Imperials to be at each other's throats. Harsk chuckled, but the smile stretched across only the intact part of his face, while the scarred mask remained unmoved. I see now why your battles were a dismal failure, Admiral, he said. You are such a naive commander. No wonder Grand Moff Tarkin locked you away, where you could cause no harm while the rest of us continued the real fight for the Empire. Rage erupted like a volcano within Dalla, but before her words could break through the barrier of her clenched teeth, the view screens began blinking with alarms. One of the distant spy cams mounted high above the ecliptic had detected searing lights, trains of afterburners streaking through space so fast that the sensors could not focus. Harsk scuttled toward the screens and pressed his face close against one. The in-system holocams trained on the giant sun showed more trails arrowing in. The central screen switched, and Commander Kratos was there again. Admiral Dalla, uh, excuse me, Warlord Harsk, we've detected incoming ships moving fast. More of the out-system spy holocams triggered alarms, a dozen more ships coming from below the orbital plane this time. I've spotted seventy, Kratos said in disbelief. Harsk shouted, Sound all alarms! Battle klaxons ripped through the tunnels. When the images finally focused, Dalla caught her breath as she recognized the fleeting forms of seventy-three Victory-class Star Destroyers, smaller warships each about half the size of an Imperial Star Destroyer. But these ships were fast, agile, and bristling with weaponry. Their hulls were made of a crimson alloy, so that the Victory ships looked like bloody fangs clamping around Harsk's Star Destroyers. "'Is this a drill?' Dalla said. "'Are you trying to impress me?' "'No,' Harsk said, glaring at her so deeply that even the scarred portion of his face rippled with distaste. "'That's High Admiral Teradoc!' he shouted to the Star Destroyers. 
Lock on any target and fire. Running lights flashed on, powering up on the bone-white star destroyers eclipsed by Harsk's planet. Green turbo lasers shot out, skewering target locations, but the Victory class ships roared by too fast. Five of the Crimson ships erupted as they took severe hits, but even those losses were insignificant compared with the sheer number in the attacking fleet. Teradoc is trying to disgrace me, Harsk said. On screen, Dala could see Krata snapping to his duty as ranking officer on the bridge, instinctively issuing emergency orders. She was proud of how her second-in-command instantly took charge. She had trained him well. Concentrate all firepower, Kratos said. Select one target, destroy it, then move on to the next. Scattered fire won't accomplish anything. Kratos took Warlord Harsk's flagship to the point of a phalanx formation. The shock wave was larger than the other star destroyers, more heavily outfitted with high-energy weapons. The shock wave targeted and fired, obliterating a sixth victory ship. It aimed again, crippling a target, and the crimson vessel went dim and spun out of control. Then Dalla realized with horror that the shock wave itself was the primary target for the combined assault of a hundred Victory-class star destroyers. They converged like metal filings drawn to a magnet, firing and firing. He's trying to destroy my flagship, Harsk said, bawling his fists and standing next to his floating chair. He wants to humiliate me. I told you. Cease fire, Kratos ordered his bridge crew. Root all power to our shields. We've got to withstand this salvo. The Victory-class destroyers came on without pausing. The other star destroyers in Harsk's fleet shot at them, taking a minor toll, but the Crimson warships were suicidal, seeming not even to notice the loss of their comrades. The Victory-class ships formed a blanket of turbo-laser fire, stabbing again and again, pummeling the shields of the shockwave. We can't hold out much longer, Krata said, his voice harsh with strain. Shields failing. He turned to look out of the screen again. His dark eyes, wide with realization, seemed to be staring directly out at Dalla. Admiral, I... Then the screen turned to a fuzz of gray static. One of the spy cam images showed the shockwave cracking apart as geysers of molten white fire shot from breaches in the hull. The engine compartment spewed unleashed energy in all directions. The hull integrity could not hold. The Victory-class Star Destroyers kept firing until finally the shockwave was no more than a glowing cloud of debris and an agonizing memory for Admiral Dalla. Oh, Kratos, she whispered, I'm sorry. Achieving their target, the surviving victory ships, 62 of them according to the tally on the data screens, reversed course and streaked toward hyperspace, even as Warlord Harsk's remaining Imperial Star Destroyers took unsuccessful pot shots in their wake. Dalla stood, feeling cold outrage. Commander Kratos hadn't even been part of Harsk's fighting force. He had been a bystander in a childish squabble between feuding warlords. Dalla's lip curled as the rage built inside her, like pressurized steam rushing through her blood. We won't stand for this, Harsk growled. This time we'll get even, and I have the means to do so with you, Admiral Dalla, he said, looking up at her, his golden droid eye blazing. Dalla was startled from her grim reverie. What? Harsk continued breathlessly. We must smash that obese coward now with everything we have. I've been gathering my military might for a strike just such as this. Dalla fixed Harsk with a withering glare. I have no intention of assisting you in your childish brawl, Warlord Harsk. You just lost me, the best commander I ever had. I will not perpetuate this. Stormtroopers! Harsk shouted toward the door. Come here immediately. Weapons ready. The stormtrooper contingent marched into the large viewing room. Their white boots thundered on the glassy floor as they stood at attention. Cold black goggles and white plasteel helmets smothered all expressions. Take Admiral Dalla to one of my star destroyers, Harsk said. She will command our retaliatory strike against High Admiral Teradoc. He scowled at her. If she refuses, you will execute her immediately for treason. Dalla bristled. I won't allow you to order me around like that. 
I outrank you, and you have my orders, he screamed. Do you serve the Empire, or do you have your own agenda? The stormtroopers brought their blaster rifles to bear, pointing at her. They looked uneasy, but they followed their warlord's orders. Dalla could feel aiming mechanisms focusing on vulnerable points in her body. Very well, Harsk, she murmured, still stunned at the loss of Kratos and numb with her own unchanneled anger. She intentionally denied him the title of Supreme Warlord. Her green eyes narrowed to calculating slits. Give me full command of one of your Star Destroyers, and I will lead your fleet. Chapter 10 As the forces of Supreme Warlord Harsk reeled from the attack, Admiral Dalla found herself on the command bridge of the Imperial Star Destroyer Firestorm. She surveyed the carnage High Admiral Teradoc's forces had wrought, the smoldering wreckage of the flagship, the frozen bodies of all troops lost in the explosion. Three more of Harsk's Star Destroyers had also been sufficiently damaged as to require lengthy repairs. She would not be able to use them in her retaliatory strike. That left eight, twice as many battleships as Grand Moff Tarkin had given her to defend Maw installation. It would be enough. Dalla stood rigid on the bridge, staring out at the red giant star. Thick filters had been placed across the viewports so she could watch the blazing ocean of hot gas without blinking. The commotion of battle preparations continued around her unheeded. Inside her, a cauldron of frustration simmered. She did not want to fight Teradoc. She did not want to fight Harsk. She wanted them both, and all the other squabbling warlords, to fight the cursed rebels. Commander Kratos had died because of their bickering. They were a disgrace to the memory of the Empire. And if this was all the Imperial ideal could offer any more, then perhaps it was best they failed. But Dalla could not accept that. Tarkin had taught her never to give up. She clasped her hands at the small of her back, squeezing her black gloves so tightly that her bones hurt. There must be a better way, even if she had to force these others kicking and screaming to see it. Harsk's magnified image came to her over the comm system. He kept his half-scarred face turned squarely into the transmission range, flaunting both his ugly and his undamaged side. Admiral Dalla, I am aboard the Star Destroyer Whirlwind at your flank. You will take the point in our attack. I trust you have already developed a strategy. Warlord Harsk, Dalla said, looking into the blurred image of his face. I have just begun to study the data your spies gathered on Teradox Fortress. Give me a moment to assess the possibilities for attack. No, Harsk insisted. The High Admiral will never expect us to strike so swiftly. We lose our element of surprise with each second of delay. It'll be a full frontal attack with all weapons blazing. We'll knock him reeling. Dalla scowled. She took quick controlled breaths through flared nostrils. Warlord, I have studied my own failures and realized that many of them can be traced directly to ill-advised actions in the heat of anger. Nevertheless, Harsk said, you will follow my orders and launch an immediate attack. I don't have the time or the patience to deal with your cowardice or insubordination. If you continue to argue, I will strip you of your rank and place you in the brig. Dalla stiffened. She certainly wanted to be removed from the sham command, but she did not want to be imprisoned and tried for treason. Kratos was gone. Her former crew was gone. Her every connection had dwindled to insignificance. And she must start somewhere to rebuild her capabilities. This was a beginning, and Dalla decided to apply her imagination to discover some way to salvage the situation. Very well, Supreme Warlord, Dalla said, saluting him crisply. With full command authority of the Star Destroyer, I will do my best to strike a blow for the Empire. Good. Harsk rubbed his hands together. My personal Star Destroyer will remain off to the side, so as not to draw direct fire. We will confuse them by having you lead the charge. Don't let me down. I would never let the Empire down, Supreme Warlord, Dalla said. She gave orders to the navigator, and the firestorm edged to the front line of battleships. The three damaged star destroyers remained in eclipse, huddled in the shadow of Harsk's hot world. The eight remaining ships followed Dalla's hyperspace coordinates as she gave the orders to launch for the fortress of High Admiral Teradoc. 
a rocky swath of planetoids orbited in a disk around a lavender and white gas giant. The crumbling, ice-laden ring system looked beautiful from far away, reflecting distant gold sunlight. But Dalla saw it as a tactical challenge. The rubble created tens of thousands of possible targets, all places the High Admiral could have chosen to hide his fortress. Let's see if your spies provided good information, Dalla said into her comm system linked to Warlord Harsks on the whirlwind. It better be. We paid enough for it, Harsk said. A significant portion of my budget was devoted to bribing other Imperials to get that information. Dalla's expression did not change, though disgust welled up inside her. It should never have been possible to bribe Imperial soldiers. That kind of unprofessional behavior had brought the Empire to its knees. Corruption, dishonesty, and criminal lack of vision. Very well, Warlord, she said. We are heading directly into the ring systems on target. All turbo lasers are primed and ready. Like projectiles shot from a gun, the Star Destroyers plunged into the ring plane, swooping toward their target. Large ice shards and reflective rocks cruised around them. The fleet came on at full speed, hoping to pounce before Teradoc could muster his forces again. Dalla imagined that the High Admiral must now be celebrating, his commanders retired and relaxing, expecting no retaliation so soon. They would get a surprise, she thought with a smile, and so would Harsk. As Dalla led the attackers on their high-speed assault, two of the planetoids in the rings exploded, proximity charges rigged to detect the passage of incoming hostile ships. The flaming debris from the detonations sprayed in all directions, hailing upon Harsk's star destroyers, crippling one and destroying two others. Five left, Dalla saw. What a waste! They know we're here, Admiral, her tactical officer said. Harsk was shouting over the comm system, his voice reedy with excitement. Admiral Dalla, what happened? Why didn't you predict that? Dalla blanked the sound on the transmission, enjoying the warlord's livid face as he wordlessly continued to shout at her. We are locked onto Teradox Fortress right now, Admiral, the navigator said. On a screen in front of her, high-resolution diagrams of the ring system flashed up, one nondescript, medium-sized rock blinked to indicate the site of the High Admiral's stronghold. Victory-class Star Destroyers approaching, the weapons sergeant shouted. Dalla gripped the bridge rail, studying all components of the situation. She saw that dozens of the small planetoids were in fact garrisons, hollowed-out rocks that served as hangars for the Crimson Victory ships. The smaller warships emerged and began their pursuit, some newly refurbished, others still battle-scarred from the recent attack on Harsk's molten world. Do not engage them, Dalla said. The tactical officer sat up, his black eyes glittering and startled. Excuse me, Admiral. I said do not engage, she snapped. Those Victory-class ships are not our target. We have a much more important mission to accomplish, and we cannot afford to be drawn away by their amateurish attempts to distract us. Behind her, in the tattered remains of her phalanx of star destroyers, Harsk ignored her orders and commanded his gunners on the whirlwind to shoot at the pursuing victory ships. Two other battleships followed Harsk's lead, but Dalla snapped over the open ship communications. Cease fire! We need all of our energy for the main thrust. The image of Harsk continued to bellow in silence with the sound turned off. Dalla ignored him. She turned and looked at the bridge crew under her command. Tactical officer, I want personal command of the weapon systems. Admiral, the weapon sergeant said. Are you sure that's wise? Personal control, she repeated. I intend to fire the first blow myself. Then she feigned a soft smile, banking on her reputation. I've been working for this a long time. The weapon sergeant nodded briskly. Blazing spears of turbo-laser fire shot at them from Teradox Fortress. On the enhanced view, she could discern camouflaged weapons batteries, and she knew that the High Admiral himself was probably hiding deep in an armored bunker, safe from the battle, while his swarms of victory ships served as disposable perimeter defenses. Dalla moved to the weapons console, and the gunner surrendered his seat, looking at her in awe. She sat down and glanced at the controls, familiarizing herself in an instant. 
Dalla had spent the last year learning to become a part of the Empire's future rather than staying mixed in its past. I am siphoning off all power from the turbo laser batteries, she said, and concentrating our entire first strike on the ion cannon. The tactical officer coughed and looked at her nervously. But, Admiral, the ion cannon simply obliterates electrical and computer systems. Are you sure that will be sufficient to accomplish our objective? He squinted down at the readout of Teradox Rocky Fortress. It will be sufficient to achieve my goal, Dalla said. As the victory ships came in, dodging icy ring system debris, Dalla targeted the firestorm's ion cannon and placed her finger on the firing button. Admiral, the weapon sergeant cried, those coordinates are... She removed her sidearm and fired a stun blast at the sergeant. Glowing blue arcs engulfed him and he tumbled into a crumpled mass on the deck. Before the others on the bridge could react, Dalla fired the ion cannon. The firestorm's weapon belched out a disruptive blast that washed over the bridge tower of Warlord Harsk's Star Destroyer Whirlwind. Lightning bolts traced a thousand wicked fingers across the hull, shutting down his command systems, his computers, his weapons. The firestorm's bridge crew leaped to their feet in an uproar, and Dalla stood quickly. She raised her voice to shout down the objections. I am in command of this ship, and you will follow my orders. She leveled her blaster pistol and flicked its switch to the kill setting. Anyone who questions my orders will be executed on the spot for mutiny against the rightful commander of this vessel. Do you understand? She gave them only a second to look at her in cowed silence. Drop back. We will parallel the whirlwind. Harsk's ship is dead in space, so increase our shields to protect him in case any of Teradoc's ships come after us. As the others moved sluggishly to respond, loud thumps reverberated through the firestorm. Two of the three remaining Imperial Star Destroyers began firing on her ship. They are loyal to Warlord Harsk, the navigator said. They don't know what they're doing, Dalla responded. If any of you bore love for the Empire, you would have done this long ago. Our shields are on full, Admiral, one member of the bridge crew said, voice trembling. We have covered both ourselves and the whirlwind but the shields are diffuse. We cannot withstand a full-fledged attack if the Victory-class ships, or our own, decide to take us out. Open a channel, Dalla said. All bands. I want to make sure our Star Destroyers are listening as well as Teradox and Warlord Harsk himself. She stepped into the transmitting area and drew a deep breath of the processed air on the bridge. Good Imperial ships smelled sharp and clean and metallic. It reinforced Dalla's strength to follow her convictions. This is Admiral Dalla, she said, in command of the Imperial Star Destroyer Firestorm. I serve the Empire, I have always served the Empire, and I will never fire upon any other loyal Imperial. She swallowed grimly. I have made a preemptive strike on Warlord Harsk's Star Destroyer to prevent him from attacking another Imperial stronghold. Harsk's attack is in direct response to hostile action taken by High Admiral Teradoc. I condemn that action as well. I can no longer tolerate wasted effort and squandered resources that could be better applied to destroying rebel bases. Many of you may have heard of my attempts to destroy the Rebel Alliance when I had only four Star Destroyers, outdated information, and no support from the Empire. With a stuttering burst of static, Warlord Harsk's image broke in. Dalla was surprised, but momentarily pleased, that he had been able to get his comm system working again so quickly. Don't listen to her. She's a traitor and a renegade, Harsk said. I order the loyal crew on the Firestorm to take Dalla by force and execute her. Her crimes are obvious. Dalla continued to hold the blaster pistol, but she let it dip down as she swept her gaze at her bridge crew. Is my crime so obvious? she asked. My only aim is to stop this civil war so we can fight our true enemy. Do you honestly believe Warlord Harsk has the greater interests of the Empire in mind? Or is he merely interested in his personal power? I am not taking over. I do not want personal power or political leadership. All I ask is a military command. I will serve under any leader who will devote his forces to defeating the Rebel Alliance once and for all. 
Working the comm controls, Dalla broke through the jammed transmission and spoke to all ships again. She noticed that the Crimson Victory-class ships had swarmed around them, dozens strong, their weapons sufficient to obliterate Harsk's star destroyers, but they held their fire. Dalla went to the command station on the Firestorm's bridge, turning her back on the crew to demonstrate a measure of trust. She remained extremely tense, but refused to let it show. Out of the corner of her eye, she watched the navigator slowly rise from his seat and begin to withdraw his blaster sidearm. Dalla prepared to turn and shoot him without warning, but one of the operations chiefs placed a hand on the navigator's forearm, making him hold his fire. Dalla trembled with relief. She punched up the command systems for the firestorm, keying in her access code, glad that she had forced Harsk to give her full computer privileges before agreeing to run the attack on Teradoc's fortress. Harsk had suspected nothing, and now she had the final say on every decision. The firestorm's computer recognized only Admiral Dalla. She punched in a command she had dreaded even to consider on her own ship, verified it, then pressed the commit button. She spoke again into the transmission field. If this is what my empire has become, I no longer wish to serve it. I have just initiated the self-destruct countdown on the Star Destroyer Firestorm. The bridge uproar was more subdued this time, as if the crew were still stunned from her first mutinous action. The countdown is set. Warlord Harsk's ship is powerless and trapped within my deflector shields. Self-destruct will take place in fifteen standard minutes, unless Harsk issues an immediate command ordering all hostilities to cease. Seated in the cramped bridge station of the Victory-class Star Destroyer 13X, Vice Admiral Pelion studied this unexpected new development, both pleased and perplexed. His cap fit snugly against his gray hair. He tugged at his long, pale mustache, as he sifted through the implications of the broadband message. If the enemy had continued its headlong surprise attack, the fleet of Imperial Star Destroyers would certainly have caused severe damage to High Admiral Teradoc's fortress. Pelion's victory swarm could have mopped up the remaining ships, but only at great cost to themselves. Now, though, the leader of this sudden and unexpected retaliation had turned upon one of her own ships. Not surprisingly, Warlord Harsk had not led the charge, cowering instead in one of the rear Star Destroyers. But this Admiral Dalla... Pelion leaned back in his padded seat. He had heard of her two years after the defeat of Grand Admiral Thrawn had left Pelion in personal disgrace. Dalla had come out of nowhere and begun a single-handed attack against the rebels. With such a small fleet, she had no hope of ultimate victory but Dalla had seemed interested only in causing significant damage now, with no overall strategy, just a desire for destruction. Pelion had admired her efforts to take action. The other Imperial commanders seemed to prefer internal arguments. He looked about him on the small control deck of a Victory-class ship, the smallest craft he had commanded in a long time. He did believe in High Admiral Teradoc's plan of building up a huge fleet of smaller, more versatile ships, but still he missed the grandeur of commanding the Chimera. As he brought his fleet closer, weapons ready but not firing, Pelion hovered over the stalled Imperial Star Destroyers and looked down at Admiral Dalla's ship at how she had incapacitated Warlord Harsk's whirlwind. Her turnabout had been an interesting, desperate, and inexplicable tactic but Pelion admired its purity of purpose. Dalla was someone who, like Thrawn, was able to focus on an objective and devote resources and tactics to that end. High Admiral Teradoc and Warlord Harsk both seemed little more than ill-behaved children bullying each other about. He heard Dalla's impassioned speech, begging for a unified front against the true enemy. Several crew members on Pelion's own ship softly murmured in agreement. He kept his own feelings to himself, though he agreed as well. As he looked at Dalla's image, he wondered what kind of artwork she might like. Vice Admiral Pelion, his navigator said, perhaps we should back off if her self-destruct threat is genuine. If both of those star destroyers blow, we'll be caught in the shockwave and severely damaged, if not destroyed. 
Pelion sat rigidly for a moment, then stiffly shook his head. No, we'll stay right here. Open a channel. His bridge crew looked at him in amazement. A channel to the firestorm, sir? The comm officer said. No, open band. I want all ships to hear this. The comm officer blinked, then nodded and carried out Pelion's order. He rose slowly from his padded black chair. This is Vice Admiral Pelion, commander of High Admiral Teradox Fleet, issuing a specific order to my own ships to maintain position. Several crimson ships had begun to edge away from their confining net. Harsk's star destroyers had already backed away, gaining distance. As a gesture of good faith and out of respect for Admiral Dalla's request, I hereby order an immediate cessation of hostilities on our part. Almost immediately a red light flashed on the 13X's comm panel. The officer turned to Pelion. I have an urgent message from High Admiral Teradox, sir. The comm officer raised his eyebrows, clearly intimidated and awaiting orders. I'll speak to him here on the bridge, Pelion said. He squared his shoulders. You may all listen. Teradox's image came through, red-faced and puffing. The man's girth had increased threefold in the last year or so. Pelion, what do you think you're doing? he shouted. I order you to press your advantage. Use this opportunity to strike Harsk's star destroyers while they are weakened. Now we can obliterate him completely. Pelion frowned, thinking of fat Teradox squatting in his bunker behind dozens of meters of the highest quality shielding, absolutely safe from harm while the battle raged outside. Pelion did not think a true war commander would keep himself so isolated. I respectfully disagree, High Admiral. Warlord Harsk is not my enemy. He is not the enemy of the Empire. I think we should confer with this Admiral Dalla and hear what she has to say. Teradox's face turned from red to purple. I don't care what you think. If you do not fire upon Harsk, you're a traitor. Have you forgotten your training? Your entire life speaks of service to the Empire, of following the orders of your superior officers. You are excrement if you will not obey your rightful commander. What would Grand Admiral Thrawn think of you? Pelion frowned even more deeply as he faced the image of the fat warlord. Teradoc was correct from a certain point of view. Pelion had spent many decades of his life in service to the Imperial Navy. He had commanded star destroyers. After the Battle of Endor, he had taken over the Chimera when its own commander had been killed in the hostilities. He had spent the following years trying to regain the status of the Empire through a succession of weak rulers, debilitating surrenders, and losses of territory. Pelion had watched his once magnificent empire dwindle to a mere island in what had been considered the backwater territories and formerly uninhabitable systems near the core of the galaxy. It wasn't until Grand Admiral Thrawn had come back from the unknown territories that Pelion had finally found a true leader he could follow with a genuine chance of recapturing lost glory. When Thrawn had fallen, Pelion had lost his hope again, merely serving any Imperial commander he happened to find and marching in place. Now, though, Admiral Dalla's conviction and enthusiasm, and her willingness to risk all for the appropriate cause, made something stir within him again something powerful. Pelion took a deep breath and spoke to the bloated image of Teradoc. I believe I know what he would think of me, he said bitterly, and you, sir, are no Grand Admiral Thrawn. He switched off the comm, then turned to his crew. Prepare a shuttle and inform Admiral Dalla that I am coming aboard. Time is short, and I wish to confer with her in person. Yavin 4, Chapter 11 As R2-D2 trundled along in front of him, Luke Skywalker hurried out of the great temple to see the new visitor. Wind currents had torn the clouds to tatters in the sky above, and he blinked in the hazy sunlight of the jungle afternoon. Most of the Jedi trainees were working inside their cool chambers or wandering out in the forest depths. 
Callista sat alone studying the histories that Tion compiled for her, although over the past several days she had found nothing that would help her regain her powers. Now Luke saw a slender woman descend from a custom-designed craft that bore the cross-hatched insignia of the Smugglers' Alliance. Mara Jade, he called, what did I do to deserve the honor of your presence? Mara flashed a fast, sharp-edged smile at him. You don't deserve it, Skywalker, she said, but I came anyway. He strode forward and clasped her hand. She withdrew quickly, glancing at the close-cropped weeds and the landing grid, and then staring up at the dizzying height of the ancient Masasi pyramid. Want to come inside? he asked. No, let's go for a ride in my ship, she answered. I need to talk to you about something. Luke nodded slowly. I thought you might. You don't usually come here just because you're bored. Mara shook her head, and her mane of auburn hair thrashed about like waves of exotic spice. I'm never bored, Skywalker. She gestured to the cockpit of her ship, where the passenger seat sat empty. It's my outlook on life. Our two whistled and warbled, rocking back and forth on his foot pads. You stay here, R2, Luke said. If anybody asks, tell them where I've gone. We'll be back, he glanced sidelong at Mara, before too long. As he slid into the empty seat, finding the armrests and the protective restraints, Mara punched a button on the cockpit controls. The flip-up side door slammed down and hissed into an airtight seal. Before Luke could buckle his crash webbing, she hit the accelerators. With a blast of repulsor lifts, her sleek ship rose into the air and shot off above the treetops. Luke thought he heard the scraping of witches' fingernails as the bottom hull brushed gently against the upreaching crowns of the trees. Mara grinned as she increased speed, climbing higher. Acceleration pushed Luke back against the seat, and he decided he could either be concerned or he could kick back and enjoy himself. He thought of his younger days, taking a T-16 skyhopper screaming through Beggar's Canyon on Tatooine, avoiding obstacles, performing daredevil stunts. Right now Mara Jade was just showing off, and he decided to let her blow off steam. She probably wanted to rattle him, but it wouldn't work. Below, the dense greenery looked like clouds of foliage. Mara stormed along, her eyes fixed on her piloting. The Masasi temple dropped away in the distance, but Luke wasn't worried. Though Mara had repeatedly tried to kill him in the past, he now trusted her implicitly. Luke smiled to himself at the irony of their situation. So, he said, what is it you wanted to talk about? Got some information for you, she answered, flicking a glance toward him, then looking away just as quickly. In my work with the Smugglers' Alliance, I keep my eyes and ears open. Sometimes I hear things the New Republic should know about. Luke raised his eyebrows. Such as? Mara pretended to frown. You expect me to give you important information like that for free? Luke stared at her in silence for a full second, then smiled. Yes, he said. Yes, I do. Mara laughed. That doesn't surprise me a bit from you, Skywalker, she said. All right. You know the Smugglers' Alliance was specifically set up to provide a strong front against some of the more powerful crime organizations, especially the Huts. Yes, Luke agreed, suspecting where this might lead. We keep tabs on the Huts' comings and goings, since they're our enemies, or perhaps I should say competitors. Recently they clamped down on our usual information sources. They've been building up what appears to be a respectable front, several commercial corporations, the most prominent of which is Orco Skymine, a mineral resource development consortium. Shouldn't we be happy that the Huts are trying to be respectable, as Lando Calrissian would have put it? We'd be happy if we could believe them, Mara said, then concentrated on flying again as a thermal updraft buffeted them. The wind rattled the transparasteel windows of her craft, and she banked to the left around a volcanic rock outcrop. She increased altitude. But you know as well as I do that you can never really believe what the huts say. She looked at Luke again. I think they're up to something, something big. Luke kept his expression bland. Even though I'm just a Jedi teacher, 
I have a few sources of information of my own, and I'm inclined to believe your suspicions are right, Mara Jade. She blinked in surprise. Ah, so my coming here was unnecessary? Luke shook his head. Your coming to Yavin 4 is never unnecessary. What did you want me to do with this information? I thought you might take it to your sister and Karuskant. As the chief of state, she can probably think of something to head off trouble. Luke tapped his fingers together, consciously relaxing in the face of Mara's breakneck piloting. You could have just gone there yourself. Isn't Yavin 4 a bit out of your way just to deliver a message? Mara took a deep breath. I wanted to do this quietly. Since I'm with the Smugglers' Alliance, I need to keep things low-key. My involvement shouldn't be too obvious. Talon Card taught me that. I see, Luke said. How is Card? Still retired? Ha, she said. More than a few months of relaxation was enough to bring him to the brink of insanity and boredom. He's back at it and busier than ever, with his hands in more schemes than I can keep track of. She pulled her nimble craft hard to starboard in a tight loop and shot over the treetops back toward the great temple. The other reason I came in person, Mara continued with some uneasiness, is that occasionally, for some unknown reason, I almost look forward to seeing you, Skywalker. Not often, but there are times. And this is one of them? Luke asked. It was, she said. I'd better be on my way before it wears off. Luke laughed. Why don't you stay for a few more hours at least? We'll be gathering the trainees in the mess hall for an evening meal. You need something better than stale ration bars. Mara acquiesced far more easily than Luke had expected. All right, she said. Just a quick meal, then I'm out of here. Callista sat alone, picking at her meal next to the empty spot where Luke normally ate, but he had gone off to set up quarters for two new potential Jedi who had arrived on a new Republic transport. With mixed feelings of detachment and frustration, Callista stared at the other Jedi trainees in the narrow stone hall, the weakest of whom had powers greater than she could command, at the moment. It was painful to watch them grow in strength as they played with their Force abilities. She was denied that, though she tried and tried. She was blind and deaf to the Force. Hey, mind if I sit here? Mara Jade said, wearing her trim flight uniform and holding a tray of stew mixed with greens. Callista barely nodded, and Mara plopped into the chair, setting her tray on the polished table. She picked up a thick bread wafer and poked around in her stew. Better than packaged rations, I suppose, but I can tell you don't have a gourmet droid working here. Mara's bright eyes flashed. So you're Skywalker's new lady? she asked. Callista wished she could read the emotions behind Mara Jade's visage. The other woman was good at masking her expressions, and Callista didn't know what to make of their conversation. Though their bodies were similar in age, Callista had been born decades before Mara Jade. Her own powers were gone now, but she had been a Jedi Knight whose abilities surpassed anything that Mara could manage. She had heard of past connections between Mara Jade and Luke, and she decided it would be best if she took the initiative. Yes, I am, she answered, and you must be Mara Jade. I've heard about you. When Mara nodded briskly, Callista raised her eyebrows. I also heard hints that you might have been interested in Luke yourself at one time. Mara frowned again in distaste at her stew, but took a large mouthful. She swallowed, took a drink, and finally let loose a short laugh. Who told you I was ever interested in Luke Skywalker? When I first met him, the thing I wanted most in the universe was to kill him. I thought that way for a long time. She shrugged. Sometimes it still seems like a good idea to me. Mara took another bite and chewed slowly. Not a great basis for a long-term relationship, you think? Callista shook her head. No, I suppose not. Even without her Jedi powers, Callista wasn't sure she believed Mara's answer. Aren't you with Lando Calrissian? I heard something about you two being a hot item. Calrissian? 
You've got to be kidding. Mara actually blushed and turned away to take another drink before she could cough on her quickly swallowed mouthful. We're still good business partners in a very profitable operation at the spice mines of Kessel right now, but I think Calrissian was more interested in chasing me than in winning me, which is fine as far as I'm concerned. Mara wiped the corners of her mouth. Well, good to meet you. She stood up, smoothing out the wrinkles in her flight suit. Give Skywalker my regards. I've got to be heading out. Just stopped by to drop off a message. Mara left without so much as a nod of acknowledgement to the other Jedi trainees, while Callista wondered about her mysterious message. Coruscant, Chapter 12 Leaving the Jedi Praxium behind, Luke took Callista with him to Coruscant, where Luke had set up a private audience with his sister. He quickly met with Leia and delivered the information Mara Jade had brought. Added to what they had already learned at the ruins of Jabba's palace, the rumors of a hot secret plan grew more threatening. Leia had already reinforced her network of spies, hoping to gather more hints and details. In the ornate presidential briefing chambers, Callista sat next to Luke, her fingers resting lightly on his forearm, but he could not feel the binding of her presence around him. It was as if she did not exist in the Force. Luke looked into his sister's large brown eyes, mapping out the faint, tired lines that had begun to form around them. The weight of leadership pressed down heavily upon her. The New Republic was large and scattered, beset by hundreds of problems, brush-fire squabbles, and growing threats. And Leia had three children to contend with, as well as a husband. Leia, Luke said, I have a request, an important favor to ask. She sat up straighter, looking at Callista, and then at her brother. The last time you asked for a favor was to let Kip Duran destroy the Sun Crusher. She bit her lower lip. But I suppose that came out all right. Luke relaxed. Nothing so monumental this time, he said. Callista and I have a lot of things to work out between ourselves. We need some time alone so we can devote our attention to reawakening her Jedi powers. She could be one of our strongest Jedi if she regains her affinity for the Force. She could teach me a lot. I think the only way we can crack the wall around her is if Callista and I work together, intensely. He grasped her hand. We need a week or so alone to focus on salvaging her powers, not a thousand other problems. No distractions. Leia smiled wistfully. I know exactly how you feel. Then she became serious. I can't order you around, Luke. There's no need for you to ask my permission. Leia looked at Callista, and Luke could see that her face held a whirlpool of conflicting emotions. The need to see her brother happy, the desire for Callista to be his equal again, and her own need to keep Luke focused on training new Jedi Knights to strengthen and protect the New Republic. But Leia loved her brother very much, and her choice was clear. Take all the time you need. I wish you the greatest success. She looked up. Or should I say, may the Force be with you. Later, still holding hands, Luke and Callista went to the Upper West Side docking platform of the former Imperial Palace. The air was thin so high above ground level, and the gusting breezes were cold and cutting. He squeezed Callista's hand, and her grip returned his twice as strong. Though Luke couldn't read anything from her with his Jedi senses, he saw her obvious eagerness mixed with reluctance. Callista shared his high hopes for their journey alone, but she was also afraid they would fail. Leia, her robes of state whipping briskly around her, held the hands of the twins, Jason and Jaina, as she came to see Luke off, while Han carried young Anakin propped against his hip. The dark-haired boy blinked his ice-blue eyes, drinking in the sights. 3PO and R2 came along at their own pace, though the hairy Wookiee urged them to greater speed. Do be patient, Chewbacca, 3PO said. I can only move so fast. If you had replaced my leg servo motors last week, as I suggested, I'd be able to move much more efficiently. The Wookiee groaned something untranslatable back at the golden droid. Callista stood by Luke's side at the boarding ramp to a nondescript space yacht. Luke saw her in profile, 
her long face and generous lips, her highlighted blonde hair that had been cropped short and was still growing out from her stormtrooper cut on the eye of Palpatine. Han had once called her the blonde with the legs, and Luke couldn't argue with that description. Callista was so beautiful to him, but that wasn't all. Many women were beautiful. With the Force, he had seen Callista inside. He knew her in a way it was impossible to know most women. They had fallen in love before they had even seen each other face to face, back when Callista had been no more than a wandering presence. Now she inhabited another body, a beautiful body to be sure, but Luke would have loved her no matter what. They had treasured one another in Luke's dreams before Callista had manifested herself in the body of one of his former students. Now as they stood in front of the space yacht, Luke watched Callista staring wistfully at Han and Leia's children. Her lips were firm, and her eyes remained wide and clear, but he knew exactly what she was thinking. The children. Luke and Callista had spoken of having children of their own if they were to get married. Callista insisted that Luke, being the foremost Jedi master of the day, must have powerful children to make the strong Jedi bloodline flourish. If one were to look at romance in such a cold and imperial fashion. She was terrified that if they had children while she had no access to her powers, their descendants might suffer the same force blindness. But Luke didn't care. He wanted Callista, though she would not listen when he tried to reassure her. Their only chance lay in severing the invisible chains around her, breaking through the maddening transparent wall. Leia came forward to hug Luke. High above the skyline, the wind picked up and breezes stung his blue eyes, whipping his hair in all directions. He bent down to scoop up the kids in a warm hug. Now do I get to hug Callista? Han said, and came forward to give her a brief embrace as Leia laughed. Chewbacca blatted something, and Han waved him aside. Nah, Chewie, you can hug 3PO if you want. Well, the very idea, 3PO said. Luke set foot on the boarding platform with Callista at his side. R2 whistled mournfully, blinking his optical receptor from red to blue. Don't worry, R2, Luke said. You enjoy your time with 3PO. We need to be by ourselves for a bit. When R2 gave a low hoot, C-3PO placed a golden hand on the dome of the astromech droid in indignation. Humph! I'm sure I see no need for a starry-eyed couple to turn down the companionship of a faithful droid. I can't imagine why they need to be completely alone. He patted his counterpart. Come along, R2. We'll find something useful to do. As the droids hurried toward the turbolift, Luke and Callista waved farewell again and prepared for launch. C-3PO and R2-D2 passed through nine security checkpoints as the turbolift descended deep into Coruscant's crust. We're obviously droids, 3PO muttered. I simply don't understand why they need to put us through such indignities to get down here. Virus scanning indeed. Finally, the doors hissed open, and they stepped into the sterile chambers of pulsating mainframe computers in the Imperial Information Center. Remember when you and I were here, R2, trying to find Jedi candidates for Master Luke? R2 bleeped that, of course, he remembered. This time it's nothing terribly exciting, I'm afraid, but in the process of studying backup files for Mistress Leia, I discovered some troubling computer glitches that I'm at a loss to account for. I cannot find any trace of them before the day that horrid Durga the Hutt came to visit and all chaos broke loose. At first I was concerned that our mitigation efforts might have caused some deep core damage, but standard diagnostics yielded nothing. I have been reticent to point this out to Mistress Leia because I'm sure she's still upset about that entire debacle. Our two trundled across the polished floor. The assassin droids trained their implanted blasters on the two newcomers, targeting systems tracking the large motions. A battery of observation cams studied them with cold objectivity from near the juncture of wall and ceiling. This place gives me the chills. Rather, it would give me the chills if I had the physical capability to have them, 3PO said. As it is, my circuits are merely uneasy. But if you could do anything to assist me, R2? The astromech droid was already accessing a terminal, requesting further details. 
R2's input jack locked into the main drive and spun around. 3PO paced about in stiff discomfort. The assassin droids stared at them. The slicer droids paid no attention whatsoever. Would you like me to tell you a story to pass the time, R2? 3PO said. R2 blatted an emphatic no. Well, really. 3PO bent over one of the keypads and detected something most surprising. He reached down with his gold-plated fingertips and held up a small tuft of grayish fur. Oh, dear, I wonder how this got here, he said. This room is supposed to be kept meticulously clean. He examined the floor and inspected the wall. His optical sensors were drawn to a small ventilation intake for the huge intake fans that circulated supercooled air to the deep levels of the information center. The cover plate stood ajar, but it was far too small for any intelligent creature to have come through. Could the Imperial Information Center be inhabited by some sort of large rodent? R2 shrilled in alarm, and 3PO strutted over to a screen where the astromech droid had begun replaying archival video records from the security monitoring cameras. 3PO saw from the date on the images that the footage had been taken while Durga's entourage met with the Chief of State in the reception halls far above. Because no security breach had been recorded down here in the Imperial Information Center, though, no one had bothered to do more than a cursory scan on them. R2 manipulated the images, enhancing and enlarging them, massaging out shadows by playing virtual light into the images. Why, I recognize those, 3PO said. Just at the edge of the frame, motion gave away three of the furry, multi-armed torrils scampering out of the ventilation ducts and up to the unmanned computer consoles. Whatever are they doing? 3PO said. How could they possibly have gotten down here? We routed them all up, didn't we? R2 chittered, then froze another image that showed the torrils deliberately punching commands into a keypad. This is most suspicious, 3PO said. The droids watched as the three Toril completed their command strings and copied a file into a data cylinder, which they secreted in their own fur. Then they dashed back to the ventilation shafts. It would appear that they've copied something from our records. What could they possibly want? 3PO said. At R2's warbled reply, he added, Of course I'd like you to find out. Why else would I have brought you along, you silly whistling trash can? R2 replayed the images slowly, noting the Toril command strings, then input them himself. The passworded files scrolled onto the screen, immediately recognizable. In fact, R2 had once carried the complex blueprints inside himself. 3PO wailed, We must warn Mistress Leia immediately. He ran toward the turbolift doors, shrilling an alarm. R2 rolled after him. The assassin droids snapped to attention and trained their weapons on them. Summon Chief of State Organa Solo, 3PO said. This is an emergency. The fate of the entire galaxy is at stake. The assassin droids were not impressed, and 3PO increased the volume in his vocal circuits. Don't you understand? The plans to the Death Star have been stolen. Hoth Asteroid Belt Chapter 13 when Durga the Hutt returned to the asteroid belt in triumph, Bevel Lemelisk was summoned to the bottommost deck of the Orko Skymine ship, where Durga sat in the observation blister to stare out at the stars. Lemelisk entered the chamber accompanied by two Gamorian guards, who shoved him into Durga's presence with a grunt, then stomped off to other duties. Durga lay on inflated cushions. A music synthesizer warbled odd, discordant notes in a grating yet hypnotic background melody. Pink and blue smoke wafted like jagged fingers back and forth as the air exchangers alternated on either side of the room. The smoke had an acrid incense smell, a mild narcotic that affected huts but did nothing more than burn Lemelisk's human nostrils. Durga's deep laugh boomed out. Lemelisk, you're here! From another chair, General Sulamar stood and straightened his uniform, brushing his knuckles across the jingling placards of medals on his chest. We've been waiting for you, Lemelisk, he said. Durga turned to glare at the Imperial. 
You wait on my pleasure, General, the hut said. We will start when I wish to start. Yes, Lord Durga, Sulamar said, bowing quickly and stepping back. His face became the color of soggy white cheese, and he glared at Lemelisk as if the engineer had done something wrong. Lemelisk focused his attention on Durga, who was the most important enemy ally at the moment. Tell me, Lord Durga, did you get the Death Star plans? Lemelisk felt his heart rise to his throat, and he unconsciously rubbed at the rough stubble on his cheeks and chin, scratched the shocks of white hair on his head. He had worked hard on those plans, spending so much of his life first laboring with Kwai Zook's inside maw installation to develop the concept and the prototype, then spending months with the resources of the Empire to build the first enormous battle station. Durga's enormous mouth bent upward like twisted rubber. With a small hand, he inserted a data cylinder into a player nestled among the cushions at his side. The projector glowed, sending beams through the pink and blue smoke. A wireframe diagram of Lemelisk's first-order blueprints appeared, rotating a three-dimensional sphere that showed layers within layers of deck plans, computer centers, defensive installations, energy storage areas, and the planet-destroying superlaser that ran through its axis. General Sulamar rubbed his hands together, his face young and boyish again. His grin made him look like a narrow-faced rodent. Excellent, Sulamar said. Work must begin at once. Durga scowled at him. General Sulamar, I am in charge of this project. Of course, Lord Durga, Sulamar said, but his eyes remained fixed hungrily on the Death Star plans. Bevel Lemelisk decided to use the awed moment to his advantage. Lord Durga, if I might ask a question, exactly what is the Imperial General's purpose here among us? Sulamar straightened his shoulders like a spined puffer bird and turned to Durga. I bring Imperial prestige to your project. I will use my connections to obtain some of the items you need, the security codes you must possess. And when you begin your hot reign of terror across the galaxy, he grinned, think of how much more effective you will be if you're accompanied by the famed and feared General Sulamar, the scourge of Seldaru the man who successfully carried out the massacre of Mendicate without losing a single stormtrooper. I held a hundred worlds in my fist, and I squeezed. The entire galaxy learned to tremble at my name. Lemelisk shrugged. He didn't want to press the issue, but he had never heard of Sulamar before. Of course, he had been isolated in Maw installation for a long time. He looked again at the glowing outline of the Death Star. Though he saw only the outer layer of the projection, he knew the depth and intricacies of those plans. His heart pounded, and excitement brought a flush to his skin again. At last, a new project that he could sink his teeth into. He smiled and marveled at the design, remembering the first time he had showed it off. Magnificent, the Emperor had said, cowled in his black hood as he stared at the Death Star plans that Grand Moff Tarkin and Bevel Lemelisk presented to him. Yes, a technological terror, Tarkin said. Lean and cruel-looking, Tarkin stood at attention beside his Emperor, nodding down at the image. Lemelisk and his naive but brilliant co-worker, Kwaizux, had designed a battle station that placed fearsome power in a single commander's hands. Tarkin had been delighted with the concept and the plans and the prototype, and so he had brought Lemelisk out of Maw installation to present the idea to the Emperor personally. Explain it to me, the Emperor said, extending his hands into the glowing simulation. The lines bent and buckled, curling around Palpatine's clawed fingers. Lemelisk had never seen a hologram react that way before, as if the image itself were trying to cringe from the Emperor's touch. Lemelisk rubbed the perspiration from his palms onto his shirt as he spoke quickly, nervous in Palpatine's presence, but even more excited to talk about his brainchild. This battle station will be the size of a small moon a hundred kilometers in diameter, he said housing a single weapon of mass destruction. It will tax our construction skills to the limit, but I will be the chief engineer, and I'm certain I can complete the task personally. 
The Emperor's reptilian eyes bored into him. Lemelisk turned back to the projected plans and brushed his hands over the surface layers. The Death Star will have planetary shielding, surface-to-air turbo lasers, 360-degree sensor capability, powerful multi-directional tractor beams, and heavy ion cannons. Impressive, the Emperor said in a frigid voice. But only if our enemies fall right in our laps. How is this thing supposed to move? Ah, Lemelisk held up a finger and pointed along the equator. The Death Star is equipped with enormous engines for propulsion in normal space as well as hyperspace. This station can go anywhere we wish. His eyes lit up, and he lowered his voice to a childlike whisper. The superlaser is powerful enough to crack entire worlds. One blast can turn a planet into a cloud of rubble. Grand Moff Tarkin bowed and cleared his throat. The Death Star will be a self-contained garrison whose only purpose is to enforce your new order. It is exactly the doomsday weapon you asked me to create, my Emperor. It will be crewed by close to a million officers, support personnel, and stormtroopers. It may be enormously expensive to build, Tarkin continued, but this single Death Star alone will be worth a thousand Star Destroyers. The mere threat of this battle station will make any populace quiver in terror, for they can have no defenses against it. None. The Emperor leaned forward to stare at the plans again. Bevel Lemelisk had never actually seen someone gloat before, but Emperor Palpatine did. And so did Durga the Hutt and General Sulamar. Sulamar held a personal data slate and punched up a summary, which he studied intently. Lord Durga, he said, I'm pleased to announce that the second pair of automated mineral exploiters, models Gamma and Delta, are now functional and reprogrammed. He shot a wicked glare at Bevel Lemelisk to remove the fatal flaws suffered by the original pair. The processors have begun exploiting the asteroid field and are smelting materials at this moment. Durgan nodded his large head, blinking frog-like eyes. Around him, small windows mounted at regular intervals around the observation blister showed streaming lights from chunks in the asteroid field as they wandered about their pell-mell courses, flashing as they rotated irregular surfaces, reflecting Hoth's distant sunlight. We can afford no further delays, Durga said, jabbing a stubby finger at Bevel Lemelisk. He yanked the data cylinder from the reader, and the glowing plans faded into the curling narcotic smoke. You, Lemelisk, get to redesign your work, and take care that you don't make foolish mistakes, as you did with the mineral exploiters. The hut chuckled with a chilling deadly mirth. I'd hate to have to execute you if you disappoint me. Lemelisk shuddered out of all proportion to the threat. He took the data cylinder from the hut's slimy hand and held the files close to his chest. Yes, Lord Durga. He bowed and scuttled backward out of Durga's private chambers. He rushed to his own quarters, already grinning, eager to begin work. Chapter 14 Bevel Lemelisk demanded absolute silence as he worked. He had sealed his quarters, hoping the Gamorrean guards wouldn't bumble in or pound on his door without realizing they had the wrong cabin number. He settled into a wobbly metal seat. He had knocked it over in anger when he had been unable to complete his three-dimensional crystal puzzle. Getting the right solution meant a great deal to Bevel Lemelisk, and he disliked failure immensely, though it was much better to fail in private than when other people were watching. Realizing that he hadn't eaten in nearly a day, Lemelisk had fixed himself a fast high-protein meal and set the steaming plate of bright orange gruel beside him at the workbench. He didn't particularly like the stuff, but eating was little more than the necessary refueling of his metal machine. As he inserted the data cylinder into his terminal and began to work, though, he forgot about the meal entirely. The image shimmered in front of him, a giant spherical battle station, detailed deck after deck, component after component. Only Lemelisk knew its true complexity. He began to strip away the outer layers of the hollow blueprint, 
removing extraneous levels, streamlining the construction, and tailoring it to the hut's needs. By eliminating the unnecessary imperial padding, the superstructures, the personnel quarters, Lemelisk could create a weapon with far more energy devoted to sheer destruction. The outline diagram of the main superlaser core glowed in front of him with bright lines indicating main support girders. The purity of his superlaser design unmasked by the external shell. That was much better. He squinted and leaned close to the projection, remembering how excited he had been to see the original construction actually taking place. Grand Moff Tarkin had arrived at the Death Star construction site in a nondescript Lambda-class cargo shuttle. He and Lemelisk sat in the passenger seats and discussed important matters as Tarkin's alien slave, a Calamarian named Akbar, piloted them toward the huge mass of girders and construction machinery larger than any space station ever conceived. Lemelisk couldn't understand why Tarkin spent so much time with the salmon-colored alien whose fishy smell and large round eyes made Lemelisk queasy. Tarkin had crushed the world of the Moan Calamari and forced the strange creatures to serve his will. Now he made Akbar his personal aid as another means of whipping him, tormenting him with the duties he resented so much. Completely broken, Akbar meekly followed Tarkin's every order. He guided the Lambda-class shuttle with wooden talent, chauffeuring them with as little enthusiasm as possible. Lemelisk noted that, though the alien reacted little, Akbar seemed to hang on every word Tarkin said, as if storing information for whatever possible use a slave might make of it. The Death Star construction hung in orbit around the penal world of despair in the Horus system. The Outer Rim territories were Tarkin's personal stomping grounds, and he stomped as often and as hard as possible. The world below was a deep green, fissured with blue and brown rivers and shallow seas. Despair looked far too calm to be a hellish prison planet, but Lemelisk knew the prehistoric jungles there writhed with vicious insects and predators, poisonous plants, and carnivorous crustaceans. The convicts huddled within the walls of their fortresses, hoping never to be exiled to the wilds. The penal colony provided a ready pool of willing labor to build the Death Star. The volunteer lists carried five times as many names as the site could possibly support, and thus the workers in the space facility were expendable. But unfortunately, they were also uneducated and surly, completely untrained for the type of sophisticated labor the project required. Lemelisk directed the routine operations from his comfortable remote station. As chief engineer, he watched the progress reports to make sure all the components fit together properly. He didn't like to venture out into the hazardous construction area, however. He wasn't a hands-on manager. Now, though, as Akbar piloted the Lambda shuttle directly into the forest of girders, Lemelisk looked around, seeing bright flashes of laser welders and the glowing ends of newly smelted durasteel plates that emerged from processing plants. Curls of black smoke and the glow of waste heat spread into open space. Steam glittered in a shower of diamond ice crystals. When the Death Star was complete, the world of despair would be shrouded in an upper orbital blanket of industrial debris as a side effect of the work. Unfortunately for the convicts, the debris would make passage to the penal colony virtually impossible. Despair would then be off limits, and the prisoners would have to fend for themselves until supplies ran out and the ferocious jungles came in. You're making good progress, Tarkin said, looking out the port. Lemelisk cracked his knuckles. Awe-inspiring, oh, isn't it? He had seen the plans so often, knew the details so intimately, but the actual construction still took his breath away, making him feel that all his years of exile in Maw installation had paid off. The small Death Star prototype had been amazing as well, but that was merely a proof-of-concept model. It functioned, but it wasn't the real thing. I will send my report to the Emperor, Tarkin said. Keep up the good work, Engineer Lemelisk. The Lambda shuttle proceeded through the grid work of the Death Star and out the other side, then began a slow orbit of the external construction. 
The focusing eye for the super laser gaped at them like a large meteorite crater. In the piloting chair, Akbar remained silent. The alien didn't seem terribly thrilled at the magnificence of this new weapon. Lemelisk smiled as the shuttle turned around and returned to the base. Everything was going so well. He felt better than he had in years, watching his dreams come to life. Lemelisk presented the modified design to Durga the Hutt, while General Sulamar brusquely inspected every step of the process, looking over the engineer's shoulder. Lemelisk spoke as the general pressed in, squinting and scowling. He longed for an opportunity to accidentally jab the general in the stomach with his elbow. As you know, the original design consisted of a giant sphere, Lemelisk said, whose primary purpose was to house the superlaser. All the framework, the decks, the external shell also made it into a garrison for one of the Empire's largest troop deployments. On his floating pallet, Durga reached over to scoop a dripping handful of some blue gelatinous substance from a bowl and slurped it up with his wide muscular lips and tongue. Mmm, mmm, he said. We know all that. Lemelisk said, But you don't need all that wasted space. You don't require living space for a million crew members. You don't need TIE fighter hangars, support squadrons, dozens of docking ports. You just want the weapon itself. Lemelisk's stomach growled. He wished he had eaten, though at least he had remembered to shave this time. He brushed the stubble on his chin. Or was that yesterday? He blinked, then cleared his throat. On the hollow projector, he called up his modified plans and pointed to the new shape. As you can see, I have scaled down the outer hull, but increased power at the same time. In the original Death Star design, the super laser formed the axis of the sphere. All the energy of the reactor core was devoted to powering each blast. Here I have taken the super laser itself. The image projected the stock of focusing lenses and high energy multipliers and encased it in a cylindrical shell. Your new weapon will be the super laser alone, surrounded by an armored hull with appropriate navigational capabilities and a small outer ring of living quarters. Even with such reduced amenities, this vessel could hold hundreds of huts with their personal entourages. But where is the focusing eye for the laser? Sulamar said, clasping his hands behind his back and leaning forward. Lemelisk saw an opportunity to nudge backward with his sharp elbow, but the general stepped sideways to look from a different perspective. Lemelisk sighed and answered, Note the end of the cylinder. I have moved the focusing eye so that the beam can come out the end directly, a straight shot through the long super laser that allows us to achieve greater energy conversion. We can provide more power to our punch. The plans sharpened to actual simulation of the completed weapon, a black armored cylinder rotating in space. As the animation began, the new weapon fired and a brilliant beam shot from one end of the tube. General Sulamar nodded. That looks like one of those old Jedi weapons. The lightsaber, he said. Lemelisk smiled, surprised that the pompous Imperial general had seen the connection. Yes he said. Now you understand why I have codenamed this weapon the Darksaber Project. Durga chuckled with pleasure. A good name, engineer. Sulamar stood stiffly, pondering the possibilities. The expression on his face tightened with anticipation. With such a weapon we will be invincible. He smiled wolfishly at Durga. We can collect protection money taxes, whatever. We can hold entire systems hostage. No one will be able to stand against us. Durga grinned with his huge lips and slurped another mouthful of the gooey blue gelatin. We can become the overlords of the galaxy. Bevel Lemelisk switched off the animation and shut down the glowing plans. Yes, Lord Durga, you probably can. Malaco Corporation, Primordial Water Quarry. Chapter 15 Hyperspace, 
en route to a destination Luke Skywalker fervently hoped would become a place of self-discovery, a time to recapture the inner sharing he had experienced with Callista. He eased back in the piloting chair of the unmarked space yacht they had flown from Coruscant. He sighed with quiet contentment, happy just to be alone with Callista. No pressures, no worries, and no mission other than to find her force ability again. He looked over at her in the seat beside him, and she gazed back with impenetrable gray eyes. Invisible doors had locked down, allowing him to see Callista only as others saw her, without the added clues and mysteries of the Force. She smiled, and he wanted to kiss her. Her cropped blonde hair showed streaks of a darker, malty brown color that lent a wildness to her appearance. I've picked out a special place for us to go, Luke said. A great spot. I think you'll like it. Callista shrugged. You're the Jedi Master. Lead me, and I'll follow. Luke raised his eyebrows. That doesn't sound like the Callista I fell in love with. She clasped his hand. Then let's go find her and bring her back. The ship flew through hyperspace on its automatic course. Luke got up from his seat and held out his hand. Callista stood beside him. She was tall, long-legged and very attractive. Luke reached forward and tenderly cupped his palms around her cheeks, holding Callista's face in his hands as he looked deeply into her eyes. She looked back, unblinking. Are you trying to probe me with the Force? Luke shook his head slightly, not releasing her from his gaze. No, he said. I just wanted to look at you. But the moment was broken. He took her hand and led her to the common area behind the pilot compartment. Let's try a few other things, he said. Some learning techniques that worked for the other Jedi trainees. But we've been through those already, Callista said in frustration. Not like this, he answered. You're different from my other students. Apart from the fact that I love you, of course, he added with a wry smile. You've already been trained as a Jedi Knight. You know the techniques. You just can't use them anymore. But there is one thing you can still use. What? Callista said, baffled as to what he planned. He went to the rectangular wall compartment where he stowed his personal effects and withdrew two cylinders. He tossed one to Callista, and she deftly snatched it out of the air. Let's try a little lightsaber fencing, he said. It'll get you thinking and moving like a Jedi again. Maybe that'll be a start. He switched on his weapon, and the green energy blade extended. Callista looked down at her own lightsaber, intimidated. Luke smiled encouragingly. Come on, I'm not asking you to deflect blaster bolts with your eyes closed. Watch me anticipate my moves. You don't have to use the Force. Just use your eyes and your reflexes. Callista drew a deep breath. Her eyes flashed with determination, and she switched on her own weapon. The snap hiss from both blades sizzled through the enclosed common area. Her lightsaber shone with the rich sun yellow of topaz, and she looked past her shimmering blade to Luke. You know this is dangerous, she said. He crossed his blade with hers, testing, pressing lightsabers together with a crackle of released energy. His expression grew serious. I know it's dangerous, Callista, but we have to take that chance. We might stumble upon some clue to bring you back to us. He drew back, lifted his blade, and swung at her. She raised her lightsaber to parry, easing into the contest. These are deadly weapons, Luke said, but they're also fine tests of your skill. Callista struck back, and her face lit with an impish grin as she took the challenge. Luke had to move fast to counter her blows. He laughed and increased his offense. Callista matched him, move for move. Fencing with Callista challenged Luke as well, because in any other foe he could use the Force to sense emotional states, to detect subtle changes that foreshadowed impending moves, unexpected attacks, vicious tricks. But Callista was a disconcerting blank to him, an empty spot, which made her a worthy opponent. Although she could not sense his moves or his plans, he couldn't detect hers either. They dueled, feeling their muscles sing with the effort, the unleashed energy and emotions, the joy of testing each other. Luke chuckled, and they continued, bright lights flashing, weapons hissing, as he and Callista pressed each other. The mock battle went on for the better part of an hour. 
Callista had an open, enthralled expression on her face, overjoyed to recapture some part of her former Jedi identity. She had not used a lightsaber since she had come back to life in this new body, and now, though Luke could sense no more of the Force touching her, she had regained an important piece of self-confidence. Energy blades crossed. They looked into each other's eyes, pressing with all their strength, neither yielding. A complete stalemate. Sweat beaded on Luke's forehead, and he finally broke their locked gaze and stepped back, switching off his lightsaber. Callista also shut hers down. Then laughing, they came together and held each other for a long time. Callista took her shift in the pilot seat as they both strapped in and watched the diagnostics. Luke kept glancing over at her. We're about ready to leave hyperspace, he said. She rubbed a fingertip along her chin. I can't wait to see this mysterious place you're taking me. The counter ran down on the Nava computer, and the swirling colors snapped into crystal focus, funneling down into bright star points on the black curtain of space. Nearby hung an orange sun of average size. Several bright planets cruised along their orbital paths in the gravity well. Over here, Luke said, pointing. He watched Callista's expression as she noticed the swollen form of a periodic comet, its gases evaporating into space, shedding a coma and a long fuzzy tail as it approached the sun. A comet? Callista said. We're awfully close. Luke nodded with a secretive smile. Yes, Callista, he answered. That's where we're going. Chapter 16 as Callista watched him, her gray eyes bright with curiosity, Luke maneuvered the space yacht closer to the wandering comet. He entered the wispy coma where gas particles and ion trails scintillated against their shields, causing static over the comm system. This is the Malaco Corporation primordial water quarry, Luke said. A long-term periodic comet that comes back every century or so. Right now it's near its closest approach to the sun, and we're at high tourist season. The space yacht approached the irregular lump swathed in a mane of frozen steam. Luke pointed out squarish machines crawling over the tarnished surface, strip mining the ice. Gas geysers blasted volatiles into space where the comet's meager gravity could not hold them, trailing a tenuous tail along the comet's orbit. But what do they do here? Callista asked. I've never heard of the system. Hey, you've been stuck inside a computer for decades, Luke said. Don't remind me, Callista said. For much of the comet's orbit, he explained, the mining corporation chops away water ice, storing and distilling it. They sell it at a premium to gourmets and high-class officials who like to show off that they settle for only the very best. This is absolutely pure water, formed at the creation of this solar system. Primordial ice, never before touched or recycled through organic life forms. Luke shrugged. Of course, it's chemically identical to any other water, but they don't mention that in their advertisements. But why did you choose this place? Callista said. The Malaco Corporation quarry sent a homing beacon, and Luke's guidance computer locked on, shepherding them toward a cavernous opening surrounded by lights. Brilliant yellow alternating with deep purple, harsh red, and some that looked black transmitted for customers whose eyes saw in different portions of the spectrum. Close to perihelion, Luke said, the comet becomes one of the most exclusive resorts in this sector. The climate heats up, enough of the volatiles evaporate from the ice to form a breathable atmosphere, and people can live inside the snowball. It's very unusual. I thought you might like it. Besides, no one will ever find us here. Their yacht passed through the portal beyond marker lights whose beams shone like lightsabers through the dense mist curling away from the comet's surface. The selling point of this resort is its transients. The Malaco Corporation mines it out each orbit as the comet hooks toward the sun and becomes habitable. They reinstall the facilities, open it to tourists for a few months, then close down again as the comet gets too close to the sun where it becomes unstable with too much gas evaporating, new geysers erupting, even a small possibility that the ice ball will split apart from all the mining and tunneling. Then, when the comet races away from the sun and the gases begin to freeze out, there's another several-month period when the resort is dug out again and reopened. 
When it finally becomes too cold, the quarry is closed to the public, and the mining company operates for the next hundred years out in deep space, strip mining the newly deposited layers of ice. I can't wait to see it. Callista reached over to clasp Luke's hand. They landed in a warmly lit reception area. Oranges and yellows shone into the ever-present mist, and porter droids appeared to unload their luggage. Luke checked in, keying their reservations into an automated terminal, and the droids escorted them into the resort facility. He and Callista held hands as they followed the baggage droids. Callista looked around, her cropped malt blonde hair swaying slightly. She blinked at her surroundings and grinned. The Malaco Corporation's stylistic logo, the letters M.C. traced within circles with a long cometary tail shooting out, adorned most of the doors and fixtures. The cometary resort was filled with water and amazing tropical caverns, far warmer than a ball of ice might have suggested. The frozen walls had been polymerized, showing ice locked behind a molecule-thin impenetrable layer and lit by soothing blue lights. Sections of the wall had been cleared away so that the frozen gases could drift out like humidifiers, sending trails of mist along the floor. Droplets of ultra-clean water dribbled along the walls like precious springs. Waterfalls hissed from the ceilings in a diamond curtain that gurgled softly into drains in the floor. Callista's face filled with childish wonder. This is beautiful, Luke. Oh, the water. I love the water. I know, Luke said. You've told me enough stories about how much you miss your home planet, Chad. Callista looked wistful. She had grown up on a water world, living with her father and stepmother on a sea ranch, destined to follow in the family business. But her Jedi calling had been stronger, and she had been forced to leave her beautiful oceans, though she still longed for them. The porter droids led them down gently curving corridors, past doorways of plush suites, until they came to the set of rooms Luke had reserved. Multicolored glow lamps reflected off the polymerized ice walls, making it seem as if they walked through a rainbow caught in crystal. Delighted, Callista stopped to kiss Luke. This is so wonderful, she said. I can feel the power in this place, the energy. I know we'll be able to do something here. Inside their spacious suite, fountains bubbled in the corners. Mists drifted around the rooms, passing glowing heaters that made the multiple chambers comfortable and homey. The furniture was oddly shaped and of varying sizes, carved from rock inclusions that had been found inside the cometary ice crust, now bearing the ubiquitous company logo. The porter droids deposited their packs and played pre-recorded advertisements for the various restaurants and lounges available at the luxurious M.C. Quarry. Luke hustled the droids out of the suite before they could begin a droning recitation of sightseeing opportunities. He shut the door and turned to Callista with a smile and a sigh. We're here, he said. He slumped down onto a polished stone contour sofa. Callista joined him. According to the brochures, there's plenty of things to do here, Luke said. We could explore the tunnels or suit up and go out to the surface. The low gravity makes it fun to jump around, he said. Or we could see one of the erupting gas geysers. Those are supposed to be quite spectacular. She shook her head. I just want to stay here with you, Luke. We can relax and talk and just be alone for a while. He closed his eyes and realized how wonderful that sounded. You won't get any argument from me. Callista stared into the foaming fountain. Her eyes took on a fixed, faraway look. Luke knew she must be focusing her thoughts, though he still could not sense her, as if the force itself didn't know she existed. I'm thinking of the oceans on Chad, she said, not looking at Luke but fully aware he was watching her especially at night, at highest tide, when all the moons are full in the sky at the same time. The wander kelp we kept corralled in mating season would begin to shimmer with captured phosphorus, glowing like an oil slick on fire. What are wander kelp? Luke asked. We used to raise them at our sea ranch, Callista said. It's sort of halfway between plant and animal. Really stupid, but it moves under its own volition a big mass of iodine-filled leaves that we could shear several times a year, distill, and sell for their medicinal content, 
while using the rest of the biomass as cheap protein fiber for animal feed. Times were tough. It's not that the market went bad, but the emperor's crackdown fouled up the trade routes. All the tariffs and impossible regulations pushed our regular traders out of business. Sometimes we had to cook and eat the barnacles growing beneath our corral rafts. Of course, my family is all dead now. Years ago, while I was trapped in that computer. Her lower lip began to tremble, and she fixedly refused to look at Luke. She clamped her lips together. Part of me feels guilty for not staying with them, but I carried that around all the years I was a Jedi. I don't have any regrets, just sadness. Now she turned and looked at Luke. Her eyes were dry and strong. But my Jedi master, Jin Altus, came and showed me the Jedi way. He arrived on his big wandering ship, the Chuunthor, a ship with no destination, much like your own Praxium on Yavin 4. I know, Luke said, we found the crashed and buried Chuunthor on Dathomir and brought it back. Callista sighed soberly. I suppose I must have known Jin Altus was dead. Perhaps he ran afoul of the Night Sisters. Her eyebrows knitted together. I remember once when Master Altus took me on a long, low flight above the seas of Chad. We cruised over singing schools of Syene and the patterns of tubular eels glowing pink in the moonlight. Master Altus taught me how to sense the life forms with my new abilities. I didn't believe him at first, but when he showed me how easy it was, I knew I was a Jedi. He didn't need to convince me. It was my family that required convincing, and I don't think I quite succeeded in that. Luke stood up and went to a pitted black table and pulled out a small disc, a blue chit that gave them a meal discount in one of the Malaco Corporation's fine restaurants. Let's try something, he said. Luke let his eyes fall half-closed, channeling his thoughts through the force in a simple exercise. The small chit lifted from the palm of his hand and hung suspended in the air. I'm going to hold this up, he said. You try to nudge it. Bump it toward me. That should be easier than actually lifting it. Open yourself to the force and let it flow. Just a slight push. I'll try, Callista said doubtfully, then caught herself as Luke replied, There is no try. She answered, I know, I know. I shouldn't have said that. Callista squeezed her eyes shut and concentrated. Her breathing grew shallow, her expression tighter, more compressed. Luke sent out small, questing tendrils to see if he could detect her manipulating the force. The blue disc hovered motionless in the air. Callista's face became flushed with the effort, and finally she let out a shuddering breath and opened her eyes. Her forehead creased with frustration. I can't. There's nothing. Before Luke could speak, she held up a hand. Please don't lecture me. Not now. You don't need to train me. I know how to do it, but I can't. Luke squeezed her hand instead. Don't lose hope, Callista, he said. Please don't lose hope. Later that evening, Luke sipped on a glass of primordial ice water distilled from the comet's reservoirs. Beaded droplets clustered on the outside of the glass. He looked at the mist rising along the floors and breathed the damp air, filling his lungs and savoring the sensation. This is so different from the place I grew up. Callista snuggled next to him in one of the oversized seats. Tell me about it, she said. I want to know everything about you. Luke let bittersweet memories flow back to him. I once said that if there was a bright center to the universe, Tatooine was the place it was farthest from. He shook his head. A dry, hot place, a hopeless place. Anybody born there was likely to die there, going nowhere. My uncle Owen and Aunt Baru were moisture farmers, hard-working, closed-minded people. They knew the truth about my father, told me lies, hoping against hope that I wouldn't follow in his footsteps, that I wouldn't want to pursue a dangerous and glorious life as a Jedi Knight. They wanted me to stay home where I would be safe and completely uninvolved. They loved me deeply in their own way, but when you feel the calling of the Jedi, there's no denying it. I know, Callista murmured, resting her head against his shoulder. 
When Obi-Wan Kenobi began to train me, Luke said, I didn't know how I was going to tell Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. He swallowed and felt his expression harden. I never had the chance, though. The Empire killed them and burned their farm before I could get back. They would have killed me, too, if I'd been there. Callista brushed his arm with her fingertips, radiating a quiet warmth. Now Biggs is dead, too, Luke said. Biggs Darklighter, the only one of my friends who actually escaped Tatooine. He went to the Imperial Academy for a while, then joined the Rebel Alliance. I met up with him again at our base on Yavin 4, though I didn't get much chance to talk with him. Biggs was my wingman when we flew against the Death Star. He saved me, but he died in the battle. Was he your only friend there? Callista said. Luke stuck his finger into the fountain, letting the cool water trickle down his hand. I had two other close companions, Cammy and Fixer. We used to hang out at Tosh Station and talk about our dreams and how we were going to get off that dust ball. Cammy's family grew hydroponic gardens underground and bought water from my uncle. Uncle Owen always said we were just wasting time, but we were exercising our imagination, thinking of things we could do even if we never would. It kept us from going insane on that hopeless planet. He sighed. I wonder if Cammy and Fixer are still there. My life seemed like it was going nowhere, Luke whispered. And now I'm a Jedi Master. I've found a twin sister I didn't know I had, and she's the Chief of State. The Empire is defeated, and I'm reestablishing the Jedi Knights. He gave a little laugh. A lot has changed. He smiled down at Callista and stroked her hair. She had fallen asleep in his arms. Comb Chapter 17 As Dorsk-81 piloted them to the main spaceport on Comb, Kip Doran stared out at the amazingly perfect gridwork of cities. Dorsk-81 fidgeted at the control panel, looking anxious as he brought their craft in. A few other vessels sat parked in marked-off rectangles, out-system traders coming to the clone planet to offer their wares. The inhabitants of Combe rarely left their world, preferring to stay at home and do what they had always done. Dorsk 81's olive green skin flushed a deeper hue. It feels good to be back, he said. I was untrained when I left, but now I can trace what my senses told me as I grew up. I feel the calming influence of this place, the comfortable familiarity. After all the difficult decisions I've faced at the Praxium, I want to sink back into the pool of my own people, absorbing their warmth and welcome. You'll sense it too, Kip. Kip nodded, masking his skepticism. I can already feel a low-level, muffled sensation. Dorsk-81 nodded his streamlined head and innocently blinked his bright eyes. Yes, yes, that's it. When they opened the access hatch, Kip was amazed to see that a crowd had been shuttled in from the tall buildings. He looked at the hundreds of smooth-skinned clones gathered to welcome them. They applauded when Dorsk-81 stepped into the hazy sunlight and raised his right arm in greeting. Kip stood beside his friend and whispered, Why so many? This is amazing. Beaming, Dorsk-81 answered, I am famous here now that I'm a Jedi Knight. He cast a sheepish glance at Kip. I'm the only person in Combe's recent memory who has done anything unpredictable. Kip stifled a laugh, knowing that Dorsk-81 was not joking. He watched as one of the cloned aliens came forward on a levitating raft encircled by handrails. The placid-faced alien piloting it wore some sort of uniform with insignia on the shoulders. Dorsk-81 was impressed. That must be our city leader, Kale 115. I've never seen him this close before. He's been our leader for decades. It's in his genetic line. But when the standing platform drifted in front of them, Kip saw that the uniformed alien had a childlike roundness to his face that did not speak of many years wearing the burdens of leadership. He raised his right hand in greeting as Dorsk 81 had done. I am Kale 116 he said, the new leader of this city. Welcome, Dorsk 81. We are proud to have such an impressive personage return to us. 
He gestured toward the open platform. Please allow me to escort you to your domicile. The city leader gave Kip a stiff greeting. They climbed aboard, and the levitating platform drifted just over the heads of the crowd. The olive-skinned aliens waved in unison, giving Dorsk 81 a hero's welcome. Kale 116 cruised away from the spaceport toward the identical blocks of city buildings. Trees lined every street, pruned to look exactly the same. Lawns of purple and blue grass were carefully manicured in front of each building. The air held a dusty, mineral undertone that spoke of lifelessness. The structures were squarish monstrosities made of polished green-veined rock bordered with a rough sandstone. The outer walls bore no decorations, no sculptures or window boxes, merely a number engraved in each cornerstone at street level. How do you find your way around? Kip said. Everything looks the same. Kale 116 seemed to take this as a criticism, and his face grew pinched. We have molded our city to be the way we want it, and we've maintained it that way. Everything is numbered and cataloged, and Combe is a stable, understandable place. Our citizens are happy and content here. I see, Kip said, forcing a smile. His dark eyes flashed toward Dorsk 81, who looked so pleased to be back home. As the standing platform drifted by, other aliens leaned out the windows to wave at them. Finally, Kale 116 lowered them to the ground in front of one building that looked like all the others. The city leader dropped them off with a perfunctory farewell. Dorsk 81 rushed to the building unabashedly, gazing up at the stone edifice as if he had never seen anything like it before. This is my home, he said. Kip followed as the cloned alien fairly ran up three flights of stairs to his personal abode. The well-lit corridor was lined with a dizzying succession of identical doors, like myriad images reflected from nested mirrors. One of the doors popped open as Dorsk 81 hurried toward it. Two figures emerged, wearing grins on their smooth faces. For a moment, Kip felt as if he had seen a vortex of alternate timelines, images of an identical person at different stages of life. They both looked like Dorsk 81, one older and more weathered, one younger and slightly smaller. All three embraced and talked quickly in low voices. Kip stepped back, feeling as if he didn't belong there, but he didn't mind. He observed with a pang of homesickness, thinking fondly of when he and his parents and his brother Zeth had spent warm times together on his own world of Dyer. The floating fishing platforms, the quiet lake sunsets. But the Empire had crushed that place, and Kip hadn't seen it since his childhood. After the brief and intense welcome, Dorsk 81 gestured for Kip to follow him inside. This is my friend, Kip Doran, another Jedi Knight. This, he turned to the older image of himself, is Dorsk 80, my predecessor. And here, he clasped the shoulder of the younger clone, is Dorsk 82, my successor. Kip felt disoriented by the genetically identical copies, but he had seen many strange things in the galaxy. He glanced around where the Dorsk family lived, saw adequate furnishings, and all the expected rooms. Do any of you have wives? he asked, seeing no one else. All three clones blinked at him, and finally Dorsk 81 gave a short laugh. The skin on his forehead wrinkled. Kip, no one has wives. Everyone on Comb is genderless. That's why we use the cloning facilities. We haven't had genders on this planet for thousands of years. Kip chuckled in embarrassment. Well, I just assumed... Um, obviously I was wrong. We all make mistakes, the elder Dorsk 80 said with a quick meaningful frown in the direction of Dorsk 81. Kip noticed, but his friend pretended not to. Later, Dorsk 81 helped make a bed in their small extra room, and Kip used the moment of privacy to ask a question that had been bothering him. Dorsk 81, he said, now that I've seen how... He searched for the right word how stable and unchanging your world is. I don't understand how you're going to be a Jedi Watchman. What are you going to do here? Dorsk 81's yellow eyes suddenly filled with panic. I don't know, he whispered, his voice hoarse. I don't know. 
He repeated the words to himself, then he left Kip alone, fleeing back into the outer rooms. Kip could not sleep for some time. He looked out the window into a night that glowed with a billion bright stars. Combe was close to the galactic nucleus, near the dreaded core systems, where the survivors of the Empire had gone into hiding. The stars made a blurry island in space, a lens that spilled across half the sky. Kip stared toward the core systems, fearing what they might hide, but also yearning to know. Young Dorsgate E2 spent the next morning showing off his work in the clone banks. The cloning facility was taller than the other buildings and of a different design, the only unusual structure Kip had seen in the grid work of the metropolis. Rather than the ubiquitous green-veined stone, the outer walls were immense rectangular sheets of transparent crystal interlocked with chrome girders that reflected the hazy sunlight. The crystal windows were so clear that Kip could look in from street level and see the carefully organized activity inside. We have maintained everything exactly as it was when you left it, Dorsk 82 said, beaming up at his father. Inside, the air was damp and laden with a medley of chemical and organic smells that were not so much unpleasant as exotic and unusual. Dorsk 80 accompanied them like a stern schoolmaster, nodding in pride at his protege Dorsk 82 and looking from side to side, touching controls and inspecting them as they passed. I didn't know this was the work you did before, Kip said to Dorsk 81. His friend nodded. Yes, the computer database holds genetic blueprints of all the major family lines. When it is time to produce the next offspring, we call up the DNA strings and produce another copy of the preferred stock. Each clone is usually the same, Dorsk 80 interrupted. Kip knew that Dorsk 81 was an anomaly, force-sensitive against all odds, when he should have been identical to all previous incarnations of his clone pattern. But something inexplicable had changed. Metal incubators lined row after row in banks carefully numbered and monitored where embryos were grown past the infant stage and accelerated to near adolescence, whereupon they were released and raised by their family units trained in the duties of their genetic string. The hissing of moving fluids, the whisper of mist generators, and the clicking of computer operators made the cloning facility a constant hive of activity. But tension grew around Dorsk 81 like a blanket of silence. Dorsk 82 proudly led them to his own station. Flat terminal screens displayed the status of thousands of the embryo tanks. Here is where you used to sit, Dorsk 82 said. Everything remains fully functional, and I have followed in our family's footsteps. But now that you have returned, I gladly relinquish my position to you so that I may continue my training and one day become your true successor. Dorsk 81 blanched. But that isn't why I came back. You don't understand. He looked to Kip for support. Continue in your duties at the cloning facility, Dorsk 82. I don't intend to take them again. The younger clone blinked, uncomprehending. But you must. Dorsk 80's face darkened. You are my successor, Dorsk 81. You have always known your place. Dorsk 81 whirled to look at his elder. No, I am a Jedi Knight, and I must find my place, my new place. Kip yearned to help his friend to support him, but this was a personal debate, and he would only hurt things if he interfered. Dorsk 80 looked at him sternly. You have no choice in the matter. Yes, Dorsk 81 said, his face filled with anguish. Yes, I do have a choice. That's what you don't understand. Dorsk 81's tear-filled eyes flicked back and forth to his younger and older versions. As Kip watched, the expressions on all three faces were enough to break his heart. Dorsk 81's family brooded for the rest of the day, shunning him. Looking wretched, the cloned alien came to Kip, who had retreated to the guest room. He felt so sorry for his friend. He could see from the stagnant life on Comb that the others could not comprehend who Dorsk 81 was or what he had done. Dorsk 81 sat beside Kip, 
His yellow eyes were very expressive, but it took him a long moment to gather the courage to speak. I don't dare stay here, he said. Even if I try to be strong, I know that if I live on this world, in this city, with my family members, I will eventually give in. I'll forget what it was to be a Jedi. I will fail in my vow to Master Skywalker. It'll all wash away, and my life will vanish as a minor deviation in the history of Calm. What am I to do now? It all seemed so clear to me when I became a Jedi. I was going to return to Calm and be the guardian of this system. But this system does not need or want a Jedi Knight to guard them. Now what mission do I have? Kip gripped Dorsk 81's arm, feeling his heart pound. You can come with me, he said. I want you to. Dorsk 81's smooth face became an open window through which hope streamed like sunlight. Kip's eyes narrowed, then he felt a glimmer of the old vendetta against the Empire. We'll take our ship and slip into the uncharted core systems, he said. You and I together must discover what's become of the Empire. Core Systems Chapter 18 Dalla dropped the Firestorm's shields just enough to let Vice Admiral Pelion's shuttle approach her Star Destroyer. The self-destruct countdown continued toward zero like an avalanche of diminishing numbers. Dalla studied her bridge crew grimly. She pitied them, yet admired their stoic demeanor. She respected Pelion's cool, unshakable bravery, or perhaps his recklessness, for approaching a ship that would likely detonate in his face. She turned to the comm officer. Have you been advising Supreme Warlord Harsk on the status of our self-destruct countdown? Pasty-faced, the comm officer swallowed. Yes, Admiral, but I've received no response. A pity, Dalla said blandly. I hope he doesn't think I'm bluffing. I've assured him you're not, Admiral, the comm officer said, then looked away, his lips pushed together in a pale, bloodless line. Time remaining? Dalla asked. Seven minutes. Vice Admiral Pelion has just docked in the shuttle bay, the tactical officer interrupted. She stood firm at the control station, arms clasped behind her back. The Crimson Victory-class warships surrounded Harsk's fleet like a pack of hungry predators. Dalla didn't quite understand what Pelion was doing, but the fact that so many of his battle cruisers followed his seemingly suicidal orders gave her great confidence in the Vice Admiral's leadership ability. Escort him here immediately, she said, and honor guard of stormtroopers. Make sure he understands he's not being held captive. Treat him as a respected negotiator. Is there time, Admiral? The deck chief said. Only six minutes remaining. Then they'll need to run, won't they? We must be optimists, she said, her lips twisting in a bitter smile. Though optimism is difficult in the face of juveniles like Harsk and Teradoc. By the time the honor guard arrived on the Star Destroyer's bridge, only one minute forty-five seconds remained on the clock. Six stormtroopers marched in briskly, hustling a trim, mature man with a heavy mustache and neat gray hair. His eyes looked shrewd and bright, his body wiry and flexible. Vice Admiral Pelion, I presume, Dalla said in a calm voice. I'm pleased you could join me here at the moment of our death. Pelion swallowed. Admiral Dalla, I have heard much about you, and I'm aware of the determination and dedication you have already demonstrated. I doubt you are bluffing. I wish Warlord Harsk were similarly convinced, however. One minute, Admiral. The officer's voice was a strangled squawk. Is our log pod prepared for jettison? Dalla said. If nothing else, perhaps our desperate act will make the other warlords aware of their folly. Before the comm officer could answer, Warlord Harsk's grainy image appeared. All right, stop, stop. Cease the countdown. I order all hostilities to end immediately. Dalla, damn you, stop the self-destruct. The deck chief froze. The bridge crew let out a collective sigh of relief. Pelion watched her, eyebrows raised. Dalla remained standing at the station, not moving to negate her commands, though her heart thudded with triumph. She paused just a moment longer as the countdown reached the thirty-second point. She arranged her expression into a mask of subdued disappointment, 
just to convince those watching that she had genuinely intended to blow up the firestorm and the whirlwind with it if her demands had not been met. Admiral, Pelion said in a careful yet persuasive tone, I would greatly prefer to negotiate with you, if you have the time. His voice was soft but intelligent. Dalla reached out casually to flick the paws on the self-destruct countdown. Very well, Vice Admiral. I prefer alternate solutions myself. From memory, she rattled off a string of coordinates to the navigator. We'll take the firestorm to an isolated area for a private conference. However, to dispel any impression that we might be kidnapping you, Vice Admiral Pelion, I invite two of your Victory Class ships to accompany us. She looked at him, eyebrows raised questioningly. I think it's better to be away from any possible treachery from Teradoc or Harsk. I don't trust either of them not to take advantage of the present situation. I agree, Admiral, Pelion said with a curt nod. The crow's feet around his eyes wrinkled, and Dalla felt deep down that this man's ultimate goal for the Empire just might match her own. If you would permit me to use your comm system, I will encode the appropriate orders to my flagship and a companion ship. Dalla turned to her helmsman. When the Nava computer has calculated the best hyperspace path, drop shields and proceed to our destination. Two Victory Class Star Destroyers will follow us. But, Admiral, the second in command said, that would leave the whirlwind helpless and surrounded by High Admiral Teradox warships. After your ion cannon blast? I believe Teradoc will be reluctant to open fire, but if I'm wrong... She glanced down at the chronometer. According to my estimate, the whirlwind has had sufficient time to complete repairs. In fact, Harsk has already had an additional six minutes. If I have misinterpreted Teradoc's actions, and if I have overestimated the crew of the whirlwind, then I will extend apologies later, she said but her grin was smug and laissez-faire. It's agreed, Admiral, Pelion said from the comm station. Two of my ships are ready to follow. He bowed his head. We're trusting that you won't lead us into an ambush. Dalla nodded, trying to stand even more rigidly than Pelion. I understand the risk you're taking, Vice Admiral, but believe me, I wouldn't go to such lengths just to eliminate two small star destroyers. Warlord Harsk's fleet could have done that just as easily. The firestorm's shields faded, leaving Harsk's helpless Star Destroyer hanging dark in space. Flanked by two Crimson Victory ships, Dalla's firestorm rose up and out of the ring plane, cutting across the debris that hung like a sparkling necklace around the lavender gas planet. The trio of ships shot into hyperspace. Three Star Destroyers, one large and two small, hung in a wasteland of space. The nearest star glowed dimly twelve parsecs distant. A diffuse molecular cloud spread its cold veil across the emptiness. Dalla had discovered this stellar desert while she and her crippled ship Gorgon struggled back to the Empire after the devastating battle for Maw installation. Pelion sat across from Dalla in her private ready room adjoining the bridge. He sipped a cool drink, obviously trying not to succumb to comfort or social talk. Dalla appreciated that. She peeled off her black gloves, straightened her flaming hair, and folded her hands on the table in front of her. She leaned across so she could look into his eyes. Vice Admiral Pelion, she said, believe me when I tell you, I intend no mutiny against the rightful heirs to the Empire. I have no interest in becoming a great leader like your Grand Admiral Thrawn. I have read of his exploits, and I cannot replace him. I resent any attempts to compare me with him. We are different people with different short-term goals, but I believe his long-term hopes were the same as mine. And what are those hopes, Admiral? Pelion asked, as if he wanted to believe her, needed to believe her, yet felt compelled to ask the question. She nodded slowly. I continue to bear great love for the ideal of the Empire. The galaxy was so much more orderly. Lawlessness did not run rampant. Citizens were not confused as to their place. The Emperor gave them a destiny. The rebels have destroyed that and supplied nothing to fill the vacuum. They talk, they pamper, they go through the motions. 
but they have yet to display any genuine leadership. Is this the only alternative for those of us who served the emperor? I don't think so. On the other hand, I disdain what these puffed-up, self-appointed warlords have inflicted upon our fighting forces. Yes, the empire has suffered many defeats in the past eight years, but we should not let those losses convince us that the empire no longer has a significant fighting force. That is absurd. If we pooled all available ships, our military would at least be comparable to the hodgepodge fleet the rebels have managed to assemble. Pelion nodded, carefully sipping his drink again. But these squabbling children have caused as much damage to the Empire as the Rebel Alliance has, Dalla continued. If they would work together, decide on a leader among themselves, then we could strike back. I couldn't agree more, Admiral, Pelion said. But how to accomplish that? Your strong-arm tactics may have caught Harsk and Teradoc by surprise, but the others won't crumple so easily. Dalla ran her fingertip across the rim of her glass, and Pelion watched her. She looked out the window at the empty blackness, devoid of stars. I don't for a moment think that Teradoc or Harsk have surrendered. They are plotting ways to destroy me, and destroy you as well, since you have joined me for this conversation. No, they must be made to see. Her face took on a wistful look as she turned from the window and stared at the wall and into her past. She muttered, I was trained at the Imperial Military Academy on Corita. Because I was a woman, I was not allowed to advance along with my classmates, though I had the same, if not greater, capabilities. I excelled in the Academy's exercises. I emerged at the top of my class in every case, and yet inferiors continued to be promoted above me. I was stuck in backwater assignments, forced to do menial labor while those I had trounced in simulated combat rose up to take command of their own ships, I became a computer clerk and then a galley overseer preparing packaged food for shipment on star destroyer fleets. I put up with all that, she said, drumming her fingertips on the table, because I was an imperial soldier, and we are trained to obey orders. Yet I felt that I would let the Empire down if I allowed my short-sighted superiors to ignore the things I could do. The Emperor's personal distaste for women and non-human species is one of the few things I disagree with. Grand Admiral Thrawn was an alien, Pelion said. Yes, Dalla said, and according to the records I've seen, the Emperor exiled him to the Unknown Territories, though Thrawn was perhaps one of the best military commanders in the fleet. Pelion nodded. I see your point. I was overjoyed when he returned, and I finally found a commander I could follow with a genuine hope of victory, rather than an endless string of defeats. Pelion finished his drink and set the empty glass on the table. He did not request another. So what did you do? he asked. How did you gain your rank of admiral? I created a false identity for myself, Dalla said. I played simulations remotely on the Caridden computer networks. I defeated the best opponents over and over again. Some of my tactics were true breakthroughs, variations on the zero-gravity fighting routines, and space maneuvers developed by General Dodana himself. All ships in the Imperial Navy were given copies of my battles to study. Space warfare changed because of the intuitive leaps I had made, all under a fake name, of course. My skills came to the attention of Moff Tarkin, who journeyed to Corita so that he could meet the mysterious individual who had developed such innovative tactics. It took him several months and two black market slicers to dig me out of my network hiding place. Tarkin was astonished to learn I was a woman, and even more astonished to see that I was a lowly corporal working in the kitchen. The officials on Corita were outraged, terribly embarrassed that their star tactician turned out to be someone they had buried. But when Tarkin realized that, instead of rewarding me for my exceptional intuition, the Corridan officials intended to assign me to a lonely meteorological station on the South Polar Ice Cap, he transferred me to his own personal staff, promoted me to Admiral, and took me away from Corita. She smiled with a memory she had not allowed for some time. Once he overheard a young lieutenant mutter that I had achieved my rank only because I was sleeping with Tarkin. Dalla sighed. 
Why is it every time a competent woman is rewarded, others assume it's only because she's having sex with a man? Pelion didn't answer her, not that she expected him to. Tarkin arrested the lieutenant, she said, placed him in an environment suit with a day's worth of air in a low orbit. We both ran the calculations and estimated that he would make about twenty orbits before he dropped deep enough into the atmosphere to burn up. Neither of us knew whether his air would run out first or if he would be incinerated. Either circumstance provided a fine punishment, a gruesome example for Moff Tarkin's crew to see. It was particularly effective that he left the lieutenant's comm system open so that for a full day everyone aboard could hear his words over the ship's intercom, pleading, cursing, screaming. Dalla finished her own drink and placed the empty glass beside Pelion's. After that time, no one ever suggested I had received my rank, only because Tarkin was my lover. Pelion paled, but made no comment. But I'm digressing, Dalla said. You and I should come to some sort of decision and get back before our respective fleets grow too impatient. Agreed, Admiral. What is it that you wish to accomplish? I want to unify the Empire, Dalla said simply. I want someone to take the helm as leader, but I don't intend for it to be me. I have no delusions of political glory. I just want the opportunity to cause as much damage as possible to the rebels. Why not call a detente council, then? Pelion said. Perhaps we could get the warlords together, make them sit down and talk. Even if they refuse to be united under a single leader, perhaps they could agree on strategy. Each could strike different targets in the New Republic, using their own tactics and their own methods to bring the rebels to their knees. Then we can mop up the territory that's rightfully ours. His eyes glittered with excitement as the ideas flowed from him. Dalla nodded. An exceptionally good suggestion, Vice Admiral, similar to my own ideas. You are perhaps in a better position to make those invitations, though I will do what I can. However, she said, going to a cyber-locked strong box beside her personal bureau, if that doesn't work, I want you to take this. She opened the strong box and withdrew a palm-sized breath mask membrane, which she handed to Pelion. What is it for? Pelion said. I hope you never need to use it, Dalla answered, but if all else fails, you will know. Chapter 19 Sas Beacon transmitted its blind signal into the fiery soup of stars and gases near the heart of the deep core. The automated station had been constructed by droids and suicide crews on a planetoid scoured clean by an endless wash of radioactive storms and solar flares that swept the region. No living thing had visited Sas Beacon for fifteen years, and the ionized flux had long since caused most of the maintenance droids to malfunction. Admiral Dalla considered it the perfect place to hold a meeting of Imperial warlords. The squarish beacon station was a squat citadel with low walls more than a meter thick to block the radiation. Before sending her own star destroyer into the hostile region, Dalla had dispatched a gamma assault shuttle crewed by worker droids who sat down and began the major overhaul chores following programming and specifications that Dalla herself had developed. When the worker droids completed the groundwork and installed high-efficiency radiation shield generators, Dalla brought the firestorm into the ravening system where hot gas swirled around them and shock waves from stellar storms scrambled her sensors. It reminded Dalla of her hiding place in the Cauldron Nebula when she had been isolated from the Empire, with only a pitifully small fleet to attack the rebels. If the Imperials could pool their resources now. Once her ship was in place around Tsas Beacon, Dalla sent a crew of stormtroopers down to complete the preparations, accompanying them herself to oversee the efforts. She chose one of the station's main storerooms to host the detente meeting. Worker droids had already completed significant structural changes to the room, which had no windows, no exits except for the single door equipped with a thick shielded lock. It would be perfect. A crew of stormtroopers removed the decommissioned equipment and forgotten supplies that had been used to construct the beacon. The machinery was outdated and alive with secondary radiation. 
the armored troopers dumped it all out on the rocky surface. Dalla stood in her olive-gray uniform, coppery hair falling loose behind her, black-gloved hands clasped behind her back as she watched everything. She tried to appear both intimidating and compassionate, though the compassion part was difficult. She watched Harsk's former soldiers and saw that some remained uneasy at what they perceived to be her mutiny, though most had been converted to Dalla's cause. They were imperial soldiers trained to follow their leader. She was not surprised to discover that the majority of her troops had despised their service under Harsk and secretly applauded her actions. These had all learned to respect the ideal of the Empire, and Dalla offered a return to that. Harsk promised only a continuance of civil war. Pelion's victory-class ships arrived a day after Dalla had completed preparations. As stormtroopers ushered the vice-admiral in to see her, she felt an icy dread in the pit of her stomach. All would be lost if he had not succeeded in his mission. But she could tell from the faint smile on his lean face and the brightness in his eyes that it hadn't been a failure after all. Mission accomplished, Admiral, he said, standing straight and looking directly at her. Thirteen of the strongest imperial warlords will arrive for these talks. His smile sagged a little, causing his mustache to droop. It was not easy to convince them. I had to use every tactic I could think of, banking fully on your legendary reputation and my association with Grand Admiral Thrawn. This uses up all of the influence we had. He lowered his voice, aware that his words might be construed as disrespectful. You'd better make it work, Admiral. We won't get a second chance. Dalla tugged her black gloves onto her hands. I understand, Vice Admiral, she said. I have no intention of failing. Pelion's smile turned grim. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here with you. The warlords arrived with their fleets bristling with weapons, and Dalla knew that the slightest misstep could trigger an internecine holocaust that could wipe out the remains of the imperial military. She shook her head in resignation, her face tight and drawn, then realized that if such was to be the fate of the Empire, better that it ended here rather than through a long and dishonorable attrition. She contacted each fleet as it came in. Only the warlord is allowed to approach. All armed forces are denied access to this sector. The warlords argued, insisting on their personal escorts, their guards, their protective battleships. But Dalla refused each one. No. No one will carry weapons to this meeting. No one will be allowed to position his forces for a secret attack. This is a political negotiation regarding the fate of the Empire. There is no need for demonstrations of bluster or bravado. The talks were delayed two days in the miserable fury around Tsas Beacon until finally the last of the fleets backed off. Dalla was convinced they departed no farther than the edge of the system, out of range of her station's scrambled sensors, but it was good enough for her purposes. It would give her sufficient time to deal with a crisis, if one occurred. Inside the shielded supply room, Dalla waited at the head of the long table she had installed for the express purpose of the detente meeting. The table was irregularly shaped, with rounded corners and a looping perimeter intended to dismiss any subtle hierarchy in seating order. The gathered warlords were all equal as far as Dalla was concerned equally pompous fools. But she needed to foster an impression of fairness and impartiality if they were ever to begin open negotiations. Without windows, the place seemed like a dungeon, so Dalla had added electric blue illumination crystals around the room to shed a soothing cool glow from shoulder-high metal staffs, high-tech torches reflecting off the dull gray walls. Outside the door, scarlet-robed imperial guards stood ominously silent, heightening the aura of command in her presence. Dalla sat back in her uncomfortable chair. She preferred rigid furniture because it kept her attention focused. She took several deep breaths, collecting her thoughts, gathering her stamina for what she knew would be a dreadfully difficult meeting. Dalla despised meetings, preferring instead to make unilateral decisions and follow through on them but that wouldn't work in this case. At least not yet. She had to give the warlords a chance. Pelion stood to one side of the door as an honor guard, 
High Admiral Teradoc was the first to pass through the doorway, fat and sweaty-faced, staggering even in the low gravity. His beady eyes were filled with seething hatred as he flicked a venomous glance at Pelion. With an outthrust lower lip, Teradoc took the nearest chair to minimize the distance he had to walk. He placed himself equally distant between Pelion, whom he considered a traitor, and Dalla, who, as an interloper, was probably worse. After him came Supreme Warlord Harsk, the little man with the hideously scarred face. Then Superior General Delvardis, a tall and skeletal man with dark brown hair and shock white eyebrows that stood out like electrical discharges from his forehead. He had a square chin bisected by a deep cleft. Following Delvardis came an endless string of high moths, honored overlords, supreme leaders, and other commanders with similarly pompous yet meaningless titles. When the last of the warlords had taken his seat, Pelion clicked his heels together and marched briskly to the front. Making his turns sharp and exaggerated, he came to stand at attention beside Dalla. I want to thank you all for coming here, he said. I know this is a difficult compromise, even agreeing to meet, but you must hear us out for the future of the Empire. Dalla rose slowly to her feet, moving at the exact pace she hoped would capture their attention. Fast enough so as not to distract them, slow enough to give them time to dread what she might say or do. She flashed her emerald eyes. One Empire, one fleet. Only this will guarantee us victory. From his seat, obese High Admiral Teradoc made a rude sound with his lips. Those platitudes might work with impressionable young soldiers, but not us. We're beyond all that high-sounding nonsense. Pelion stiffened beside Dalla, and his face blanched. She could sense the genuine anger boiling up inside him as he said, Sir, they are not just platitudes. We're talking about the fate of the Empire. What Empire? Teradoc said, We are the Empire. He waved his pudgy hand to encompass the other warlords and scowled. Dalla threw her words out like a fistful of ice chips. High Admiral Teradoc, that would be cause for immediate execution if the Emperor were here. Well, he's not here, Teradoc snapped back. And so we must function without him. Dalla glared at the High Admiral for a heartbeat, then swept her gaze across the other warlords, who seemed alternately amused or bored by the altercation. I have seen what remains of the Imperial Starfleet, she said. I have visited most of you in the past year, urging you to put aside your differences. Supreme Warlord Harsk has a fleet of Imperial Star Destroyers. High Admiral Teradoc has a force of Victory-class warships. You others have blast boats, capital ships, millions upon millions of stormtroopers. Unstoppable military might, if we choose to use it as such. Grand Admiral Thrawn proved the rebels have not yet managed to consolidate their own meager resources. Because of your rivalries, every one of your sectors has devoted vast resources to creating weaponry. It is time to use those resources against our real enemies instead of against each other. Fine words, Admiral Dalla. Warlord Harsk mockingly clapped his hands. And how do you propose that we do that? Dalla pounded her gloved fist on the table. By forging an alliance. If the rebels can do it, so can we. Superior General Delvardis at a far corner of the table stood up to leave, brushing himself off. I've heard enough. This is just a poorly disguised power grab. I've spent more funds than any of you on military build-up. His forehead wrinkled, and his bright white eyebrows crawled together. I'm not sharing my glory. As the skeletally thin man turned his back to Dalla, she touched a hidden control panel under the table. The heavy durasteel door heaved up on hydraulic pistons and slammed into place, sealing gaskets around the edges. Multicolored lights scrambled like outraged insects on the square panel of the operating mechanism. What is this? Delvardis said, whirling. That is a cyber-locked door with a timing mechanism, Dalla said. Even I can't open it for the next three hours. You will sit down, Delvardis. Several of the warlords lurched to their feet. 
High Admiral Teradoc attempted to rise, but his bulk dragged him back down, and he simply smacked a sweaty palm on the tabletop. The Imperial commanders shouted and bellowed and hammered their fists and lashed out at each other. But Dalla stood firm, weathering their tantrums. Pelion remained beside her, looking decidedly uneasy. This is not a power grab, Dalla finally said when the uproar had died down. I know that other Imperial officers have left the fleet, throwing their lot in with criminals and lowlifes because it gives them a chance for a pathetic personal gain. But you, while I resent your destructive tactics, at least hold a shadow of allegiance to our once great empire. You have three hours to choose a nominal leader. There's nothing else you can do. We are all sealed inside this chamber, so you may as well make the best of it. She sat down and clasped her hands, squeezing the black leather between her fingers with a soft, strangling sound, and she waited. Hour after hour the squabbling grew more strident, more childish. Rivalries erupted between competing warlords. Old vengeances were redeclared, allegations of betrayals and threats of reprisals hurled in each other's faces. For the first hour Dalla was disturbed, but still held out some hope. In the second hour, though she kept her anger well hidden, she wanted to bash their skulls together. By the middle of the third hour, Dalla gave up any attempt to mask her contempt for the squabbling warlords. Finally, Warlord Harsk lost control of himself during a shouting match with Teradoc. The little scar-faced man leaped across the table, scrambling on his knees, and launched himself at the obese High Admiral, trying to wrap his short fingers around Teradoc's fat throat. The chair tipped over, and both crashed to the floor, cursing and shouting. The other warlords stood up, some cheering, others yelling for them to stop. Pelion finally stormed over to the scene, grabbed Harsk, lifted the short man bodily in the low gravity, and cast him onto the flat table. Teradoc bellowed in rage, his face florid. His breathing rasped into his lungs like a damaged air recirculation system. Dalla turned and ripped one of the electric blue glow torches from the floor behind her. Enough, she shouted. She raised the Durasteel staff high and smashed it down upon the tabletop. The glow crystal exploded into shards with crackling blue sparks, and transparent fragments flew in all directions. She hammered the rod down again and again, denting the table, bending the staff, and fragmenting the end. Five minutes remained on the cyber-locked door. Her action, unexpected and violent, brought the dissenting leaders to a surprised standstill. She tossed the metal pole to the floor, where it clanged and clattered and finally lay still. In utter disgust, Dalla spoke, her voice low and heavy like a blunt instrument. I didn't want to rule. I had no intention of becoming a political leader. I wanted to crush the rebels instead. But you give me no choice. I cannot leave the Empire in the hands of fools like you. Dalla reached into the hip pocket of her olive-gray uniform and withdrew a translucent breath mask, which she placed over her mouth and nose. She activated the mask with a fingertip, and it sealed itself to her face, grafting its edges to her skin cells. Beside her, Pelion suddenly looked up in dawning comprehension. He grabbed for his own mask as Dalla reached under the table again and pressed a button. Triggering the nerve gas systems, she had programmed the worker droids to install. The air vents made hissing sounds like serpents expelling venomous breath into the room. In unison, the warlords howled at the treachery. Dalla noted with amused irony that at last they had found a way to do something together. Teradoc attempted to haul his bloated form to his feet. Dalla presumed he would die of a heart attack if the nerve gas didn't get him first. Warlord Harsk and three others didn't waste time venting their rage, but rushed to the door, pounding at the cyberlock, trying to trigger its release. But the timer had four minutes yet to run, and Dalla knew the gas required only seconds to complete its fatal action. Tall, skeletal Delvardis snatched at the insignia on his chest with an intent look of concentration on his face. He managed to clip several badges and medals together. He withdrew a strut from one of his shoulder boards, and when he had finished clicking the components together, Dalla saw that he had assembled a wicked-looking, if primitive, knife. On his long, bony legs, Delvardis staggered toward her, raising the blade. 
His face grew splotchy with rose-colored eruptions of tiny blood vessels in his cheeks and eyes. He gasped. Dalla remained standing where she was, a ready target. She stared at him with polite interest. Delvartis had accepted the fact he would die, and he meant to slash Dalla before the nerve gas caused him to succumb. The warlords were falling right and left now, slumping atop each other. Some choked, clutching their throats. Others vomited. Two sprawled across the table. Most had managed to make it to the floor. Delvardis kept coming, one plodding step at a time, as if his limbs were sheathed in rapidly hardening duracrete. His eyes were a deep red, filled with blood from the inside, as he strained, lifting his knife. Dalla watched him topple at her feet. The knife clattered on the floor plates. Pelion looked shocked but resigned as he watched the unexpected carnage. Fat Teradoc continued to wheeze and cough. Dalla was surprised to see that the obese warlord was the last to die. A few moments later, Dalla and Pelion stood like statues, the only two survivors surveying the massacre of Imperial military commanders. Pelion blinked in shock. It's done then, he whispered, as if he still couldn't believe what he had just witnessed. Dalla merely nodded grimly and said, This is what had to be. Right on time, the cyber lock clicked, and the heavy door swung open, setting Dalla and Pelion free. Chapter 20 Admiral Dalla's consolidated fleet arrived in a threatening posture at the military outpost of dead Superior General Del Vardis. She took an ample landing force as a show of strength when she went to parley with Cronus, Del Vardis's second in command. The skeletal superior general had chosen a small world on the outer fringe of the habitable band from its sun, an arid place of rusty sands, barren rocks, and labyrinthine canyons left over from ancient long-dried floods. From her newly commandeered star destroyers, Dalla gathered a squadron of assault shuttles that looked like deadly beetles that streaked down in an impressive phalanx through the pale green atmosphere, homing in on the secret location of Del Vardis's fortress. She had taken the coordinates from highly useful spy files that Pelion had downloaded from the central data banks of High Admiral Teradoc's flagship. The squadron cruised low over the broken and veined landscape, following the blistered cracks and fissures. Looming canyon walls cast thick shadows. As the ships penetrated the canyon network, the box ended gorge stopped abruptly in an imposing facade, the personal fortress of Superior General Del Vardis. The assault shuttles landed in front of the huge stone gates, settling onto a dry wash as hard as duracrete. Dalla and Pelion emerged, accompanied by half of her heavily armed stormtroopers. The remainder of her troops stayed inside the assault shuttles, manning the weapons. The Gamma assault shuttles hissed and ticked as their engines cooled, settling in for the siege. She had no idea how Del Vardis's second in command would react. Two of the stormtroopers opened the back cargo compartment and withdrew Dalla's most important show of force. Vice Admiral Pelion and I will walk out front, she said. Two of you will carry the trophy, and the rest follow on either side as my honor guard. They marched up the paved wash to the towering edifice of the fortress, their boots making sounds like gunfire as they clomped across the ground. The arid wind issued a quiet moan. Dalla saw no other movement. The stormtroopers wrestled with a blocky frame on anti-grav mounts, trying to keep it from jerking in the brisk breezes. Suspended in the middle of the frame, crackling and preserved in a high-powered force field, like a dead insect trapped in amber, hung the gangly, cleft-jawed body of Superior General Del Vardis. His face was blotched and contorted in a grimace, his eyes squeezed shut from the effects of the nerve gas. Dalla glanced behind her, fiery hair whipping about in the cold gusts. Her lungs burned from the thin air, but she didn't want to appear weak, wearing a breath mask. Pelion straightened his uniform and stood with imperial demeanor. Dalla held her head up and strode toward the massive doors five times her own height. Dalla suspected the grandeur was mostly for show. Despite Delvardis's proclaimed enormous military expenditures, she had seen virtually no armed presence around the entire planet, and she wondered if the second-in-command might be planning some sort of ambush. 
Stepping apart so that all observers could witness the suspended body of Superior General Del Vardis, Dalla and Pelion stood before the towering stone doorway and waited. She spotted voice pickups cleverly concealed in crevices in the rocks. I have a message and a gift for Colonel Cronus, Dalla said in a normal speaking voice, turning her mouth toward the voice pickups. With a sound like a disgusted sigh, the great stone doors cracked open by two meters, revealing an armed contingent of Imperial soldiers hiding inside. Dalla did not permit herself to look the least bit ruffled. Your superior general has acted in a heinous and traitorous manner, putting his own wishes ahead of the future of the Empire. The guards looked as if they wanted to blast her for insulting their former master so blatantly, but they didn't dare act in front of Dalla's stormtrooper escort and the heavily armed Gamma assault shuttles. Delvardus did not act alone, but continued a war of attrition, fighting other warlords to the detriment of us all. I present here. She withdrew a hollow cube from her pocket and set it in front of the sparkling frame that held the suspended body. A recording of our entire detente council so that you may see your general's actions as well as those of the other warlords. Then you will understand why it was necessary to take such a drastic step. These assault shuttles are merely a fraction of our forces, but they are sufficient to cause significant damage to your fortress. The rest of our fleet waits in orbit. Look over these items and decide whether to join us as part of a reunited imperial force, or whether to be considered renegades like your former master. You have one hour to deliberate. If we don't hear from you, we will come back and destroy you as accomplices. She spun about. The stormtroopers set the heavy frame down, switching off its anti-grav platform before marching behind Dalla and Pelion. Dalla did not turn to watch, but she heard the guards hustle out of the fortress and gather up their fallen leader and the message cube. They rushed back inside, and the thud of armored doors echoed in the narrow canyon. After the hour was up, Colonel Cronus decided to join Dalla's forces, wholeheartedly. An armored fast transport from the fortress hangars took Dalla and Pelion, along with a contingent of their suspicious stormtrooper guards, away from the planet. Colonel Cronus himself piloted the armored transport, transmitting recognition signals into deep space. Leaving Dalla's battleships behind, Cronus took them straight up out of the system perpendicular to the ecliptic and toward the sparse cometary cloud. Colonel Cronus was a small man, but packed with power. His shoulders were broad, his chest rippled, and his swollen biceps showed that he took great care to maintain himself at peak physical form, even in the reduced gravity of the small bleak planet. His curly black hair was seeded with silvery strands that gave him a distinguished appearance. His complexion was deeply tanned and seamed with lines that made him look weathered. His large brown eyes constantly flicked back and forth, drinking in details. He spoke sparingly, answering questions put to him with just the right amount of information. I need to make a brief hyperspace hop, Cronus said, to get us far enough to the edge of the system. Unless you'd rather we spent weeks at full burn of our sublight engines? Dalla stiffened. Pelion frowned suspiciously, and the stormtrooper guards snapped to attention but she decided that Cronus had little to gain here by sudden treachery, and that trusting him with a responsibility such as this could only plant the seeds of deeper loyalty. Very well, Colonel, she said. I am anxious to see what Del Vardis has managed to create with all the credits he's been spending. Pelian looked at her as if in warning, his heavy mustache drooping, but she shook her head imperceptibly. The Vice Admiral sat back and forced himself to relax. Cronus accepted her orders without question and began programming the Nava computer. Dalla felt her nerves taut like high-tension wires running through her body. She kept her expression impassive, but adrenaline coursed through her as she strapped herself into her chair. Everything had gone remarkably well. The conquest had been devastating and bloody, but she had taken out selected targets, the appropriate victims, and the Empire's harvest grew stronger and richer with each weed she plucked. She felt elated when she thought of the momentum of her triumph. Pelion raised his eyebrow in question, but she didn't respond. 
The risk had paid off for her. She would always remain on guard, but for the moment the danger was over. Now she had to work on consolidating her power. Cronus swiveled in his pilot seat, looking at Dalla with deep brown eyes that held an unexpected warmth. She wondered if he actually appreciated her takeover. She had seen him look upon the body of Superior General Del Vardis with barely concealed scorn. Entering hyperspace, Admiral Dalla, he said, please don't be alarmed. Around the ship, space vanished in a multicolored swirl. Dalla leaned forward to speak to the colonel. We've researched the amount of funding Del Vardis funneled into his operations, and I am not impressed with what I saw at his fortress. She narrowed her emerald eyes and continued, I hope he hasn't been squandering the Empire's resources. Cronus smiled and shook his head. I assure you, Admiral, he has not. I think even you will be impressed. Dalla closed her eyes for a moment to tally her fleet and her mind, adding together the star destroyers she had already collected from the various warlords, all of the battleships and firepower she had to command. She vowed to put her fleet to its best use this time. Here we are, Admiral. Colonel Cronus flicked the hyperspace controls that dropped them back into the normal universe. Blackness washed around them, and the distant sun appeared as a bright point at the center of the system. Other than that, space was dark around the armored transport. Then Dalla noticed a blot as she stared, an enormous shadow that eclipsed the stars. It seemed to be kilometers long and grew larger as they approached. Cronus fiddled with the comm system and transmitted a recognition code. Power up, he said to some unknown listener. Let's make a good display. Dalla squinted out the viewport, and suddenly she saw a whirlwind of tiny lights appear, marking deck after deck on a breathtakingly huge ship. The immense wedge-shaped shadow was a single vessel, larger than anything she had ever seen before. I can't believe it, Pelion said beside her. Only the Executor was this big, and that one ship practically bankrupted the Empire. What is it? Dalla asked. Cronus smiled, his expressive face showing his obvious enjoyment at her reaction. But it was Pelion who answered. It's a super star destroyer, he said. Cronus nodded eagerly. Worth twenty imperial star destroyers, he said, his eyes flashing with pride. It is eight kilometers long, can carry a crew of up to a hundred thousand, and is plated with stealth armor. That's why it appeared as only a black shadow as we approached. Though gigantic, it is virtually invisible to enemy forces. He lowered his voice as if imparting a precious secret. We named it the Night Hammer. Dalla's eyes shone with wonder, and her breath came shallow and fast as Cronus directed the armored transport to the open bay of the Super Star Destroyer. Dalla could not restrain herself and stood from her seat, waiting behind the colonel. She leaned forward, unable to tear her eyes from the beauty of the black night hammer. That will be my ship, she whispered. Coruscant, Chapter 21 Inside the cavernous Imperial Palace, Leia Organa Solo and her family wore nondescript civilian clothes, stopping at a pleasant cafe to eat their lunch like normal citizens. It felt good to be out of uniform where Leia could pretend to be invisible, though she knew that private bodyguards, professional protectors, and crack sharpshooters followed at a comfortable distance, monitoring her every movement. Leia resented the interference, but she also knew after many attempts on her own life or on her family, she couldn't afford to grow careless. Too much was at stake. Han carried Anakin against his side, and the young boy clasped small hands around his father's neck. Come on, kids, there's a table over here, he said. The energetic twins raced to be the first to reach the empty seats. Chewbacca let loose a long yowl, insisting the kids slow down and be careful. But they ignored the big Wookiee. If you would simply allow me to handle this, I'm sure they would behave, 3PO said. Chewbacca flashed his fangs at the golden droid. Really, Chewbacca, there's absolutely no call for such displays. R2-D2 whistled, but 3PO didn't bother to respond. The golden droid carried two trays of food, while Chewbacca hefted his own mounded high with dripping meat. 
Their group chose a table at the edge of a towering balcony. Mists rose around it, generated from vaporizers in the Sinrock walls. Trickling fountains traced rivulets of water down the dozens of stories to an open plaza enclosed within the pyramidal palace. Threepio and Chewbacca set their trays on the table, but the twins rushed to the edge barricade, standing on their tiptoes to peer far below. Look at the people, Jaina said. They're so tiny. Can I throw something down? Jason asked, looking around for any object to toss over the edge. No, you may not, Leia said. But Jaina's going to, the boy responded. No, she isn't, Leia repeated with a sterner tone. No, I'm not, Jaina said. Come on, sit down, Han said, settling Anakin into a chair. Around them the rustle of thousands of officials, bureaucrats, and aides going about their business made a drone of white noise mixed with the buzz of machinery, air exchangers, and climate control systems. Leia felt calmer now that she could take a brief break. At least people weren't challenging every decision she made for lunch. Leia appreciated Mon Mothma's confidence in her when the former chief of state had passed the torch of rulership, but Leia did not relish the work of being president, though she considered it her duty. Jason and Jaina sat down and began to play with their food, and she was relieved that they had chosen something that wouldn't try too hard to run away. The twins loved colored cubes of fizzing protein gelatin, though Leia couldn't stand the stuff. Han had chosen a greasy Corellian dish, while Leia contented herself with hydroponic greens sprinkled with intense flavor crystals. She closed her eyes as she sank into her chair. It's so nice just to be together with the family, if only for a few minutes. Chewbacca agreed with a loud rumble. A tall, offensively efficient weight droid came up with a gleaming empty platter affixed to one metal arm. May I provide further assistance, honored customers? The weight droid said. I am proud to offer my services while you dine in our fine establishment. May I take orders for drinks or additional items? Condiments, perhaps? The pleasure of my existence is to serve you faithfully. Threepio grew indignant at the overblown expressions of hospitality. I am their personal protocol droid, you pretentious pile of scrap, and I am perfectly capable of taking care of their needs. Now, if you don't mind, this is a family outing, and we would much prefer to be left alone. Good day. The weight droid sniffed, spun its torso 180 degrees, and trundled off. Han placed his hand over Leia's and gave a crooked smile. Bad day? Exhausting, Leia answered, her eyes still shut. Every meeting seems like I'm running uphill on a high-gravity planet. Nothing gets accomplished easily. I find myself wishing for the good old days when we would just blast in, do our jobs, and leave. Mission accomplished. Now I have to go through so many different steps, so many interminable committees, get agreement from an unconscionable number of opposing parties, so nobody in the galaxy is offended by the smallest piece of legislation. It's impossible sometimes. She opened her eyes and looked at her husband. Jason and Jaina began throwing gelatin cubes at each other. In a case like this, it's so perfectly plain. Why is there any discussion? We still can't come to an agreement. The stuff about the huts? Han asked. She bit her lower lip and nodded. It's obvious the huts are pulling a fast one. We know what you and Luke found in Jabba's palace. We've got the message from Mara Jade and we know that Durga's own Toril stole the Death Star plans. We can't just ignore it. She took a mouthful of leaves and crunched, thinking as she chewed. Han ate one of his grayish-green sausages and smacked his lips, relishing the meal. There are other ways to find out, he said. Leia smiled. I know. She felt her face grow warm, fixing her attention on the challenge. She squeezed Han's hand in both of hers. Okay, we've had closed Senate meetings, and I've heard enough discussion to make a statue fall asleep. So what are we really going to do? Chewbacca ventured a loud opinion. Yeah, I was thinking that, Chewie, Han said and turned to Leia. The Huts probably know we suspect something. We've heard news from too many different sources to hope that those slimy worms don't have an inkling yet. 
they'll be watching your official channels very closely. They've probably got spies scattered throughout the Imperial Palace. We have to be careful. Leia nodded. So, since they know we're hunting for clues, let's create a diversion. We'll use a flashy show, carry a big stick in one hand, and a delicate probe in the other. Han's forehead creased as he thought. What do you mean? We'll take Durga up on his offer. Han looked at her blankly. What offer? You'd accept something from a hut? Leia shrugged. He invited us to make a return visit of state. I'm sure he didn't mean it, but he can't back down now that the invitation's been made. Let's set up a diplomatic mission on the spot. Head out to Nalhata as soon as possible. That way Durga will have no forewarning. And, she continued, holding up one finger, will be accompanied by the New Republic fleet. Wedge and Akbar must be itching to go on some innocent-sounding war-gaming exercises. Our ships can provide an impressive show of force. If the huts happen to get intimidated in the process, so much the better. Let them be nervous, wondering what we're really up to, and we'll poke around to find some answers. Threepio piped up. But, Mistress Leia, how do you expect to learn anything if you're so obvious about it? Won't Durga the Hut hide anything he knows? Leia's expression became mischievous. If we come in with all the flash and dazzle we can muster, he may just be blinded to what else we're doing. Meanwhile, Chewbacca and R2 can take the Falcon and go to Nar Shada, the Smuggler's Moon. It's a seedy place where all the black market dealings come and go. Durga will be so busy hiding his cards from us, Chewie might find something important on his own. R2 whistled and beeped. And R2 as well, Leia added. You two poke around, see what you can find, then we'll compare notes. Chewbacca roared his approval, and finally Leia relaxed enough to finish her lunch. Now Hutta, Chapter 22 on the bridge of the escort frigate Yavaris, General Wedge Antilles felt the old excitement of space combat. His ships charged into the Nal Hutta system under the pretense of red team, blue team simulated battles in open territory that just happened to be near the hot homeworld. Boy, are the slugs going to be surprised, Wedge said. The lovely and ethereal scientist, Kwai Zooks, left her station and joined him. Much better than when we took over Maw installation, she said. At least we're not risking lives this time. Wedge nodded. He wanted to hug her, but knew he shouldn't, since he was in command of the ship and she was the science officer in training. The work was easy for Kwai, and she enjoyed being with Wedge. Since vowing never to work on developing new weapons systems again, the brilliant alien scientist hadn't yet found a new calling for her considerable mental energies. Check the status of our fleet, Wedge said to the tactical officer, who displayed a grid showing the components of Blue Team. Though the Yavaris was his flagship, it was not the largest battleship. The cornerstone of his fleet was the monstrous assault frigate Dodana a highly modified version of the fearsome Imperial Dreadnoughts. The Yavaris was smaller, but it was the ship Wedge had piloted during his successful attack on the Empire's secret laboratory, Maw Installation. Surrounding his ships were six smaller, versatile Corellian corvettes, whose huge banks of engines looked like rocket launcher emplacements burning blue in the darkness of space. All his ships had strung out in a picket line, with the Dodana and the Yavaris at the center, flanked on each side by three corvettes. They cruised into the Nal Hutta system. Wedge asked the comm officer, Have we heard from Red Team yet? Has Admiral Akbar arrived in position? Akbar had taken his own complement of ships on a different approach vector. A trio of Corellian gunships, smaller than the corvettes, and an enormous Calamarian star cruiser, the Galactic Voyager, one of the largest and most powerful ships in the New Republic fleet. Wedge knew, however, that sheer size and firepower did not guarantee a victory. Akbar was to enter the system from the other side, and the two fleets would engage near Nal Hutta itself. Red Team confirms they are in position, the tactical officer said. General Antilles, the comm officer interrupted, we have an urgent message from Nal Hutta demanding to know our purpose here. 
Wedge tried to stifle a smug grin. Let them know we're just engaging in peaceful combat exercises. No cause for alarm, he said, then muttered, unless they try anything. Admiral Akbar waited for his helmsman to give the announcement. Finally, the other Calamarian officer said, Both teams in position, Admiral. Akbar nodded his huge head. Prepare to engage, he said. The Galactic Voyager was Akbar's favorite ship in the fleet. Every one of the lumpy, pod-shaped Calamarian battlecruisers followed a slightly different design devised by master shipbuilders in orbit around their world. For years, the Moan Calamari had worked non-stop to replenish the losses suffered by the New Republic during fierce battles with the Empire, such as when Admiral Dalla and her Star Destroyers had attacked the Calamarian shipyards and Akbar himself had caused the destruction of the half-completed warship Star Tide. Beside him, General Crix Maydeen, the Supreme Allied Commander for Intelligence, said, We need to keep the huts preoccupied and intimidated to accomplish our real mission here. A bearded middle-aged man, Maydeen had been in charge of the ground assault on Endor, which resulted in the destruction of the energy shield generator, allowing the rebel fleet to destroy the second Death Star. A long time ago, Maydeen had been an important officer in the Imperial military but he had defected to the Alliance, bringing with him much valuable information. A good many rebel victories had resulted from the secret intelligence Maydeen had delivered to Mon Mothma. He now kept a low profile, serving in his quiet role of necessary covert operations. Now that our fleet is in system, Maydeen said, I doubt very much that the Huts will dare misbehave when the Chief of State arrives on her diplomatic mission. Akbar nodded solemnly. That may be your motivation, General Maydeen, but right now my purpose is to score a victory for Red Team. As Akbar began preparations for the engagement, Maydeen went to one of the sensor stations and relieved the lieutenant. Crix Maydeen was a hands-on person who liked to do his own busy work. He had no way of knowing when he might need to be proficient in every level of operations, so he tried to have a broad background and competence in every system on board. Maydeen adjusted the Galactic Voyager's long-range scanners to zoom in on the greenish planet of Nal Hutta and its smuggler's moon, Nar Shadda. With the arrival of the New Republic fleet, he noted a marked increase in traffic departing from Nar Shadda, no doubt small-time criminals fleeing the intimidating military force. He resigned himself to letting so many lowlifes get away, but right now he couldn't be interested in the dregs of society. His real target on this mission would be much more devious. Blue team has squared off in a defensive position, the tactical officer said. Akbar concentrated on his station. Give me a display. Images of Wedge's fleet appeared in a picket line across space. Very well, he said. We will be the aggressor in this engagement. He stared at the arrangement of Blue Team's ships and shook his salmon-colored head. I'll have to teach General Antilles a lesson in tactics and vulnerability. Maydeen returned to the Admiral's side. What do you mean? He had always been interested in fleet maneuvers. Akbar pointed a flipper hand toward the images. We'll plunge through them like a dagger, he said. One of our gunships in front, then the Galactic Voyager, then the other two gunships. We'll plow straight between the two frigates. Those are the primary targets. The lead gunship will come in firing and pass straight through. Then the Galactic Voyager will obliterate their defenses with our superior firepower. Finally, the second and third gunships will mop up what's left. With one pass, we'll take out the Yavaris and the Dodana. Blue Team's flanking corvettes will be unable to bring their weapons to bear because their own ships blocked the way. Sounds straightforward, Maydeen said. Just watch, Akbar answered. Wedge slumped into his command chair with a boyish grin on his square-jawed face. He's falling for it. He clapped his hands. All right, Red Team just stepped across the line. We know exactly what they're going to do. Prepare for it. Wedge shook his head and looked at Kwai. Doesn't Akbar think I read his own tactical manuals? 
He saw a red team coming on in a straight line, a single gunship in front, then the huge star cruiser, followed by two more gunships. He's aiming between the two frigates, Wedge said. All right, everybody, red alert, battle stations, all weapons low power, just enough for them to detect all the hits we score. All weapons low power, sir, the gunnery sergeant reported. Hit counters are activated. Wedge's eyes twinkled as he watched the ship's approach. He held up one hand. Full power to lateral shields on both frigates, he said. Drop all other shields. We know where they're going to shoot. The gunship came right on target, streaking between the assault frigate and the Yavaris, repeatedly firing simulated shots. Shields holding, the defensive officer said. Then the galactic Voyager came through, its low-power weapons blazing. Wedge chopped down with his hand. Close the net, he said. The tactical officer shouted orders into the encrypted communication system, and the six Corellian corvettes at the flanks, supposedly out of firing range, suddenly looped up and around, encircling the two seemingly vulnerable frigates. The corvettes scattered like static moths, flurrying into position and firing on the Moon Calamari star cruiser from top and bottom. The Avaris and the Dodana both fired upon the galactic Voyager, catching it in the crossfire it had expected but Akbar had not anticipated the attack from above and below. Wedge ordered the Yavaris to strike Red Team's front gunship, crippling it. The simulation computer reduced the gunship's capabilities and told its captain they were dead in space. General Maydeen watched as the hit counters tallied the enormous number of strikes on Red Team ships. Maydeen scratched his beard, turning to Akbar. He lured you, and you fell for the trap. Shields failing, Admiral, the helmsman said in alarm. Computer reports that both gunships to our rear have been removed from the game, the tactical officer said. Admiral Akbar flushed a blotchy reddish color. Increase speed, he said. Let's get away from here so we don't suffer any more hits. Too late, Admiral, the helmsman said. Our shields have failed. Maydeen turned to watch the hit counter's numbers spiraling upward like a cascade reaction. All plates have been breached. Admiral, I'm sorry to report that the galactic Voyager has been destroyed. Akbar's shoulders slumped. A defeat. The tactical officer stood up to report. We did finally disable their assault frigate and one of their attacking corvettes, but the computer lists Red Team as out of commission. The galactic Voyager and two gunships down, our front gunship crippled. Akbar sighed. The price of overconfidence, he said. I was not thinking. Open a channel to Blue Team. Maydeen watched as the Calamarian stood straight and spoke to Wedge Antilles. This is Red Team Commander. Congratulations on your victory. You were too predictable, Admiral, Wedge said. Akbar chuckled, but it was a forced laugh. I will try to be more erratic with my future commands, General Antilles. He checked his sensors and saw that Leia's diplomatic ship had arrived from Coruscant exactly on time. Akbar, as commander of the New Republic fleet, opened a channel to all ships engaged in wargaming exercises. Chief of State Leia Organa Solo's ship has reached the system. Have the fleet form up and escort her to Naal Hutta, he said. After that, we will return for a rematch. Akbar closed the channel. On to business. General Maydeen, I believe you have work to do down on the surface. Maydeen nodded and took the turbo lift below decks, where he would prep his commando team for their covert mission to the hot planet. Chapter 23 Chief of State Leia Organa Solo's diplomatic cruiser entered the Naal Hutta system, flanked by an imposing display of New Republic battleships innocently engaged in combat exercises. Leia sat in the hammerhead-shaped command compartment of her Corbellian corvette, a diplomatic ship much like the blockade runner in which Darth Vader had captured her while searching for the stolen Death Star plans near Tatooine. C-3PO hovered beside her, newly polished, so that he gleamed under the bridge lights. Han, though dressed in less diplomatic finery than he had worn during Durga's visit, 
fidgeted in his clean uniform. They've spotted us, Han said as alarms began to go off. They already knew we were coming, Leia said. We sent the huts full notice at least half an hour ago. She chuckled. Okay, she said more seriously to the crew, time for our performance. I'm going to make a transmission. She stepped to the upper bridge, alone under the lights. She held the rail, primped herself for a moment, then composed a miffed expression on her face. Please open a channel, she said. When the huts responded, Leia began her tirade. Why is there no official escort fleet? I expected Lord Durga to have taken care of that personally. What have you been doing all this time? The hut respondent was a lowly worm, thin and with a narrow head, obviously not a powerful crime lord like Jabba or Durga. His huge eyes flicked from side to side as he spoke in basic. Um, excuse me, Madam President, but Lord Durga is not here. We regret that we are unable to meet. What do you mean Durga isn't here? Leia snapped. He sent us an express invitation to visit him at our convenience. I trust you're not implying that he lied to the New Republic's chief of state? Or do you mean to suggest that he is in fact retracting his offer to repay our hospitality? This is an outrage. How does he expect to form some sort of treaty with the New Republic? I'd say the chances are becoming vanishingly small in light of this snub. She crossed her arms over her chest and glared at the scrawny hut. I'm sorry, Madam President, but Lord Durga is away, on business. He waved his stubby hands, totally flustered. If only you had given us some warning, the hut continued. We would have prepared for your visit. But as it is, we have no facilities. Leia glared at him coldly. You don't actually expect us to turn around and meekly go home after the enormous expense and trouble we went to for this highly visible expedition, do you? I hardly think Lord Durga would want to risk such a galaxy-spanning diplomatic incident. Don't be absurd. The timid hut looked around as if seeking someone else to consult, but found no one. What do you expect me to do? he wailed. I don't have the authority to... Nonsense, Leia said, and raised her chin haughtily. We are coming down at Durga's personal invitation. What further authority could you need? We expect to be well treated. See to it. She signed off, then burst out laughing. Han came over and hugged her. I think you enjoyed that, he accused, trying to restrain spasms of laughter. He stepped back and applauded her performance. 3PO, meanwhile, was totally baffled. Oh, dear, perhaps we should have given the huts more time, Mistress Leia. At least they would have had the opportunity to prepare. I'm afraid they're so flustered now, this could put them completely off balance. That's the point, Han and Leia said, raising their voices in unison. 3PO staggered backward and shook his golden head. Well, I'm sure this sort of approach wasn't covered in any of the protocol programming I received. Once again, I feel I'll never understand human behavior. Leia sat next to Han at one of the discussion tables in her ready room, and she reached over to clasp his hands. Thanks for coming with me, Han. I'm glad we're finally going somewhere together instead of splitting up all the time. Yeah, I like it too, he said with a lopsided grin. It's a nice change. She sighed, then her lips tightened. We can't cut them any slack. The huts are dangerous already, and they'll be unstoppable if they have their hands on a Death Star. Han nodded gravely, and Leia continued, as if giving an impassioned speech to the Senate. The first Death Star was meant to be the ultimate doomsday weapon in the hands of the Empire. Now the huts will become galactic bullies with a big stick. And what's to stop them from selling those plans to any other small-time dictator who wants to get his own way? We cannot let the Death Star proliferate. The galaxy will be a shambles. If anyone with enough credits can buy the plans and go around blowing up planets, then no one will be safe. We must stop this at all costs. One of the New Republic guards came in. Excuse me, Madam President, he said, but your drop shuttle is ready. We can take you down to Nal Hutta at your convenience. 
My convenience, Leia said ironically. I'm so looking forward to this. She felt as if she were dropping into the open jaws of some slobbering beast. Along with Threepio and their honor guard, Leia and Han went to the corvette's dropship bay and climbed aboard the small diplomatic shuttle. You ready for this? Han asked. Leia looked at him, pondering her answer. No, she said honestly. But we have to do it anyway. Let's go visit the huts. Chapter 24 now Hutta was a bog, flat and sunken like a sewage reclamation reservoir, with standing puddles and sickly-looking marsh grasses. A landscape the hut somehow found attractive. Leia realized she should have expected as much. A hut sail barge coasted toward them as the diplomatic shuttle settled on a landing pad near Durga the hut's holdings. When she saw the sluggish luxury ship cruise along, its directional sails billowing in the foul-smelling breeze, Leia's skin crawled with the memory of her last fateful trip with Jabba out to the great pit of Carcoon. She, Han, and Threepio stepped away from the diplomatic ship, accompanied by their new Republic escort, and waited for the sail barge to receive them. Above, the sky was draped with shadowy gray clouds. As Leia and Han stood in their formal attire, a greasy rain began pelting down, cold droplets clotted with residue from massive strip mining operations in industrial sectors far from the showy palaces of the hut crime lords. This certainly is a gloomy place, isn't it? Threepio commented. If we don't find shelter from this dreadful rain, I shouldn't be at all surprised if my new gold plating gets corroded. He turned his glowing yellow optical sensors toward the runnels of water trickling down his arms. I do wish you had left me on Coruscant, Mistress Leia. I'm sure I would have done a much better job taking care of the children. Didn't we tell you, 3 P.O.? Han said mischievously. As a matter of state necessity, we're going to present you to Durga the Hutt. He'll be your new master. What? 3 P.O. cried, raising his arms in sudden shock. Oh, no, you must be joking. I'm doomed. Please, I urge you to reconsider this, Mistress Leia. Leia elbowed Han in the ribs. That's mean, Han. Just kidding, Goldenrod, he said, and slapped the protocol droid on one hard metal shoulder. Kidding? Threepio made a flustered sound. Why, that wasn't at all funny. Across from the now Hutta spaceport, Durga's palace rose tall. Despite the brown haze of pollution and atmospheric sludge, its walls gleamed white and clean. When Leia squinted her brown eyes, she could make out the tiny forms of slaves climbing up and down the sculptured facades in the slippery drizzle, scouring the gargoyles and crenellations. The sail barge hovered over them. Guards stood on deck, scowling in all directions. A thin hut slithered along the top deck, moving under its own power rather than on a repulsor sled. Leia recognized the narrow, emaciated face of the creature she had argued with over the comm system. He was alarmingly different from any hut she had seen previously. Scrawny as a ribbon of mottled green leather that hung on a flexible spinal column. He did not look well. Greetings, Chief of State Leia Organa Solo. I welcome you in the name of his great obesity, the Lord Durga, who is unfortunately unable to be with us at the moment. Leia bowed slightly. Thank you, but I want to meet with Lord Durga. He invited us here. Ah, I have summoned him, Madam President. He is coming with all due haste. The scrawny hut envoy leaned over the barge railing. Good, Han muttered. I'm not exactly crazy about the idea of staying for very long. I am Corda, special envoy and slave to Lord Durga. I am not worthy, but it has fallen upon me to entertain you until he can be here in person. Oh, that's very nicely said, Threepio said. Corda seemed pleased. I hope you find my basic acceptable. Lord Durga insists that all his entourage learn the language so that we might better work with the New Republic. Might I offer you suitable hospitality in the meantime? We can't be quite sure what a hut means by hospitality, Han said quietly. As I recall, I've experienced a little of it myself. 
Corda made a hissing, sizzling sound that Leia identified as a strained laugh. Ah, yes, Han Solo, I am aware of your dealings with the defeated Jabba. May his name be spoken with scorn. He is a worthless worm. No hut respects the memory of one whose empire has fallen. You will be pleased to note that the huts have lifted the bounty on both of you as an initial overture of peace. How very heartening, Leia said with an acid sweet smile. Now, should we climb aboard that sail barge, or were you planning to keep us standing here, shouting at each other in the rain all day? Ah, certainly. Corda reared back, gesturing with his sinewy hands as a wide ramp extended to the ground. They climbed up the ramp onto the barge. Their stoic-looking New Republic escorts remained as stony-faced as the sail barge guards. Corda did his best to be obsequious, and simpered as the sail barge raised itself up, drifting away from the spaceport and across the open spaces toward the palace. Spiders and gnats swarmed around the spiky grasses below. Roughly circular, shallow pools dotted the landscape, covered with a greenish scum. Overhead in the thin rain, flocks of large, clumsy birds squawked as they flew along, chased by rowdy henchmen on swoops who shot them with long-range blaster rifles. Smoking bird carcasses tumbled out of the sky and plopped into the bog. Durga's palace rose taller as they approached, a nightmare of towers and crenellations with large, jawed gates, plus an underground network of dungeons so vast it had achieved galactic renown. Ah, I don't know how long it will take for Durga to return, Corda said, as the sail barge docked in the cavernous hangar bay. But since I'm responsible for amusing you, would you like a tour of our dungeon levels? You'll find them most fascinating. No dungeons, Leia said. Thanks, anyway. Not interested, Han concurred. We've seen enough dungeons to last us for the next century or so. Oh, Corda said, obviously disappointed and at a loss for what to do as a backup plan. Leia had been unable to sense anything from the opaque mind of Durga the Hutt. Corda was much weaker, but all she could sense was flustered uncertainty and a nervous frustration, no deception. Corda honestly didn't know what was going on, but he was afraid his neck was on the line. Leia's Jedi powers also brought her many bad impressions from the palace itself, lingering echoes of pain and imprisonment, thoughts of murder and betrayal that seemed to ooze from the stones. It overwhelmed her, and she quickly shut her senses down again. Ah, perhaps we should dine instead, Corda suggested. We always have freshly slaughtered meats and succulent delicacies. There will be other members of Durga's family in attendance. It might be good to meet them. That would be acceptable, Leia said, inclining her head in a regal nod. Han muttered, I don't know. Having dinner with a bunch of huts doesn't sound much more pleasant than touring torture chambers. Inside the dining hall, carrion birds sat perched on stone lintels, glaring down to spot any morsel dropped to the flagstones, ready to swoop and capture any portion of the meal that attempted to escape before it could be shoveled into a cavernous hut mouth. The other guests, Durga's adolescent cousins, were like wide-mouthed eels, lean and muscular, some already beginning to build up layers of flab in preparation for midlife obesity. Their thick lips contorted and their yellow eyes darted around, but these huts were obviously healthy, while Corda was emaciated by some sort of sickness. The whip-like hutlings were boisterous and insulting, barely able to speak a coherent sentence in basic and uninterested in the work of Durga. Corda played the servitor, bringing dishes of gelatinous food, stewed insects, parasites drizzled with warm honey, and roasted grain maggots, most of which lay in crispy husks on their plates, while others still squirmed about in a struggle to survive. Leia did her best to be appreciative, though neither she nor Han found they had much of an appetite. She pushed the food around on her dish, enduring the meal as best she could. Han did the same beside her, the cords in his neck tightening as he clenched his jaw. Only Threepio was not at a loss for words, attempting to decipher the origin of the meal's components. Corda suffered more than Han and Leia, however. The larval huts proved excessively rude, slapping him whenever he came within reach. 
Corda did not eat from a plate of his own, but scraped leftovers from discarded dishes into his mouth. He looked at Han and Leia with the utmost gratitude, perhaps believing they had not eaten their meals so that he could wolf down the untouched food. Excuse me, Leia said in a low voice when Corda came to gather their dishes. Why don't you sit and eat with us, since you are Durga's designated assistant? No, I am his lowliest servant, Corda said. Look at me. He gestured to his ribbon-thin body and sickly skin. I deserve only slop. I am despised because I have a rare wasting disease. As an underweight hut, I am the target of all scorn. How could anyone respect such a wasted and worthless worm as I? Why does Durga keep you around, then? Han asked. You seem to be in an important position while he's gone. Ah, Durga detests me, Corda said, blinking bloodshot eyes and bobbing his narrow head. He keeps me because I am so despicable. He shames me by placing me in situations where I must appear to be important, though it is obvious to anyone with eyes that I am worthless. This makes me feel even more downtrodden, which keeps Durga happy, and therefore I am content. Leia's mind spun with the tangled logic, but she didn't try to argue. From their perches, the carrion birds watched Korda himself, as if he might be their next meal. The creatures squawked as a large lumpy wart, a long-tongued frog-like creature, hopped into the dining hall from one of the outer corridors. Frills stood up around its eyes, and it bobbed obediently as it sat waiting, clasping a message placard in its wide, toothless mouth. Corda rushed over to snatch the placard from the creature, then patted its warty head as he scanned the message on the screen. He reared up in delight, his mottled skin growing darker. Ah, good news indeed, he said. My master, Lord Durga, is on his way and should be here shortly. He insists that I show you the pleasure of his private bathhouses while you wait. I'm sure you'll find them most enjoyable. The concept of a hot bathhouse made Leia's stomach churn, but she forced a smile. Han raised an eyebrow skeptically and clasped her hand under the table. It's for the New Republic, she said in a martyred tone. Corda beamed with pride as he gestured at the enclosed labyrinth beneath the palace, holding acres and acres of sluggish, steaming water. The walls were covered with mold and bulbous fungus. Dim light filtered from narrow slits in the walls, giving everything a grainy, tarnished appearance. This bathhouse is Lord Durga's pride and joy, Corda said. Doesn't surprise me a bit, Han murmured, trying to sound polite. The maze of canals was an underground catacomb with vaulted ceilings and algae-covered support pillars dipping into the shallow water. Things splashed and swam in the twisted channels, lost in the faint mist. This fresh water is pumped in directly from the bogs, Corda said, as if confiding a great trade secret. Lumps and all. The canals bubbled, and hairy green weed drifted along the top. Leia hugged herself in the clinging robe Corda had provided for her. You expect us to swim in this? she said. Oh, no! Corda flinched backward in horror, whipping his sinuous spine back and forth. These canals are for Lord Durga and other huts. We would not allow a human to pollute the water. We certainly wouldn't want to offend Durga, Han said with relief. Ah, no, we have a species-segregated section for some of our honored visitors. I'm sorry we cannot be fully accommodating. This section, alas, has only pure water, with none of the special additives that give hot skin such a pleasurable texture. Corda led them to a warm, crystal-clear pool with rough stone steps leading down into it, so they could immerse themselves to shoulder level in the bubbling water. This will do just fine, thank you, Leia said, her gratitude genuine. As long as we've checked it for traps, Han suggested. Oh, indeed, sir, I have been most vigilant throughout this entire mission, 3PO said, and I detect no treachery here. I assure you, you may bathe without fear. I'll remain on guard. Oh, good, Han said sarcastically. Then I can relax. 
Leia slowly lowered herself into the warm, fizzy water and sighed as the liquid heat swirled around her aching joints. In spite of myself, I might enjoy this, she said. Please relax, Corda said. I must attend to my Lord Durga's arrival. You go right ahead, Han said, waving in dismissal. Threepio will be here to stand guard, and our new Republic escort is just out in the corridor. As Corda slithered away, Han and Leia sank into the pool, listening to the simmering sounds of other creatures moving in the canals reserved for hot bathing. The labyrinth was so vast that they could feel alone in their little corner, although numerous hut visitors and the reckless hutlings swam in other sections. Should we talk? Han whispered. Leia slipped an arm around his waist. No, she said. We have nothing important to discuss at the moment, and there's no telling whether Durga's listening in. Let's just enjoy a moment of relaxation for a change. Leia grew drowsy, though she remained on guard, half watching the canals filled with sludgy bog water. Gradually she became aware of ripples stirring the hairy green seaweed. Something large moved beneath the surface, easing toward them. She sat up straighter, stiffening. Oh dear, Threepio cried, I do believe something's approaching. He pointed with a golden hand, just as a large bulk heaved itself out of the bog water near the canal divider opposite Han and Leia. The sloping mound, dripping with water and seaweed, blinked two huge copper-red eyes. Ho, 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 a hot voice boomed. Welcome, Leia Organa Solo. I am pleased to see you again so soon. Leia recoiled, but managed to mask her shock. She sat back in the pool, maintaining her cool diplomatic composure, as she recognized the dark birthmark on the hut's wet face. Lord Durga, welcome home. Your visit comes as such a surprise, Durga said, heaving himself higher so that the seaweed sloughed off his sloping head and dripped back into the steaming canals. I did not expect you to come so soon. Does this mean you are anxious now to form an alliance with the Hut Syndicate? Don't jump to conclusions, Han said. Let me handle this, Han. Leia squeezed his arm. Our visit is a gesture of good faith on our part, Lord Durga. I'm sure you know how quickly the New Republic can work once it has made a decision. Han snorted beside her because she had complained so often about how interminably long even simple processes took. Durga wouldn't know that, however. If we decide that an agreement with the Huts is advisable, you can bet we'll move quickly, she said in as businesslike a tone as she could muster. No sense postponing profit. Durga, though, seemed surprised and uneasy. We need not rush a decision as important as this, he said. We must take great pains to ensure that all are satisfied with our alliance. Leia pursed her lips. I see, she said, realizing that Durga was just stalling to keep them off balance. His initial overture to her on Coruscant had merely been a ruse to gain access to the Imperial Information Center for the Death Star plans. It was clear now that he didn't want an agreement. He just wanted to keep them chasing false leads while the hut superweapon was under construction. Leia was determined to learn the site of the secret project and how far along they had managed to get. I noticed your battle fleet near our system, Madam President, Durga continued. I can't help but express my concern. Leia raised her hand out of the water with a splash, and trickles ran down her wrist. Oh, don't worry. They're just engaged in routine military exercises. They could train anywhere, I suppose, but they wanted to accompany me. You know how overprotective bodyguards can get? She sighed. Nothing to be concerned about. We're going to be allies, remember? If we can work out a deal, of course. I wouldn't let a little thing like a few warships engaged in simulated combat bother you. Durga chuckled again and raised his stubby hands out of the bog water. Bother me? No, you misunderstand. I merely thought there must be some crucial political brush fires on recalcitrant worlds in your new republic. I'm surprised you have excess warships that can be wasted on games. 
We haven't had any problems with the Empire at large for a couple of years, Leia said. Even so, our fleet needs to keep in practice. Durga widened his eyes and laughed. Oh, the Empire may be doing more than you think. His voice boomed in the enclosed catacombs. To show you my good intentions, let me offer you a service, something for which the huts are justly famous. And what is that? Leia asked, not particularly interested. Our network has many good sources of information, certain data that could be valuable to your new republic. While you're here on Nal Hutta, allow me to offer you the services of one of my information brokers. I'll instruct him to check up on what the Empire has been up to recently. I think you may be surprised. Han grew suddenly tense and alert beside Leia. Under the water, his hands clenched into fists. Although she assumed the entire offer was merely another diversion, a ploy to distract them from other lines of inquiry, Leia clasped one of Han's hands and nodded. I gratefully accept your offer, Lord Durga. The galaxy functions on the basis of accurate intelligence. She stood up, dripping in the water. For now, though, I think I've been in the bath too long, Leia said. Threepio bustled off to get towels. Chapter 25 As night fell outside the opulent palace of Durga the Hutt, the other inhabitants of the bog planet went about their desperate lives. Disguised in tatters, with dirt and weariness smeared across his bearded face, just like any other downtrodden victim of Nal Hutta, General Crix Maydeen slipped through the gathering gloom with his destination firmly in mind. With liquid movements he had developed during years of covert operations, Maydeen worked his way through the dim streets between run-down prefab shacks in a squatter's village. Locked-down warehouses shone like military bunkers under the wan moonlight and harsh security beams around the heavily guarded spaceport. Distribution centers busily processed the raw materials torn from Nal Hutta's surface and shipped the supplies to the moon Nar Shada. Maydeen watched chains of light, the trails of regular supply ships, lifting through the cloud-strewn skies to the smuggler's moon and returning with cargo holds filled with black market goods that were purchased and laundered on the moon itself. The hut race had a habit of usurping a world, then using it up, squeezing it dry of resources and polluting the environment. When they eventually destroyed their stolen home planet, the huts would move someplace else, and their crime empire was currently in the process of digesting Nal Hutta. Slum entertainment centers stood on rickety Durasteel stilts in the glimmering wet marshland. The entertainment complex seemed like an afterthought to provide hopeless amusement for those trapped on Nal Hutta. Even from a distance, Maydeen could hear the loud music and louder screams. On the other side of the spaceport, Durga's palace was lit up with blue-white spotlights that played across its outer walls. The structure rose like a giant ivory edifice, towering and aloof in the midst of the other inhabitants. Carrying a partially concealed glow lantern, Maydeen made his way to the wire mesh fence that blocked access to the spaceport landing field. Under the security lights, Durga's private ship rested. A custom-designed hyperspace yacht, long and vermiform, its smooth iron-gray hull adorned with fins and stabilizers for atmospheric travel. As he crept to the barrier, Maydeen saw other furtive figures huddling near the fence, staring longingly at the ships parked there, tantalizing reminders of a way to escape this world. But all the strangers ran away when Maydeen approached. He wished he could call after them, offer them some hope, promise to rescue them when all this was over, but he could not. He reached the fence and held the thin, unbreakable wires like any other dejected dreamer. Armed, weak-way guards stood in a tight perimeter around Durga's ship. Their wrinkled, leathery faces were stony, and they waited like unflinching statues. Maydeen knew the weak-ways were not terribly intelligent, but they were loyal and vicious. There would be no chance to get close to the ship. But he didn't need to. Maydeen squatted at the base of the fence and pulled the glow lantern from the billows of his ragged cloak. He found the hidden catch and opened the compartment behind the lantern. 
Maydeen reached inside and withdrew the small fluttering creature, a moon moth with powder blue gossamer wings that beat gently as it tried to fly. Not yet, Maydeen said. Pause. The moth froze in mid motion. Other nocturnal insects buzzed around the brilliant security lights guarding the spaceport landing pad. This moth was a perfect replica of a common insect, crafted by Mechus III's finest droid specialists. The moth machine had limited computer memory, but it knew to follow commands, and it knew its own mission. Maydeen held the moth in the palm of his hand and pointed it toward Durga's well-lit hyperspace yacht. Acquire target, he said. The moth's antennae gyrated, and its wings trembled in affirmation. Maydeen waited just a moment to make sure, then he commanded, Launch. The powder-blue moon moth lifted into the air, spiraling on the night breezes. It flew in a careful random pattern, precisely erratic, drawing no attention whatsoever. As Maydeen tilted his head up, cold pearls of rain began to drop, beating on his cheeks. He blinked, rubbed the greasy water from his face, but his beard absorbed the moisture. Staring at the moth as it approached its target, Maydeen's heart pounded. This mission was simple and smooth. The moth machine fluttered down and alit on the outer hull of Durga's yacht, just behind one of the stabilizer fins. The moth stayed on the hull for only a moment, paused to deposit its precious egg, a microscopic droplet, then it beat its wings and rose into the increasing downpour. Maydeen waited until the tiny droid was lost to sight up in the night blackness, flying as far from Durga's ship as the buffeting winds would allow. He felt a twinge of sadness when he reached down into the torn folds to his pocket for the tiny controls and pressed the destruct button. He saw a sparkle of white light, a flash of the tiny detonation. Then he turned and was already moving away from the fence, melting into the shadows around the prefab ghettos. He had plenty of time to reach the rendezvous point. The moth's mission had been successful, and now Maydeen would be able to track Durga's movements wherever the hut went. Dagobah Chapter 26 Luke woke in the middle of the night to see Callista standing over him, her slender body silhouetted against pale watery light, a backwash of reflections that penetrated the polymerized ice walls in the comet quarry. He sat up, instantly aware. Callista, what is it? Warm mists curled around her like steam, and he had an eerie sense of déjà vu, a flash of memory from when he had seen her spectral image while she was trapped inside the eye of Palpatine. Luke, she said, her voice quiet and troubled, we shouldn't be here. He increased the light from the glow panels. Why not? He slid out of bed and stood to hold her. She felt soft and warm, fitting comfortably into his embrace. This place is beautiful and peaceful. What better spot could there be for us to spend some time? Callista stared deeply at him with her gray eyes. This is romantic and private, Luke, but that's all. The comet quarry has no focus, no connection to anything that matters to us. It's not personal. I've got to work with something personal. She pressed her lips together, then continued with greater conviction. Oh, Luke, why not take me to where you learned the Force? I'll see it through my own eyes, and you can guide me. A silvery tinkle of water spattered from the fountains. The solidified ice walls were thick and muffling. He and Callista seemed isolated, frozen away from everyone else, as she had been frozen inside the computer banks for so many decades. He squeezed her tightly. Yes, he said slowly. I can show you many places. It'll be like a pilgrimage to the worlds that influenced my life. She followed him as he walked out of the sleeping chamber into the common room. He whispered his request to the recessed computer terminal. As the computer search sorted public access navigation charts, he went over to the food prep unit and summoned two steaming cups of sweet, soothing Jeru tea. He handed one to Callista, and she took it, smiling. 
this was her favorite beverage, and he had learned to drink it with her. Luke sat down on the comfortable chair, and Callista took a seat beside him, running her long fingers across his shoulders, drawing a melting line of relaxation. He ran a hand through his ruffled hair to straighten it from the chaos of sleep. He took another sip of the syrupy tea and studied the navigational analysis in an outwardly spiraling list of distances. He smiled with a wistful sigh as he found his target. All right, he said and turned to Callista. Looks like we'll go to Dagobah first. Clouds formed a thick band across the sky of Dagobah, a belt of storms that Luke Skywalker's ship plowed through. He increased the shields to prevent the lightning damage that his X-Wing had sustained the first time he had come to find the Jedi Master Yoda. Dagobah had many climatic areas, many places not quite as teeming with life as the magnificent swamps. But Yoda had chosen to hide in the marshy areas where his presence could be masked by so many life forces. Luke talked of Yoda as he brought their space yacht through a break in the canopy. The first time I landed here in a bog, and my X-wing sank. I thought I'd never get out until Yoda used the force to heave my ship out of the water. I thought it was impossible. He told me that's why I failed. Luke risked a glance at Callista, taking his attention from the piloting. Never believe that yourself. You will get your powers back. Don't think it's impossible. She nodded. I know it's not impossible, and I'm going to do it. The ship spotlights extended brilliant cones to the wet ground below. Luke located a clearing that looked like a field of white boulders, but as he shone the light down to cut through the creeping ground fog, he saw that the white rocks were actually spherical fungi. As the beam played across them, their sensitive skins burst, showering fine spores. He could hear the faint boom of fungus blasts as the lumps reproduced in the sudden wash of light. Luke set the space yacht down, keeping his fingers tense on the controls in case the ship should begin to cant or settle awkwardly. But the ground seemed stable beneath him. He switched off the engines. Shall we go for a stroll in the swamp, he said, offering Callista his hand. They both wore slick, stain-impermeable jumpsuits, and they pulled on hard boots for sloshing through the brackish water. When he cracked open the hatch, the sudden buzz of millions of life forms croaks, grunts, whistles, and death screams assaulted his ears, a chaos of natural sounds that made the jungles of Yavin 4 seem peaceful by comparison. Minuscule gnats and biting flies thickened the air. Luke stood stunned and a little intimidated on the boarding ramp. A mist had already begun to unfold. The snowy shower of white spores settled to the ground from the sensitive spherical fungi. He smelled the damp odor of decay and fresh life. Yoda, he whispered, as memories fell heavy around him. This place is so alive, Callista said beside him, startling Luke from his thoughts. He still couldn't get used to the fact that he was unable to sense her with the Force as he did everything else. A threat of disappointment laced through her voice. I can see it and hear it but I can't feel the web of living creatures as I should. You will, he said, clasping her hand. You will. Come on. They trudged away from the ship and into the brooding swamps. Enormous gnarled trees stretched to the sky, their twisted roots like multi-legged creatures balanced with bent knees. The roots were sweeping and arched, forming dark warrens for innumerable creatures. The day was gray and fog-shrouded, growing darker with each moment as sunset approached. Luke knew that Yoda's home had long since been reclaimed by the swamp, torn to a shambles and left in far worse wreckage than Ben Kenobi's hut had been. He didn't want to return to the place where he had sat beside the alien Jedi Master's deathbed, learning the truth about his father and his sister, watching the wrinkle-faced creature fade into nothingness, as his spirit left his body after nine hundred years. He and Callista slogged through puddles, climbing over fallen trees, and scaring creatures that fled into darker hollows, splashing into the swamp. Much larger growling things moved in the distance, crashing between trees. Luke spoke of Yoda and of his time training here. Jogging through the swamp, levitating rocks, and R2-D2, 
learning nuggets of Jedi philosophy that Yoda spouted in his convoluted language. The ground fog thickened into white tentacles that wrapped around their lower legs. Callista's face carried an openness and a tentative wonder that Luke hadn't seen in some time. Occasionally she gritted her teeth and seemed to be straining, trying to accomplish something. Apparently failing, she said nothing to Luke. He squeezed her hand tighter. A knobby white spider, as tall as a human, heaved itself up from a pile of underbrush, its legs like twisted forerunners of the thick gnarled tree roots. But the knobby hunter met them no harm, and stalked off in search of smaller prey. We should head back to the ship, Luke said. It's getting dark. We can start some exercises tomorrow. They circled toward the clearing where they had landed the space yacht, then sat outside in the darkness. Callista brought out a portable glow lamp, and Luke removed a case of rations from the ship's stores. They sat on boulders surrounded by an envelope of light and tore into their food bars. What a place for a picnic, Callista said. She chewed intently while Luke stared down at his tasteless rations. Yoda didn't like this food, he said. Couldn't understand how I managed to grow so tall if I ate food like this. He fixed me some kind of stew, and I don't think I wanted to know what was in it. Bugs swarmed around them, attracted by the light as the night thickened. Should we go inside the ship, he asked, where it's more comfortable? Callista shook her head. We were comfortable at the Malaco Quarry Resort. I didn't come here to be comfortable. She looked up at the impenetrable sky. I wanted to feel something here, but it's not working. She turned sharply, flashing her slate-gray eyes at Luke, and he saw devastation within them. Why do you stay with me, Luke? she said. He blinked, shocked at her question. You are a Jedi master, she continued, one of the heroes of the rebellion. You could have anyone you want. Amazed, Luke raised his hand to cut off her comments. I don't want just anybody, Callista. I want you. She flung the rest of her ration bar angrily out into the swamp, where it splashed into a weed-covered pool. Luke heard thrashing and bubbles as underwater creatures fought for loose morsels. Callista's expression grew stern. Well, that's fine, Luke, but you have to think of more than your feelings. You have a responsibility to the New Republic, to the Jedi Knights. If I'm powerless, I'll drag you down. Longingly, Luke caressed her arm. No, you won't, Callista. I... She stood, abruptly stepping away from him. Yes, there's only one way we can be together. It's all or nothing. If I can't have my powers back, then we shouldn't stay together. You'd better start preparing yourself for that possibility. I don't want to always be in your shadow, unable to do the things you do so easily, taunted by the things I used to do myself. You'd be a constant reminder, opening and reopening my wounds. If I'm not your equal, I won't be part of this relationship. That's the way it has to be. Hey, wait a minute, Luke said, trying to calm her down. Suddenly, with a screeching subsonic cry, a swarm of night bats crashed out of the swamp trees and swooped down. They had leathery wings and insectal bodies, with six thin segmented legs bearing small sharp claws. Attracted by the light, the night bats came toward them. Other flying creatures flurried in front of them, confused by the high-pitched barrage of noise. The night bats attacked indiscriminately, scratching with their claws at Callista and Luke, slashing his jumpsuit his neck. Luke fended them off with his hands. Two clutched Callista's malt blonde hair, tugging it and fighting with each other as she thrashed to knock them away. With a hissing thrum, Luke drew his lightsaber, and Callista yanked hers free. Luke used the force to strike at his targets, but the night bats kept coming, dozens of them. The lightsaber blades crackled and flared, topaz and yellow-green, attracting more of the creatures. Callista hissed in anger and struck with her lightsaber, clumsily wielding it like a club that sliced through anything she encountered. Luke clipped off the wings of a night bat, even as more swirled in, shrieking. Callista shouted curses at them as she attacked blindly and with brute force. Her battle disturbed Luke. It was filled with a fury and a wild abandon he had never seen in her. Callista yelled at the night bats as if they were an incarnation of her greatest enemy. It's not fair, she said, targeting Luke briefly with her gaze. 
I've finally found you, and now I might have to give you up. She raised her voice and chopped with the sun-yellow blade in such an explosion of fury that she sliced through three of the night bats. It's not fair. And as she released her anger, Luke felt a glimmer, dark ripples that came from Callista. He caught a glimpse of her image in the force, like the flickering afterglow of things seen under a strobe light. Leave us alone, she shouted at the bats, and unconsciously pushed. The remaining night bats went into a confused spiral away from their campsite, buffeted by Callista's rage, and fled shrieking into the night. Stunned silence returned to the clearing. Then Callista lowered her energy blade, slumping weakly in the aftermath of what she had done. Luke deactivated his own lightsaber and stared at her in amazement. Outside the perimeter of the glow lamp, though, Luke heard other creatures stirring, larger predators crashing through the underbrush, attracted by the commotion. Out of sight, an overhanging branch cracked and was flung to the ground as something huge lumbered forward. Luke switched off the glow lamp, plunging the swamp into a darkness lit only by the twinkling lights of phosphorescent insects and glowing fungus. But the large, unseen predators kept coming. Luke grabbed Callista's arm, and she stiffened, as if he were a stranger. Come on, he said. We've got to get inside before they come back. She snapped out of her funk and followed him up the boarding ramp into the space yacht. Luke activated the hatch controls, and the ship sealed itself, locking down for the night. They both collapsed on one of the passenger benches, and Callista pressed herself against him. Luke put his arms around her shoulders and squeezed. Callista was shuddering, glistening with a sheen of frightened perspiration. I opened up for just a second, she said. I know, Luke answered. I could feel it. Then she looked up at him, her eyes very afraid. But it was the dark side, Luke. We both recognized it. Luke nodded, and they stared at each other with a mixture of hope and dread. At least you've cracked through, he said. Perhaps now you can do something. Callista sat up straight, gathering her strength again. She spoke with absolute certainty as the muffled night sounds of Dagobah's swamp enfolded the sealed ship. It's not worth the cost, Luke. If I have to touch the dark side to regain my powers, then I'd rather not ever be a Jedi again.